wish you all the best for this organizers. Those are directly and indirectly, I don't want to take the name because I know for any events, many people are basically involved to make any program successful. And in that, no doubt at this moment, uh, Puneet is a leader, but he are having a hands of many, many good volunteers and also other people. So thank you, wish you all the best, and I hope this conference will be very, very useful for our this in Bangalore as well as the whole India. Thank you. Thank you very much for Dr. Singh for sharing your thought and the perspective of art and in humanitarian uh, activities. So now I know that uh, our chief guest uh, of the day, Ramasri Professor Vijay Raghavan, hardly needs an inter introduction in India or abroad. It is indeed our honor and privilege to have you, sir, with us. I request Dr. Narayan Subramanian. One of the pillars of the organizing committee to introduce the chief guest to the virtual assembly, Dr. Subramaniam Kaindi. Thank you, Chandra Gata, sir. So, um, once again, we are really honored to have you, uh, Professor Vijay Raghavan, with us. So, uh, uh, for the uh, esteemed audience, so Professor Vijay Raghavan is currently the principal scientific advisor to the government of India and the chairperson of the Prime Minister's Science, Technology, and Innovation Advisory Council. Um, he was previously the secretary to the Department of Biotechnology, Government of India. Um, Professor Vijay Raghavan is very well known internationally. Um, he is a distinguished professor at NCBS, the National Center for Biological Sciences, PIFR, and was also the NCBS director till 2013. Professor Vijay Raghavan graduated in chemical engineering at IIT Kanpur and holds a PhD in molecular biology from TIFR and was a senior research fellow at Caltech USA. Um, Professor Vijay Raghavan is um, highly distinguished. He is a fellow of the Indian Science Academies, the Royal Society, the Academy of Medical Sciences in UK, and a foreign associate of the US National Academy of Sciences. He was awarded the Padma Shri by the Government of India in 2013, and was also one of the first Infosys Prize receivers. So um, this is the uh, introduction, and over to you, Professor uh, Vijay Raghavan, for uh, delivering your uh, session today. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Anand. It's a great uh, pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, I can't think of a more important topic connecting uh, technology with humanitarian causes uh, in the way you're doing uh, and, and the context of what you're doing. Of course, while the context is becoming important, this has been something which uh, really needs a connect for a very long time. But what I will do very briefly now is first um, talk very briefly about how such crises, uh, such as what we're going through today, occur. Are they surprises, were they uh, unforeseen uh, or not? Secondly, once these crises start, how do we detect them at early stages and prevent them from becoming large crises? Uh, and when they do, how do we detect uh, their prevalence? The third is our response systems. How do we respond to such crises at different layers in our society? What are the pillars of such responses? And then how do we act on each of those pillars? So first of all, why do such crises occur? Uh, the answer is that this was very much expected. In fact, specifically, the potential of a respiratory pathogen uh, spreading across the world was something which has been discussed over at least a decade uh, amongst those who study the origin of pandemics, particularly those of zoonotic diseases. Zoonotic diseases are those which spill over, as it were, from other animals to humans, and they happen because of close proximity of humans to these animals. They can happen, for example, there was a zoonotic disease transmitted by a racehorse in Australia when a bat uh, accidentally bit the horse transmitted a disease which went to the horse's trainer and then human to human transmission occurs. So something as innocuous as that can start a zoonotic disease. Other sources of zoonotic diseases are wet markets, close pro proximity of humans uh, to wild animals such as in dense 
uh, near dense forests in caves and so on and so forth. Uh, in our big cities, uh, garbage dumps uh, are a big source. Garbage is a big source. Uh, and in very, very supposedly clean environments, such as, you know, one example is Long Island, New York, where the increased transmission of a disease called Lyme disease is because of the uh, decimation of a variety of wildlife there, resulting in uh, greater human contact with those rodents and the deer, which have ticks which transmit the Lyme disease bacteria. So, in other words, zoonotic diseases are going to be with us, and there is no escape by either cleaning up uh, wildlife, which we should not do to preserve biodiversity, or by uh, living in uh, conditions which are not appropriate. They occur because of the way natural selection occurs, where pathogens have millions, sometimes hundreds of millions of years to mutate in a manner where while they are benign in their host, they have the opportunity to match perfectly human uh, cells uh, surfaces in terms of a lock and key mechanism to open the lock, enter these cells, and cause pathogens. So, in other words, we, by close proximity to various forms of wild animals, we basically buy bad lottery tickets. And what has happened now, because of increased human densities in proximity with human with animal population, with the consequences of climate change, which has disrupted normal wildlife in a variety of ways because of changing temperatures, uh, rainfall, and so on and so forth, the chances of zoonotic diseases have gone up. We can detect these diseases before they happen, but we don't know which one of them will become an epidemic or a pandemic. We can detect them because of exquisite sensors and technology development which have happened in biology over the last two or three decades. So we know whether a potential disease is a virus or a bacteria or some other parasite. We don't know, most of these actually don't cause epidemics or pandemics. We don't know which one will. So great research in laboratories go on to identify which are potentially the ones which can cause epidemics. But what happens in practice is not necessarily what one decides is likely to happen by other kinds of research. So one has to be prepared for the known unknowns and the disease spreads. Now, when the COVID-19 pandemic started, we didn't know it was going to be a pandemic. It started through the transmission of the SARS coronavirus 2. The sequence of the virus was available relatively soon, and about 10 days after the pandemic was officially announced by China. And that Viral sequence allowed labs all over the world to synthesize components uh, and allow detection to take place and soon also isolate the virus from patients all over the world and start making uh, tools such as vaccines for them. So the speed of the response hinged on detection. This detection is was very expensive and I'll come to how it's become much more frugal and serves a broader humanitarian cause. Now, the response to a pandemic is the following. When there is a potential uh, pandemic because of an atypical pneumonia, for example, happening, such as in this case, health systems are supposed to kick in to ensure that even before anything, any spread happens, that you isolate the person, the, the place, which is feasible if it's at a very early stage, so that the spread doesn't occur and you start characterization. If, however, you don't isolate international travel, and that doesn't happen in this case, very rapidly before you understand the disease, the disease is already spread. And in this disease, there was a particular problem in which that the spread was also done by people who are asymptomatic. And therefore, the detection by symptoms was always several steps behind the spread of the disease. However, very soon, detection tests came by, which allowed one to detect those who didn't have symptoms, but who had come in contact with those who had symptoms or were tested positive. They were tested positive by a test which is well known now. It's called the RT-PCR test. And that RT-PCR 
test, the reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction test, allows one to take a sample. Uh, you can take a sample from a nasal passage or a nasopharyngeal area or saliva now, and isolate the um, genetic material of the virus and amplify it exponentially to test it. So even if there is very little virus there, if there's a few copies of the virus, uh, uh, genetic material, you can amplify it twice, four times, eight times, 16 times, and that. So I'm telling you all this because these kinds of technologies can now be made and have been made very frugal and reach out to a very large number of people. So diagnosis is one. Once you diagnose, you need contact tracing mechanisms to know all those who are in contact with someone who was positive. For that, the IT sector is critically important. You need to have a way by which you go back in time and find out where this person has been over the last five or 10 or 15 days, where they might have infected other people when they were carrying a high viral load. That requires multiple people to carry phones, as well as have um, the apps which allow contact tracing. India has got the Aarogaseto app in which a hundred million people have downloaded it. Um, many people um, use it, a significant number don't have the Bluetooth on always, but still with the app, they get a variety of advice on what to do if should they be positive. But also through the uh, Reliance Geo phones, which have also got a contact tracing uh, download on that, and by a voice uh, response system, uh, and by looking at those who are positive in relationship to various telephone towers, the um, health ministry and the IT ministry have been able to look at a fine level of granularity of hotspots in the country every day and warn the health ministry, the local administration on what is happening and which areas where the spread is likely to occur, the purpose being to actually prevent that spread from happening. In other words, India has done something absolutely extraordinary on a phenomenal scale no other country has in terms of contact tracing. And you know, it's sort of not very well uh, publicized, but I can assure you that the impact of the disease will be much, much more if this team is not constantly working, combining manual contact tracing and digital contact tracing. Now, what are the ways out of the pandemic? One, I said, was testing and tracking. Testing has become incredibly more frugal without compromising on quality. There have been tests developed in India which are absolutely world-class. Uh, our science labs have developed many tests. They are now partnering with industry to scale up for cheap tests, uh, frugal tests, without compromising quality for India and abroad. Typically, a test which costs $40 abroad will cost about $4 here uh, or and soon less. These are new tests where, unlike the RT-PCR, the newer ones will allow much more frequent testing. Much more frequent testing for hospitals, offices, uh, airports means that you can keep testing the same set of people or new set of people who come to work regularly, you know, every day so that they know what's happening in a very simple manner. And, and so they and their contacts can be isolated should there be a problem. Now, it is true that testing allows you to know who is positive and potentially isolate them, but prevention is much better than uh, dealing with this on such a large population. How do you prevent the disease from taking over? It is very difficult in our situation to do that but the solution is simple, and therefore technology needs to come in on how to do it in the physical context. If you distance yourself from everyone else, and if you wear a mask whenever you are in relatively closer proximity, then the disease will not spread. Now, this is easy to say, but it is hard to do. It is easy to say and do in environments where people are well to do. It's very difficult to do this in an environment where there are 10 people in a room and they're going in a densely crowded environment uh, to work and back. It also turns out that we know quite a bit now about how the virus spreads. It is not that every single person who's positive spreads it, but some people, it's the context which is important. People in that context, for example, speaking to an audience 
from a podium and have the whole audience cheering and singing. In other words, there's a lot of inhaling of the air around can cause a lot of spread, particularly if that environment is a closed environment. So closed environments where there's intense contact or prolonged contact with people who are relatively mildly infected, these are the kinds of situations where the spread occurs. So we need now technology which looks at using face masks and distancing and ventilation in our context in dramatic way. So I urge you, the IEEE team, to look at those possibilities. Our office has been early on propagating the use of masks and have used a variety of groups all over the country to manufacture face covers on large scale and distribute them. Uh, but we need now innovative solutions about how would you ventilate a room when several people are sleeping in the same room at night. Is there other um, ingenious ways of ventilation? How would you um, have uh, you know um, cleanliness in a situation where 50 to 100 to 1,000 people share a bath or toilets? Our office has built out, has brought out protocols for these kinds of things, and these are feasible. Their people are very willing to learn. And because of this kind of learning, we actually had an enormous impact. The Bombay Municipal Corporation, the Mumbai uh, Municipal Corporation, had enormous impact in Dharavi, for example, where the situation would have been pretty bad. But Dharavi, it turned out, was much better controlled than before. There is a view which is being tested out widely that these kinds of measures, like masking and distancing, also decrease the viral load uh, which is inhaled by people. And a decreased viral load, the hypothesis, is uh, results in milder forms of the disease. If that is so, then it is very important, all the more important, that you know, one um, has these kinds of measures widely in place. Remember, this is early stages of the pandemic. We are not yet you know, in, in mid game or even near end game. And the reason is that there are basically one good way out, and that is vaccines. Uh, and that will take some time to roll out, even though vaccines will be ready soon. Vaccines typically take uh, 10 to 15 years to make and cost hundreds of millions of dollars. We are now, the world is now, trying to make a vaccine which takes 10 to 15 years, do that in one year. And that costs billions of dollars. Now, India is one of the world's largest vaccine manufacturing hubs. And India, two out of three children anywhere in the world get to UNICEF vaccines made in India. Uh, two out of three vaccinations, vaccines which children get are made in India. So India has got enormous manufacturing capability. And Indian vaccine manufacturers have saved lives all over the world. But what India is doing now is absolutely fantastic. These big vaccine manufacturing companies, medium-sized companies, academic uh, and entrepreneurs are also developing new vaccines. There's a creativity which is absolutely stunning, just as there was extraordinary creativity I mentioned in testing, extraordinary creativity in making personal protective equipment and ventilators. So this pandemic has brought together our science, our academia, our entrepreneurship, and our industry in new ways, which is absolutely fantastic. So coming back to the vaccine pillar, we will have a vaccine relatively soon, and now technology is needed to develop the vaccine. We have to scale our manufacturing, stockpiling, fill and finish, distribution on a cold chain, reaching the last mile in a huge population, ensuring that people are not vaccinated more than necessary, but everyone who's needed to be vaccinated is vaccinated according to priority set. This is a major IT plus logistics challenge, which our health ministry and our IT ministry are working with our IT industry and others to develop in a big way. And your ideas will be invaluable over there. So the vaccine distribution will uh, be done in a manner which is prioritized by the government according to global standards. India will also be partnering with the rest of the world in exporting uh, vaccines which are made here. Because, as I said, India is one of the world's largest manufacturing hubs for vaccine. Now, the second, um, I already talked about testing. Um, the other aspect which can get us out of the woods are drugs and therapeutics. Drugs usually come about much before vaccines, 
but drugs are also less likely to be effective because the virus uses our machinery to replicate, and therefore a drug will affect us as well as the virus. So getting a specific drug is always a big challenge. But when that happens, you actually get a very good tool. Uh, sometimes you have a drug which is modestly effective, another drug which is also modestly effective, so you create a cocktail uh, which is much more effective. These drugs have to be used early on because if the viral load amplifies, uh, you know, then the virus has got much more opportunity than the drug has. Therefore, the testing and, and tracing again become very important in terms of administering available drugs and therapeutics. Some kinds of drugs are very valuable later on. For example, the steroid dexamethasone is proven to be very valuable, it's very inexpensive. But there also, it requires the hospitalization early on of people. Therefore, identifying people, identifying hospital beds, making sure that they two are connected is also a big IT challenge in our complex environment, which has been taken up in a big way but your role there has been very, very important. So the second pillar, first was vaccines, second was drugs and uh, therapeutics, and I've already talked about the third, testing and tracking. All these three, there are enormous opportunities for frugal quality innovation on scale so that they reach a large population. Now, I've not mentioned another aspect, unrelated apparently to the pandemic, but directly related in uh, terms of the consequences, is about livelihood. We need to be, again, very innovative now about livelihood in our context. Those who are well-to-do have access to remote ways of working and remote teaching and training and so on. What does that mean in, to a situation where kids cannot play with each other, cannot talk to each other, cannot go to school for the poorest of the poor? Uh, how does one deal with that? Again, innovative solutions are needed so that social distancing, physical distancing, and masking can be done, where at the same time, teaching tools can be used. And here we have to think hard, but I'm sure you can in a manner where the fact nature of the classroom can be changed to a relatively open environment and allows um, physical distance, but teaching also to take place in resource poor environments. This is very, very important. If you don't have ways by which children can interact with each other without spreading disease, we are going to be caught between a rock and a hard place. This is a global problem with particular Indian overtones depending on our context, and those solutions need to be put in place uh, uh, rapidly, and your innovation and your ideas are going to be very important. I'd like to end here by saying that when I started, that the way humans have worked on the planet over the last several decades has been postponing the costs of what we do to the planet, resulting in high quality, cheap goods for our consumer lives. This results in future generations paying for the quality of lives, the supposed quality of lives we have. This will now start changing. We will have to pay now for the costs of our change on the planet and therefore we must look at ways by which we have innovative, frugal solutions for everyone across the economic scale so that whatever we do, we don't cause damage to the planet in terms of climate change, mitigate the consequences, reverse where possible, and reverse our damage on biodiversity uh, and on the environment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. So all of us uh, had a feel of listening to the person who actually knows it. And we all had an, uh, I think you will not have any better person to speak about this current situations. So he has explained uh, from the very beginning and what is the future that is ahead of us with respect to pandemic. So he had a very good uh, view of that. And with respect to technological support that you have mentioned, sir, yeah, we in IEEE we are trying to uh, extend all type of uh, support in our own way, like uh, low bandwidth uh, streaming of data and all these things. So we are taking up in our regular section, and 
we will take that aspect of thinking also we will take it forward to support your bigger vision we once again thank you for your time and your thought now we go to uh, professor atul ayare he is the director of beldas pg halakatti technical campus Yeah. Uh, very good morning from historical city of Bijapur of Karnataka state of India. I, Dr. Atul Ayer, director of uh, BLD's technical campus and principal of BLD's Vashakti Sabha, Dr. P. G. Halkatti College of Engineering and Technology, Bijapur, on behalf of our honourable president, Dr. M. B. Patil, with the former uh, Home Minister of the Government of Karnataka and uh, president of uh, BLD Association, and Sri Rahul Patil, director of the BLD Association. We welcome you on this beautiful and exciting morning, sir. I deem it my privilege to propose a word of thanks to this August gathering. The HSC conference was supposed to conduct at our campus in Bijapur in Karnataka, but due to pandemic situation, we have to conduct this conference virtual online mode. I hope organizers and the researchers, the paper presenters, will find HSC very fruitful and useful to the entire mankind. So we are conducting this conference on a virtual mode. Let me take this opportunity to brief about the BLD Association and BLD Engineering College. The Bijapur Linga District Educational Association (BLDA) was established in the year of 1910. Uh, it is not a pro uh, not for the profit organization, catering to the education needs of underprivileged children and widening education opportunities. Promoting religious, scientific, and general literature is one of the important objectives of the association. BND aims to achieve the, this objective by establishing schools, colleges, and free student hostels for poor students. The association with a rich history of more than a century is dedicated for multilingual uh, development through its, uh, the, uh, its wide educational and cultural education framework. BND Association sponsors and runs more than 80 institutions in both rural and urban areas of Bijapur and the Bangalore districts of the Canada State in India in the form of primary and high school, pre university college, under college or undergraduate college of arts, science, commerce, law, management, education, science, fine arts, pharmacy, nursing, nursery, sericulture, engineering, and polytechnic, and obviously the medical sciences with postgraduate courses and which is also uh, we have a renowned BSD link to the university at Bijapur. Ranked 53 All India Engineering Institution by the Times Survey, BNDS Bachan Sutama, Dr. P.J. Alkati, College of Engineering and Technology, is uh, one of the premier institutions in North Karnataka region with enormous campus spread across the 20 acres of the land in the historical city of the Bijapur. The Eastern Institution was established in the year 1980 and under the umbrella of the BLD Association. The institute has the international MOUs with the universities like the Porto University, uh, Portugal and the uh, Lublin University of Technology, Poland, and with various government authorities like IHECOM, ECF, and most of the agencies in India. The biggest strength of the institution is in its highest ambitious human resource that the institution has almost 200 well-qualified faculty members and among uh, we have uh, 36 uh, doctors from the IITs and the NITs running their educational services to the students. The faculty of the institution are actively involved not only in teaching and learning courses but also in research activity. The institute has received uh, more than 10 crores of the uh, uh, funding from various agencies like BSC, MIF, BGSC, and the KSC, uh, besides publishing the research articles in various journals of the international journal. I must, I must uh, congratulate uh, our honorable president of the Bhakti Party and Mr. Sri Rahul Party for their, this particular endeavor in the Bijapur. It's a North Canada and it's a historical city of the Bijapur where Abhika Dynasty and the, it's a world heritage site and I think uh, we uh, miss uh, this particular conference to be conducted at the Bijapur campus. Now coming to the word, word of thanks, uh, first of all I would like to thank uh, uh, the our uh, Honorable President Dr. Ayanga Patil for enormous support and the cooperation to go ahead with this IEEE uh, conference in collaboration with the uh, IEEE Bangalore uh, section to conduct uh, BHTC. Uh, Sri Rahul Patil, our young and regional director of the PLN Association, is a pioneer person who is well versed with the global technologies need for humanitarian aspects for development of entire mankind. 
I'm grateful to the chief guest, uh, to the chief guest, uh, Professor, uh, Professor K. Vijay Raghav, for accepting our invitation on behalf of the IT company and the BAD city and making it to the attempt and inaugurate the conference despite of his busy schedule. Thank you very much for the sir. We are very fortunate to have a Professor SN3, Chair IEEE India Council, among us. Thank you, sir, for joining this inaugural session and the providing your insights. I would like to specifically thank Mr. Konik Mishra, Chair IEEE Bangalore uh, Section and General Chair IEEE BSCC for conceptualizing this conference and the leading from the friends to make this conference grand success. His deep involvement in each and every aspect of the conference organization is excellent. We would like also to thank uh, our past chairs of the IEEE Bangalore Section, uh, Exicom members, the chairs of various sections of India, Exicom members of the India Council, a plenary and invited speakers, BLD's management, a staff, a student, and a delegates of this particular conference to join the inaugural session on 8th of October 2020. This conference uh, would have not been successful without the support of uh, Dr. Vinesh Konal, uh, IEEE coordinator on behalf of Yale City and his stream of energetic students of the IEEE chapter. All HOAs, TPC chairs, TPC members, reviewers, and authors of the submitted papers who have put tremendous amount of efforts and energy during the last six months. Thank you one and all, and I uh, hope to see you at this particular conference being the best, uh, best of uh, uh, energetic uh, performances in the research and uh, uh, technological fields. Thank you one, and thank you one and all. Thank you very much, Professor Ayare. Uh, and with this, we come to the end of the opening session. Uh, keynote addresses are lined up uh, for the participants immediately after this. And wishing you all the best for the conference in these three days. Uh, I'm signing off for now. Please take care and please stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, hosting the inaugural session. Now, immediately after this, we will be moving to our keynote speeches, and uh, we are going to have our next keynote. Our keynote speaker is Dr. Hari Sande, who is founder of Telco. So I will just read out his brief bio. Dr. Hari Sande is a renewable energy entrepreneur over 25 years of grassroots experience in understanding, developing, and deploying sustainable energy solutions for underserved communities. He was awarded for the Raman Maxesse Award in 2011. Today, Selco is an umbrella organization each task to address gaps in the energy access ecosystem, namely Selco India, which was founded in 1994, Energy Access Enterprise, Selco Foundation, to, uh, 2010, the non-profit R&D Selco Incubation Center, which was founded in 2012, nurturing grassroots energy enterprise and Finally, Selco Fund in the year 2016, deploying patient capital. So we are very honored to have uh, Dr. Hari Shande to be with us. Now, platform is yours. You can go ahead, sir. Uh, uh, well, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, uh, and for this always, it's been one year. Can you hear me, Puneet, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Sure, thanks, and um, I'm honored to speak uh, after uh, Dr. Vijayakaranji, who has uh, very nicely laid out uh, the responses that he has had for the COVID response. And while it's a great challenge, uh, but I'm glad that uh, our government, as well as Dr. Uh, Vijayakaran, has been able to look at COVID-19 as something as a challenge for a huge population. I mean, a lot of people sometimes do not understand the, the challenge as a country of 1.3 billion people we face. And it's very easy to comment from outside, but it's very difficult to come out with such solutions and, and control, control a pandemic-like situation, which could have devastated our country in multiple manners. So I would say, so I just wanted to start today saying that 
India has not only played a role during COVID, also it's a critical role for all, all of us to play what should our role be during COVID and post COVID in terms of technology for underserved populations of our country. Now what has happened interestingly over the years, when we talk, talk about innovation, when we talk about invention, when we talk about entrepreneurship, it always starts at the middle class and the more middle class and then slowly trickles down to the poor of our country, which is unfortunate because we never try to understand the problems of the poor from their perspective, where we start creating platforms where the poor are partners, not beneficiaries, where poor kid is a partner for us in innovation or entrepreneurship. We always have looked at as if we will come up with the solutions and we are going to actually give it to the poor. I think that thought process, if we have, we as a country lose the opportunity of being an innovator and a solver of problems worldwide. India is in such a position today that the problems of Assam are the problems of Tanzania and Brazil. The problems of Karnataka are the problems of Philippines and Togo. The problems of Maharashtra are the problems of Mongolia and, and, and Mozambique. We are a microcosm of the world's problem. That means we can be a microcosm of the world's solutions. That is what we need to have opportunity. 60% of our poor who have been deeply affected by COVID-19, all of us who are in the webinar today can, are, can afford to work from home, can afford to actually say that I am on a webinar. But 60% of the people, if they all behave like this, they will starve. They will starve. Do you think a street vendor can afford to work from home? Or, or a pani puri matter? Or a vegetable farmer? If a rice farmer, can he afford to work from home? If all the farmers today said we are going to work from home, we will all go hungry tomorrow. But how many of us actually work on innovations that is truly centric around a farmer, a paddy farmer, a cotton farmer, you know, simple value chain like cotton has multiple steps. It is picking, ginning, spinning, sewing everywhere a technology intervention can actually happen. A blacksmith blower, when he hammers the thing every day, but we have never innovated for a blacksmith blower. No new innovations that we actually work on because that is not high tech. Who defines high tech? High tech is not sitting in front of a computer. And to all the youngsters, and hopefully to the youngsters, it is not about creating a code, but it's about really understanding where you start owning a problem of a blacksmith blower, you start owning the problem of a silk weaver, you start owning the problem of a cotton picker, and then you will realize that those solutions are 100 times more complicated than any other innovation that you can actually think about because that needs social engineering, that needs, that needs technological engineering, that needs environmental engineering, and a lot of our brains don't work on those three dimensions. Uh, we are either a mechanical engineer or an electrical engineer. The poor of our country are more socially educated than many of us who are technically educated on paper. How, is it, how are they social educated? moment I would interview a mechanical engineer, the first thing you will say, sir, oh, that is electrical, that is not my job. You go and ask a tomato vendor, tomorrow there are no tomatoes. Is she going to tell, I am a tomato selling expert, so I will not sell tomatoes anymore. I, I, and, and tomato prices go up. They say that, I am sorry, I cannot sell anything. If she says that, her three kids will starve to starve. The question is, she will sell potatoes. How is she able to transfer her knowledge right from tomatoes to potatoes, which is a different art for selling. But we, as we get more and more educated and as we go from bachelor's to master's to PhD, we get narrower and narrower and we get more useless for society, frankly. We get less useless, in fact. So, yes, I have a PhD because I was confused for five years, okay? I don't know what I did in PhD, what is the use of PhD. The more I learned was in rural India. Rural India was something that taught me all my education. A rural farmer in Puttur taught me what it meant to be a farmer, what it meant to be a social engineer, 
a, a, a person in Dharwa taught me what it meant by a difference between 1% interest rate versus 2% interest rate, the paddy farmer in Dharwa. In Kalahandi, the tribal world actually taught me the dynamics of family, technology, and future. How should a future of sustainability and environment just without using those buzzwords that we all like to use and present papers. That is where the beauty of this country lies, that every individual in the 600 million people who live in the rural areas or the poorer parts of, of Mumbai, Bangalore, in the slums, are innovators, entrepreneurs, thought. But we, unfortunately, have created a barrier because until you do not have a degree on paper, you do not have a degree or you cannot be called an expert. I think what we need to look at is how can we make the 600 million people as partners? If we truly look at COVID-19, COVID-19 is an opportunity in front of us. COVID-19 has presented us an opportunity to reset the way the world can work. COVID-19 is reset how technology can work. COVID-19 has a reset of what humanity can be. As Dr. Vijay, say, Vijay uh, Sarji said, they've been working hard for COVID and, and the vaccines and India has done. Yes, let us also take the leadership of how to make this world a truly inclusive world where each and every individual poor 600 million people can have the same aspirations in a more sustainable manner where we start innovating for the rice alarm, where we start innovating for the for the hammer hammer mill of a blacksmith where we start innovating for a better swing machine for the seamstress what how can areca nut be dried in a better manner how, a simple thing like efficient cook stoves have not been designed we have spent millions of dollars but still one million women and children around the world die of indoor air pollution what are we doing about it that is an opportunity that covid 19 is actually a curtain raiser for a larger crisis behind the climate crisis the climate crisis, in both the crises, who has been affected the most? The poor. The poor of a country, Africa, Southeast Asia, across the world, Paris, Washington, the poor have been affected. We today have a chance because of our being the, being the threshold of all problems, that means we are also a threshold of solutions. If we truly look at SDGs, SDG 1, to SDG 17, India can actually create a hallmark. Think of having Bijapur SDGs, Bangalore SDGs, Karnataka SDGs, Manipur SDGs. We should break the SDGs into multiple parts rather than just looking at India SDGs. One, we look at Manipur SDG, which will be very good and nice for Tanzania SDG. The SDG for Bijapur is equivalent to Freetown in in the capital of Sierra Leone then could be a collaboration between the capital of Sierra Leone and Bijapur where Bijapur SDGs are competing or mapped with where both of them can learn from each other for example right so we can use technology but I'm asking the youngsters that forget the technology and the Google search every time you see a problem that you want to complain against the government Think before you complain to the government, do you have five solutions that you can take to the government? I would ask all of us as citizens of this country, stop complaining and create solutions. Each, each of the engineers solved five problems on a monthly basis, our country will be solved. And so I think there's a huge relationship between COVID-19, um, uh, SDGs, and poverty eradication. Now, COVID-19 has actually showed us was what resource poor actually mean to many of the people who did not feel it that way. But that COVID-19 type of crisis, the poor of the country were always feeling it. It was nothing new to them, but it is new to us. In many ways, they were facing different crises. In Bihar, the floods. In Assam, the floods. In Maharashtra, the droughts. Those crises are much more than COVID-19. But they never come on the front page of the newspapers because they are not exciting. So I would request, and Puneet has been great in terms of pushing the agenda of this IEEE humanitarian. It's more than just humanitarian. It is the way to put India on the map of the superpower of solutions for the world. 
create solutions and to the, all the youngsters. And all I, all I uh, Puniji, we should also do is in the last two days, as you have seen, out of four Nobel Prize winners, three were women. Okay. And Mirko Dukh kiyo hota hai ki ek bhi IIT director women nahi hai. Kabhi bhi nahi hai. So, hum log, jaysa hum uh, gender ki baat kare, if we are not encouraging women to come up, right? And the question is, we also, I have stopped going to panels where there are only men. I have, I have a pledge that any of my office will not accept my, this one on a panel if there are no women on a panel. Because we men have become so much inherent ki hami log baat karenge, hami log karenge. But we all talk about gender very nicely, but we do not include, there is not a single IIT women, a director that has become a woman at all in so many, in 70 years of our independence. Why? Right? REC, I don't know, I was Googling whether IIT or REC is not in the same way. Right? Agar, because the fundamental, if we do not include women of 50% of anything we do, top councils, Two members of a top council is of no use. Fifth, until we do not include that 50% of our population that are women, we are not going to solve poverty. Because the way women think are very, very different. The passion, the, the, the humanity that actually comes in, why should somebody actually do it, is very critical. And, and, and the thought process, they're brilliant. And you look at in the last two days, Four may say three women Nobel Prize winners. Three women Nobel Prize winners, right? Two in chemistry and one in physics. So when other countries are moving ahead, we who actually have created, I mean, and say we worship women in many ways and goddess and everything else, we have to take responsibility of making sure gender, not only in terms of from IITs to ITIs to rookies, at the ground level, that we have to make responsible choices and create equal platform that all women engineers all have got equal opportunity, Puneet sir, that as you and me would get it, for example. But we somewhere restrict. So I request all directors of local engineering colleges also to reflect why gender is not happening. We always say gender is great, but in technology, oh, there are no women engineers. I would blame the parents. Boss, why can't there be women engineers? And I also tell men, why do you hesitate to go into the kitchen? What is this men that cannot go into kitchen that is manly? I'm sorry, you can't go into the kitchen, you're not manly, for example, right? Until we do not, and let's look at I, IEEE as a benchmark that creates gender as an issue and that's only where that poverty can be solved. Puneet sahab, aurek statistics says, cook stoves, cook stoves, wo baat karte na. There are 40 people in the world working on cook stoves. Unfortunately, most of, them are, most of them are men who have never cooked. Okay. So, are going to decide how cook stoves are going to be designed. Right? The question is, yaar, yeah, until we do not... So that is where I think we need to break those myths and, 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 and we look at... COVID-19, where India becomes a champion. And why my nervousness? I tell you, Puneet, see, then they were talking. It's like, abhi hamare paas 10 saal hai. 2030 ko SDG goals hai. Uh, uh, UN has decided that it's SDG goals. And many of other countries are lagging. India should take the leadership right now. The engineers, the MBAs, the ITIs, everything should take the leadership right now in poverty, education, health, livelihoods, ocean technology, everything else, map out our, our expertise in each of the 17 SDG goals and start creating targets. Every engineering college should have a target. Every management school have, should have, have its target. Every uh, social school should have its target. Medical should, should have school. Medical colleges also I would request that you are not only looking at just medical, but can I make every technology highly efficient? My simple question is, why can't you make a small X-ray machine that can be going to remote part of Karnataka or remote part of India? Are nahi, nahi, sir, technology is sophisticated. Hai. Are boss, ab Mars mein hum log gaadi chalate hain yahan se baithke. Okay, remotely hum log gaadi yahan chalate hain Mars mein and can't we run a remotely an X-ray machine in Mojoli Islands of Assam? Why not? Right? The question is, it is for us to open our minds 
and say, boss, even if we lack number of doctors going into the rural areas, can we make technology in a manner that is so sophisticated that I don't need a doctor going everywhere? Because then if a mother is able to deliver in rural part of Odisha or in, in Kalandi or in uh, or in Assam, is able to deliver a child properly in remotely, we have succeeded as a country. So I think, Puneet Sab, we have a wonderful opportunity to look at SDGs, COVID-19, as well as as long as we start owning the problems. A country like ours starts owning the problems in terms of water, energy, uh, sustainability, everything else. But I request all the youngsters to just not do research in terms of by Googling, but also, boss, can I come up with five to seven solutions? We have an important opportunity to do that. Punik uh, Abulai, but I also request everybody to also start looking at poor as innovators. A, a food vendor who is working outside, he is an innovator. He is an entrepreneur. He might not have a degree in paper, but he has a degree of social science that he has learned and done. And that I think we need to respect. If there is, there, is a, there, is a, there is a cobbler who is actually showing the policy, that's the person who can teach me how, what is the next technology for polishing shoes. He is an expert of actually doing that. There are so many experts on our streets. Let us recognize them. If we start recognizing them and creating partnerships of them, them then our 600 million people will showcase to the 3 billion poor people in the world that the solution that if I go to India, I will get a solution for a blacksmith, a rice farmer, a drought, a flood, earthquake. If I go to India, I will get the solution. And that is where our strength is. But we need to realize what our strength is and not look at the US or Europe that that will actually teach us. We ourselves a lot of things that Africa and we should concentrate on Africa, Latin America, the poor of India. Thank you, sir, for calling me, Puneet, sir, for this. It's a, it's a strange platform, uh, but uh, 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 but it is, it is a very nice. Ek saal chala gaya, jaldi jaldi. Uh -huh. Lekin, uh, I think what you have taken up uh, uh, if in whatever contribution we can do, and Ashok is also there, a good old friend. Um, I'm not, um, not met, as he said. But I think what you have taken up is something to stand the pot and make it a little more provocative. Why can we do this? अगर मार्च में गाड़ी चला सकते हैं तो हम एक्सरे मशीन रूरल में क्यों नहीं चला सकते हैं या बर्थिंग क्यों नहीं कर सकते हैं एंड इट इज ऑल पॉसिबल इफ यू स्टॉप कंप्लेनिंग एंड स्टार्ट डूइंग द सॉल्यूशन एंड दैट इज थैंक यू सर थैंक यू फॉर दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी थैंक यू थैंक यू सर थैंक यू फॉर वेरी वेरी एक्सप्रेसिव एंड इंकरेजिंग आई कैन से फ्रॉम फ्रॉम डीप ऑफ योर हार्ट यू हैव स्पोक एंड यू स्पोक वेरी वेल ऑन द टेक्नोलॉजीज व्हिच इंडिया कैन प्ले अ रियली मीनिंगफुल रोल फ्रॉम द ऑफ द टेक्नोलॉजी और एनी टेक्नोलॉजीज व्हाटएवर यू हैव डिस्कस आई फुल्ली एग्री विद यू एंड आई स्टिल रिमेंबर आवर डिस्कशन ड्यूरिंग दिसंबर 2019 व्हेन वी हैड इन अहमदाबाद दैट आई इनवाइटेड यू फॉर दिस I, you will be happy to know that immediately after that, when we took over, I took over as a section chair, we started the idea of student humanitarian technology project, okay, nice. which we discussed that we will be funding the students to develop the technology which can can be used for societal problems. And you will be happy to know that not one or two, we have funded 72 such projects in engineering colleges of uh, Karnataka. And nice. those presentations nice. are... Those presentations are planned in the next uh, tomorrow from 2 to 5. Uh, if you are having time, please come and see that those students, they will be delivering their presentations. And I also fully agree with your idea that yes, India can be a role model or we can be a case study which African countries or other countries, they can take from us because we are able to deliver the solutions which at least two thirds of the globe is facing. India alone can give the solution for two thirds of the global community. So thank you very much for joining us and for very, very wonderful and exciting uh, presentation. And this is from our side. So this is a virtual content. So we thought that we will hand over you a virtual plate as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> And now some real class. <laughs> 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 yes. Thanks, thanks, Harish. That's great. Yeah, thank great you. to hear you. No, thank you, sir. Thank you.
Thank you. Now I can see our uh, next speaker, keynote speaker, Karthik Kulkarni is also with us. So actually he is from Bangalore only and we are very honored to have him. He is now heading the Global IT Humanitarian Activities Committee and he is going to provide his perspective on social return of investment. So he has brought conceptualized about the uh, idea of how you can measure the social investment in the form of return of investment or what anybody does, especially in the case of ISOPLE. So welcome, Karthik. Thank you for joining us. In time, I know we are slightly late, but yes, because the speeches are so thought-provoking, it is really hard for us to stop them in between. And But most of them, they are uh, adhering their time schedule, and I hope uh, you will also do the same. So welcome, Karthik. I will just read out the brief bio for the attendee who, who does not know him very well. So Karthik is the chairman of IEEE Humanitarian Activities Committee, the strategic global arm of IEEE Board of Directors that manages IEEE's portfolio of programs and multi-million dollar project investment that leverage 400,000 plus engineers in 160 plus countries in applying and advancing technology solutions for sustainable development. Karthik is the co-founder of ImpactX.co social network for social impact with focus on impact measurement using an innovative approach called the Hyper Catalog. In 2019, Karthik has spearheaded social impact measurement of IEEE sustainable development projects around the world using the technology of social return of investment. Karthik also heads Oracle's team Architecting the blockchain technology engine. He is co inventor on 10 plus US patents, both granted and pending. The Discover Foundation recognized Karthik as 2015 USA's new face of engineering. So, welcome, Karthik. Over to you. Thank you very I will much. Make you a presenter. Yeah, thank you very much, Puneet. Uh, firstly, uh, I'm, I'm really happy to see Bangalore section uh, and uh, Puneet taking this uh, great initiative to emphasize humanitarian activities and sustainable development uh, projects uh, you know, as part of the bank section. Uh, I think, uh, you know, as Puneet Raiki mentioned, I originally come from uh, Bangalore itself, probably in Karnataka, but uh, I, I did work in Bangalore. And uh, a lot of my IEEE involvement started in Bangalore, so I really owe a lot to this section. So thank you for uh, inviting me to this session. Before I start, I'm, I'm really excited to hear the Harish Handeji talking uh, so amazingly and, and then emphasizing the role that India can play. Right? So I, I think it's a, it's a very interesting which really Really, really is, is about higher investment to all of these wonderful projects and ideas that our uh, engineering community has, some of the ideas that were discussed, some of the ideas that we presented in this conference, and so forth, right? So, you know, my uh, point here is uh, all of these great ideas can, can become reality, provided there is significant investment, investment of all sorts, not just the funding, but uh, also the human resources and, and other resources. Now, any investment uh, for that to happen, there needs to be measurable outcomes and outputs. That's just how the investment and the return on investment world works. So today, you know, I, I want to talk about, you know, what if you don't measure social impact? Does it really exist? Perhaps this is a rhetorical question, but it also it also forces us to think, what exactly are we doing as part of IEEE as part of, you know, the so-called humanitarian technology sector and so forth. Uh, so before we begin, uh, you know, a quick introduction of uh, Humanitarian Activities Committee. Uh, as some of you know, uh, HAC or the Humanitarian Activities Committee is the arm of IEEE that supports uh, volunteers. Uh, most of them are engineers who are working on the ground to sol solve local problems using technology. And, uh, you know, one of the most visible programs of our committee is the SITE program. SITE stands for Special Interest Group on Humanitarian Technology. Uh, so, 
you know, when, when COVID pandemic hit this year, uh, 200 plus proposals came in from various parts of the world, right? All of these proposals from volunteers like you, engineers like you, who, who wanted to uh, come up with uh, innovative uh, solutions to solve local uh, problems. Uh, many of these uh, went on to solve the, the you know, lack of ventilators. Um, you know, many of them went on to uh, uh, technology and so forth. And uh, as you can see here, India has, has, you know, once again emerged as the hotbed for these ideas. So uh, what was also interesting this year was Africa also emerged as the second hot uh, a change in of activity. So India definitely has been a uh, uh, popular and extremely uh, active player in this sector, right? So here's an example of uh, one of our volunteer community in South Sudan, uh, manufacturing uh, various personal protective equipment using local supply chains. I, I bring this up because South Sudan, as you all know, is not one of the most uh, uh, peaceful and then uh, most most uh, stable uh, parts of the world, but but our engineering community is pretty strong in this area, especially in in the areas where uh, internally displaced people are are located. So there are a lot more projects like this. So what we have done this year is we have grouped together various projects that our people uh, work on, and then we have what we call the communities of practice. Uh, so these are areas where we bring together experts where we bring together aspiring uh, you know, people who want to contribute to this area and also the project developers, right? So we bring, to, bring them together and the hope is that there is, uh, there is uh, the, the exchange of ideas and exchange of uh, lessons learned and a lot of catalyzation that happens. So we have medical devices, information communication technology, community sanitization, sorry, sensitization, uh, infection control device and food security. So these, these are these are these have emerged as the most popular communities of practice this year. So you know, special interest group on humanitarian technology. As uh, some of you know, we have more than 100 groups. I think 150 groups to be precise in, in around 50 countries. We have more than 10,000 uh, members around the world who are working on projects. So you know, this is a very quick quick glance of what HAC and IEEE offers them as support. There's a project funding program that we run. We do we do fund events like this one. We also fund conference participation. So uh, I will share the links and, and we, we really encourage you to take advantage of these programs. Now, coming to the topic at hand, we have amazing ideas, we have amazing projects, but, but how are we going to bring in resources, right? You know, the, the funding program that we talked about, you know, that's a grant program. Okay, that can only go so far, right? If you look at the the sustainable development goals, you know, which which are uh, a, which we target to meet uh, within 2030, there's a gap of 2.5 trillion dollars, an estimated 2.5 trillion US dollars, right? So you can't you can't expect people to donate, you can't expect people to you know give you grants of of this kind of uh, tune so that you could go and achieve the sustainable development goals. You know, we have to move away from this mentality of funding and grants to financing. Think of this as any other business that is that is uh, set out there to make revenue and self-sustain and grow and so forth. But really, you know, the, our our ulterior is to uh, meet the sustainable development goals. So, you know, we also ha we already have um, a, a sector of investing called the impact investing. And this sector uh, really cares about the sustainable development goals. The sector has investors that are willing to um, look at the non-financial return on investment, sometimes referred to as a social or environmental return on investment, as a vehicle to fund these projects, right? So, you know, Global Impact Investors Network has in fact uh, estimated that this market size is about 500 billion US dollars, right? So the question is, how can how can we, how can our community rise to claim a market share in this sector? How can how can we create more opportunity for the impact investors to actually invest in? So that's that's really the key question. 
And there are several challenges. If you look at our own projects, a lot of you have been part of several projects and have looked at different projects that uh, you know, IEEE has supported. And you will see that there is not only risk, I mean, any, any investment has a risk, but there's also a, a big deal of uncertainty that is associated with our projects, right? The risk is when probabilities of outcomes are known, right? You know, uh, uncertainty is when both probabilities and the outcomes are known. Now, that is the state that in, in which we are, right? So we, we, we have to attract investors. We have to create more credibility for the investors to invest. We have to be both risk and uncertainty, right? Now, there, there are several challenges. Some, some got to do with our approach. Some got to do with the system. There's been a challenge of the lack of due diligence in the sector, right? Everybody, you know, I don't say everybody, but a lot of people who work in the sector claim success very easily, right? They appeal to efficient. Any, any donation is, is lauded. Act of kind is valued. And the systemic lack of due diligence, operational, functional, technical. Think of think of the the due diligence that is done uh, before you invest in a stock uh, of, of a company, right? There are auditors, there are assurers, there are all, all sorts of support organizations that are making sure that you know the the company that you're invested in or the project that you're invested in is meeting technical, operational, functional, quality deliverables. Now that is that is missing from the sector, and I would say that the, the most fundamental problem here is lack of impact measurement, right? We, we seem to seek happiness in appealing to the emotional quotient, but the investors are really, really looking for numbers, are really looking for what is it that you're, you're doing and how can we measure it? Because if we can't measure it, how can we improve it? That's, that's, that's a school of thought. This school of thought has several degrees of you know, sophistication to it. There's a school of thought that says, or a similar school of thought that says, if you can't measure it, how can you manage it? And, uh, you know, a very, very, um, you know, uh, sophisticated, uh, you know, the nuance of this, the same school of thought is, if you can't measure it, it does not exist. So if you claim that you've created impact and you cannot measure it, this school of thought and this school of thought, uh, you know, appeals to the investment sector is that if you can't measure it, it does not exist. Now, this is not to say that you have not created um, impact. It is, it is to point the fingers at our maturity when it comes to impact reporting, right? Most of our impact reporting is anecdotal. We love to tell stories. There's nothing wrong with the stories, but then it's, it's, it's just far from being uh, appealing to the investment community. Most of our impact reporting at the most, if not anecdotal, we, we typically go and say, uh, hey, we, we have our own metrics uh, that we have created that are easy to measure, and, and here, is the, here is the impact against my own defined metrics. That's, that's the extent of it. At least, at least that's what we have seen in a, in a large number of projects within IEEE. But you know what? There are standardized quantifiable metrics. Not all of them are quantifiable, but there are quantifiable metrics. The metrics that are mapped to sustainable development goals. And finally, there is the sophistication. There is a whole range of sophistication out there. We got to embrace, uh, you know, this, this higher levels of sophistication. If you look at our impact analysis maturity, our focus is on activities. We love to talk about what we did. Hey, we conducted an event. We trained 10 people. We, we deployed 20 solar panels. These are all great. There's nothing wrong about it. But but these are all activities, and at the most, outputs. But that's not going to move the needle. What is the outcome of what you're doing? Right? The focus on outcomes is is missing, and and that is that is what we have to talk about. It's not about what you're doing. It's not about the outputs of what you're doing. It's about what outcome are you able to achieve. So that is where we have to uh, advance to. And you know, last year one of the we, we tried one of we did one experiment. We said. Let's let's try and pilot a technique called the social return on investment technique that basically dollar quantifies the outcomes. That not only expresses the outcomes of our projects, 
but it also does it in a dollar quantifiable manner. It expresses impact as for each dollar invested, does X dollars of social impact created, right? Now, now, the whole exercise of social return on investment is to arrive at this value. A quick example, you know, we, we had a project uh, which deployed micro rural off-grid African community and uh, an investment of $100,000 resulted in an additional income for businesses in this community uh, and, and we had 25 household businesses and about $2,000, $2,900 of additional income. Now, this project ran for three years, so we, we said that, you know, you know the, the return on investment, investment here is about $128,700. So, so basically, the uh, ratio of this and said for every dollar invested we're looking at one to eight dollars of social return on investment. Now, it's not it's not to say that your investment will return in some money coming to you, but but this is the social return on investment, which is which means you have created this impact within the community. Now, this type of dollar quantification uh, has a particular framework to it, and uh, you know, typically it starts with listing out stakeholders who are involved in this, understanding what exactly changed for the stakeholders. You did some some deployment of microgrid, but what actually changed for them, right? What are the outputs and uh, outcomes, and uh, how can we measure them, right? So this is all about measurement. And when it comes to how how do we measure them, there are a range of techniques, such as uh, one of the ways of doing it is uh, using proxies. If, if let's say somebody else were to do were to do it using some other way, what would be the cost? That that could be taken as a potential financial proxy. And anyways, so this is one of the frameworks uh, to to you know uh, measure the uh, impact. And uh, we we did this wholeheartedly across the organization, uh, not just humanitarian activities committee or site, but but smart village, I took the foundation. Uh, Epics and IEEE and, and various other programs came together and uh, we did this piloting on a select number of projects from each of these organizations. And uh, I think we did learn quite a few lessons. One of the lessons that we learned is really the, to scale this whole impact measurement. We need to, we, we, can't, we can't have a committee do it. We need to basically engage our entire engineer base or volunteer base in doing this. So what we're doing is we're introducing a new impact assessment track where you could participate. Uh, you know, firstly, you, you'll have to learn impact assessment. Some of you might already be experts in it because of your job and so forth, but, but you could start uh, by, by participating in an education curriculum. We've, we've developed a curriculum and then we have uh, a, uh, a course that you could take. And then you could propose plans. So, so as you know, we've been putting several tens of projects each year. You could propose an assessment plan and say, look, this is how I want to assess this project. And you could go to the project's location. You could conduct surveys. You could do social return on investment calculations and then submit back a report. And this will be shared across the community. Now, this is a way for you to both learn and contribute. Um, so. So you know, I, I want to I want to stop by saying that you know we we have an education curriculum on this, and I really encourage all of you to participate, uh, learn impact assessment. If if and that's a that's a great skill set to have, both in your uh, regular jobs. It's, it's I'm sure it's going to make a difference, and and I, I encourage you to participate in in the impact assessment and measurement, and most importantly, you know, be impact centric. Before doing a project, think about what outcomes that you're creating and then measure it and then report it. Uh, with that, I would like to stop and here are uh, various URLs to get connected to both Humanitarian Activities Committee and SITE and to me. Um, you know, I look forward to any discussions or questions and uh, thank you. Over to you, Prith. Very, very insightful presentation as well as the concept of social return of investment. I fully agree with you, yes, you cannot measure it, that don't exist. Uh, and in the case of social 
investment mostly what we have told is fact that people will measure on their own way rather than there is a standard definition of how you are going to measure the social return of investment but defining this formula and creating this for at least for i to play is a really good contributions from your side as well as from hcc side uh, i just want to again acknowledge that i to play hcc has funded this Uh, even also, so thank you very, very much for IPCC for the kind of patronage. I think we are on time, and I can take few questions. If anyone is having any questions, please type in the chat window or in the Q and A window. I will be ha- more than happy to take one or two questions. Otherwise, Karthi, I am having one question. Please. What was your most satisfying experience as far as as the IPCC HSC chairman? uh well uh there, there are several uh, you know i i started uh, you know my journey 10 years back and uh, you know 10 years back i won the itp presidents uh, you, you know uh, change the world competition uh, being part of bangalore section and then the then itp president uh, asked me to be part of this committee and uh, at that point the, the idea was to somehow scale you know these one off projects uh, to 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 make it a movement around the world now that is how site was born i was i was very happy to to be the first chair of site and i still remember we had the first site petition flowing in but now this year you know we have more than 150 groups we have more than 200 project proposals around the world in fact uh, humanitarian has become so popular in itr2e that you know you know this is this is interesting one of our presidents had to come in and say hey i to play is lot more than humanitarian don't just think i to play as humanitarian now it is true that i to play is a lot more than humanitarian organization but the fact that people are confusing this to be a humanitarian organization means that we have been very happy to to to, to basically see the scale that we have achieved so that has been my my most satisfying experience yeah thank you karthik again I would like to listen from you. We have conceived and successfully implemented the idea of I to be DSCC. This is going to be an annual platform which we are going to create. In fact, I told in the beginning of my welcome address that we wanted to really demonstrate a model, uh, sustainable smart village in the district of Bijapur, so that those who are attending this conference they can physically go and see how the smart village can be developed. so we are having a very wonderful team with dr shoda dr naran submanam and dr jay krishnan divakaran and now dr hari sande has also extended his uh, support we would like to take uh, support from i also in going forward this initiative in coming years so that not only one we want to showcase several villages in part of karnataka is part of karnataka sustainable smart villages so just wanted to have a perspective on that you know this is this is a great initiative uh, i think uh, the fact that you were able to convene uh, the 400 or so entities and the fact that you you've convened uh, such uh, amazing speakers uh, really shows that uh, you know bangalore section is really really ripe for for humanitarian disruption to sort of say or, or rather you know uh, providing them a platform to to scale their humanitarian uh, impact i think i think bangalore section seems to be ready and i think this this definitely should should become uh, a trend a annual activity and uh, i think uh, i'm sure the humanitarian activities committee will be very very happy to support this program going forward and uh, so my only my only uh, input would be to Uh, aside social entrepreneurship rather than you know grant seeking projects as a team that is really uh, in my opinion, personal opinion uh, the path forward for sustainability as, as long as sustainability is concerned both operational and financial so uh, i th- i think this is a wonderful forum thing to happen <coughs> karthik this is a show thank you karthik thank you Karthik, this is Ashok. I will speak to you separately, but on these uh, metrics, how do you measure impact? Uh, our group with the US is also doing a lot of work. 
So perhaps we can touch base. Sure. Second is that one of the speakers in our session suggested that the best way to take the humanitarian technologies to the grounds, because it is about the grounds, is to involve the local chapters. Get the chapter heads into the humanitarian technology group. Tell them what we are trying to do. And then let them take a local lead in creating and taking these uh, you know, technologies, solutions, and initiatives that we are taking to the ground. Because that is one way IEEE can really impact and really contribute to this cause. Absolutely. So I think I think we should extend it uh, a little bit further. You know, in addition to involving the local chapter leaders, it is really the community that is that is supposed to be benefiting from the from this project to play the lead role. Uh, you know, some of the best projects and most successful projects that we have seen have really uh, involved community to the extent that the role of fighter please has has become very minimal. It had become catalytic, so to say. You know, because we are volunteers, uh, and then at some point we are going to make an exit from these projects, right? So, so you know, planning out our exit strategy in the sense that after we we are d done delivering a project, who would be you know playing a leadership role in maintaining it, continuing it, having those people take the leadership from the initial time is strategy when it comes to creating maximum impact. That's Absolutely, I agree with this you. So, the, I, I, yeah, the, the local chapters are only a means to reach to those communities, and eventually the community needs to win, you know, own it. Absolutely right. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Karthik. Thank you very much. So, this being a virtual conference, we are also giving our token of appreciation virtually. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. With this presentation, we are at the end of our inaugural session. So I would like to again thank Professor K. Vijay Raghavan, Dr. Hari Shande, Mr. Karthik Kulkarni, and all our past chairs. I can see few of them from India Council as well. Entire BATC community as well as student volunteers, these are virtual platforms. They are being created by our student volunteers. Our contribution is zero. In fact, they have done yesterday night and morning. I am ready and showcasing their uh, innovations with you. So thank you. Thank you very much. We will meet again at 11 o'clock in four breakout sessions. This main session will be having TS1. It will be continuing. So we are going to have 20 minutes of break, and after 20 minutes break, we are going to start the TS1 session here. Remaining three breakout sessions already links are given to all of the uh, presenters as well as author. So please join your breakaway session respectively, and our session chair as well as volunteers, they will be ready to welcome you. Thank you one and all. Thank you.
Uh, the background setting also you would be doing only when uh, when we when we are promoted as a panelist. Uh, Soumya, please stay tuned. Uh, we are waiting for a few more minutes as we would be starting the session by on dot eleven a.m. Uh, so we would be promoting you to panelist uh, as a first paper. So please stay tuned till then uh, till we begin the session formally. I request again uh, for the participants who have not joined using their paper ID to re-log into the session uh, using their paper ID and then log in back. So whenever you are typing your name, please mention the paper ID along with your name and then join back so that it would be easier for us to monitor the session. I see Vandana Sardar and, and Suman Day have not been logged in using that paper ID so that it becomes difficult for us to manage the session. I would request Vandana Sardar to log in using their paper ID. Ma'am, while you are logging in, please mention your paper ID along with your name and try to log in so that it becomes easier for us to manage the session. Yes, sir, I am able to hear you. Yeah. Okay. Sure, sure, sir. Then probably, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, I will join that session. Uh, so, yeah, so, sure, sure, sir. I have joined via phone. Yes, yes, I have joined via phone. I will connect back there. No issues. And I just mentioned the paper, yeah, paper ID who have joined with an S and I have uh, informed others to also re login. Okay, sir. Sure, sure. I have still connected there, uh, so that should not be a problem. I am still connected to that bridge. I will drop from here. <laughs> sure, sure, sir. I'll I'll manage. So I'll be on mute. I will manage it there. Then.
Hello, Jangam Shetty sir. Uh, can you hear us? Uh, we have made you the panelist. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, so we would be starting the uh, TS1 in a while. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You are able to hear me? Yes, yes, sir. Very clear. Yeah. Yeah. Do I have to put on my video? Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. We are, yeah, we are also able to see the video feed. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, this is a notification to all the participants who would be presenting their paper in the track uh, TS1. So I've just uh, pasted the paper ID in the chat window. So I request all the participants in track one to join using their paper ID so that it be, uh, becomes easier for us to monitor and manage the session. I see paper ID 178, 270, only join. So uh, other participants who are still on the bridge, I request you to re-login and issue the paper ID as the first entry along with your name and then join back again. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir, I can hear you, sir. Yeah, is Please. this Advait speaking or I? Uh, this is Chengappa here, sir. So can we start? With Hold on, Advait. So I have not received any notification from paper ID 89, 151, 300, and 317. So paper ID 89, if you are still on the bridge, I am not able to see your paper ID.
Uh, so we already have wait, uh, uh, waited for a couple of minutes past 11. Uh, so I think we would be get starting uh, with the session today. Uh, so we would be starting with uh, paper ID 178. Uh, and then like we would be uh, coming back to paper ID 89 and 151. Uh, so with this, I request Advait to formally introduce uh, the track chair, Dr. Jangam Suresh Shetty, um, and then uh, formally get started with this uh, session. So Advait, over to you. Yes, sir. So good morning, all of you. Uh, first of all, I would request all the participants to re-login. Whoever has not re-login with their paper ID to re-login with their paper ID. So first of all, I would like to welcome our track chair, Dr. Suresh Jagamshetty. He is a senior ICPLE and professor in the Department of Tripoli in the Sveshwara Engineering College, Bagalkot. He has 30 years of teaching and research experience. He had obtained his his MTech in power systems and PhD in wind energy from IIT Karakpur. His expertise are in solar and wind energy system design, power system and energy con con conservation. He has gained four PhD, 45 plus UG and 35 plus PG projects, and has also two pending patents. He has received around 93 plus lakh R&D grants and as well as has got 75 plus technical publications. He has established R&D infrastructure in CADA for distribution, auto automation, and renewable energy. He has organized around 38 faculty of student development programs and attended 52 programs and delivered more than 120 plus invited talks. He is a Fulbright alumni, received Fulbright Nehru Visiting Lecture Fellowship. Uh, then he, he is also a fellow member of I, IEI and member of Karnataka State Council of Electrical Division, LMS, LMISPE, LMISWE, and, uh, and he is also a Rotary member. So, would you like to give a short note, sir? Yeah, I think so. Already the instructions to the participants are given related to the timings and all. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, I, I congratulate all the authors and I welcome uh, each of them. Uh, we can start with uh, the paper ID, whichever is present, sir. Okay. So, yeah. so Advait, uh, let's go ahead with the 151. Uh, you can promote Shilpa GN. Uh, I am I am coordinating with paper ID 89, 300 and uh, 317 in the WhatsApp group. We get back to you. Okay. Yeah. Shilpajian, I have made you the presenter. Can you please try presenting? Okay. Yes, hello. Can you try presenting? Yes. yes, you can. Yes, Can I start, sir? Yes, ma'am. Please, please go ahead. Yeah. Yes, sir. Very good morning. Uh, good morning to all the distinguished present for uh, today's IEEE 2020 conference. Uh, myself, uh, Shilpa, Assistant uh, Professor, Department of uh, Electrical and Electronics Engineering, Sri Siddhartha Institute of Technology, Tokyo. So, my paper ID is 151, titled Electrical Load Forecasting Using Time Series Analysis. The co-author of this paper is Dr. G. S. Sheshabri, Professor, Department of Electrical and Electronics Engineering, Tumku. We are from Sri Siddhartha Academy of Higher Education, Agal Kute, Tumku, and our research center is at 
Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering, SSIT Kolkata. So this paper mainly presents electrical load forecasting analysis and uh, forecasted results based on the identification of stochastic time series models for short term. Three predictive models, namely auto regressive moving average, auto regressive integrated moving average, and auto regressive integrated moving average model with heterogeneous variables are proposed. The mean absolute percentage error of these uh, models are computed and compared. The forecasting results show that ARIMA and ARIMAX model performance is better NGR, thereby improving the forecasting accuracy significantly compared to ARMA model. Further, it is shown that ARIMAX model is slightly outperforming ARIMA model. The proposed methodology has been applied on Karnataka State Demand 2019 for short-term electrical demand prediction. This approach of time series modeling can accurately predict the practical Power system hourly demand considering into account public holidays, weekdays, and weekends. So, this term load forecasting refers to projected load requirements determined using systematic process of defining future loads in sufficient quantitative detail to permit important system expansion decisions to make in power systems. Load forecasting has always been an essential part of an efficient power system planning economic and secure operation of modern power systems. Demand forecasts are used to determine the capacity of generation, transmission, and distribution system additions. Low forecasts are also used to establish procurement policies for construction capital and for sound operation of the power systems. So these are mainly classified into long-term forecasting, which is 20 years ahead, medium-term forecasting, few months to five years ahead, Short-term forecasting few hours to few weeks ahead, and very short-term forecasting few minutes to an hour ahead. So this paper is based on short-term forecasting, which is few hours to few weeks ahead, and has its application in economic scheduling of generating capacity, security analysis, and maybe short-term maintenance scheduling, etc. So there are very many widely used. Uh, there are many techniques, but widely used techniques for short-term forecasting. Uh, is in uh, time series analysis and uh, artificial intelligence based techniques. Among these uh, various time series methods, most often uh, used uh, methodologies are the auto regressive moving average, ARIMA, and ARIMAX process. These time series models are implemented by employing different operations with a low data so as to form stationary time series. The preliminary order of the proposed uh, models can identified and confirmed with the aid of autocorrelation functions and partial autocorrelation function plots. Further, weighted least square method is applied to estimate the model parameters, and once these model parameters and model models are identified, these models can be used to accurately forecast the future loads. So numerical study results and discussions in this paper. Time series modeling for short term load forecasting is carried out by statistically studying the load behavior of Karnataka state demand in 2019. As a part of this study, I have taken September 2019 demand data to build a model for short term load forecasting and future loads are predicted for October 2019. The load curves indicated the load variations on weekdays and weekends, and it, could, and it was observed that power consumption was more during weekdays compared to weekends and it was differentiated. Weekdays and weekends were differentiated and also it was observed that weekends and public holiday curves had the same patterns and hence public holidays were differentiated from weekdays. The computational and programming work has been carried out using MATLAB software package which is more suitable for time series analysis. The time series model identification and forecasting process is mainly divided into three phases, including system modeling, parameter estimation, and forecasting phase. So, study analysis. The first graph here, the load for, uh, pattern of uh, first week, September 2019, as we can see the model, we can see the plot of uh, a weekend and a public holiday which is uh, most similar. Second plot also, 10th September, it was a public holiday. Uh, load pattern of uh, weekend and uh, public holiday. Uh, 
it was uh, ganesh chaturthi and mohan uh, on the 1st september and uh, 10th of september so we can have public holiday look patterns are the same the third uh, graph uh, it is showing the plot of uh, weekdays and uh, weekends weekday and the weekend uh, pattern is uh, varying hence uh, weekends should be separated from weekdays so this was the study analysis and uh, the numerical study results the first table gives the comparison of all the three models developed auto regressive moving average auto regressive integrated moving average and auto regressive integrated moving average uh, model with exogenous uh, variables first model in arma model uh, the mean absolute percentage uh, error is uh, computed as 17.7% uh, by integrating and making the load uh, stationary uh, the mean absolute percentage error is further reduced to 4% and by adding the exogenous uh, variables to erima model that is the uh, weekdays weekends and the uh, public holidays the mean absolute percentage is further reduced to 3.6% the table gives the comparison of uh, weekly results using arimax uh, model this is for uh, the first week second week third week and uh, fourth week uh, the mean absolute percentage for first week is uh, Computed as 3.5 percent. Second week is 4 percent. Third week is 2 percent. Fourth week is 4.9 percent using the Arimax model, which is for weekdays, weekends, and public holidays. So these are the uh, forecasted uh, results. First graph is the actual load versus uh, forecasted load of uh, first week October 2019. Similarly, second week, third week, and fourth week is uh, presented in the table. Um, First week error is 3.5 percent. Second graph is indicated. Arima and Arima model comparison monthly plot uh, comparison between Arima and Arima model. The third plot is uh, showing the comparison of all the three models with the actual load. Arima, Arima, and Arima model for a particular day that is 4th October 2019. So in this uh, proposed uh, work, using uh, time series analysis, the electrical loads are forecasted for uh, short term by considering the correlation factors to the selected demand data. Karnataka State 2019 demand data is analyzed for forecasting the future loads for short term. ARMA, ARIMA and ARIMAX models are developed and forecasting errors are computed. ARMA has forecasting error of 17.7% while that of uh, ERIMA model is 4% uh, and the ERIMAX model is 3.6%. Comparing the magnitude of these errors of various models, it is just that ERIMAX model forecasting efficiency is slightly better compared to ERIMA model. Also, the analysis carried out suggests that the forecasting performance can be improved by adding exogenous variables like uh, weekdays, weekends, and public holidays, along with the load data and time as input to the ERIMA model. Since the load is not stationary, ARMA model has shown a bit uh, more error compared to ERIMA and ERIMAX model, in which a load is being made stationary by differencing. Since the load provides dynamic in nature with temporal, seasonal, and annual variations, the accuracy of load forecasting can be further improved by considering the weather variables like uh, wind, temperature, rainfall, etc. So I have referred to IEEE transaction on uh, power uh, systems. These are the list of uh, papers I have referred for short term load forecasting using the uh, time series analysis. Uh, we the authors, so Shilpa and Dr. G. S. Uh, Sheshadri sir, we thank uh, all the organizers of this uh, conference and uh, <coughs> the signatories of the um, uh, IEEE conference uh, panel. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah very good, uh, uh, Shilpa, madam. Thank uh, you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Sir, would you like to ask me a question? Thank you so much, sir. Hello. 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 Yeah. 
Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Should we go with the next one? Yeah, I think so. I just wanted to make uh, one. Yes, sir. We can hear you. Please go ahead. Um, I believe there are some bandwidth issues at your end. Is able to hear me. Yes, yes. Now I am able to. Uh, we can uh, hear you. Uh, probably, uh, I suggest uh, to turn off the video while you are speaking uh, to to reserve the bandwidth. Yeah, that should be fine. Yeah, please go ahead, sir. Uh, in a short term load forecasting of uh, actual data, actual uh, load demand of a, a place or some, a case study of a place, something like that, uh, would have been uh, really uh, good for this. Otherwise, uh, good efforts and uh, very well presented within time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. Thank okay. Sir, I'm considering the load data also. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that's right. The title what I wanted was the short term load forecasting instead of load forecasting. Fine. Is it part of research work or is it a general study? Actually, it is a part of a research work. Sir. And then it should be more critical. It, is, uh, it should be more critical. Uh, title should be more yes, critical. Fine. Okay. okay. Thank you. Sir, we'll go with the next speaker. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So next we will go with paper ID 224, Ramesh. Ramesh, I have made you present there. Hello, good morning to everyone. I hope my voice is audible to all. Yes, yes. yes. I will share my presentation, sir, now. Yes. I hope my slides are visible to all. Yes, yes, we can start. So, shall I start, sir? Yes, yes, yes please. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, myself, uh, Dr. Ramesh Jirga, uh, Associate Professor, uh, Department of Me Mechanical Engineering, uh, Dr. VP, uh, PG Harakati College of Engineering and Technology, Vijapur, Karnataka. It gives me an immense pleasure to present a topic on performance and emission characteristics of ethanol fueled transportation engine. My paper ID is 224 under the track of affordable and clean energy. And this paper is co authored by Professor Sunil Kumar Biradar and uh, uh, my student Umer. So these are the contents. These are the contents I am going to present throughout my talk. As uh, you all know, uh, ever incre increasing energy demand and the cost of importing crude oil. Uh, one has to go for an alternative transportation fuels. But uh, looking at the uh, scenario of uh, Bijapur district, uh, it is uh, majorly uh, in Bijapur district, uh, the sugarcane industries are more, that is uh, sugar industries, and many farmers are growing uh, sugarcane as a main uh, product. So that's the reason uh, ethanol is one of the byproducts from the sugarcane industry. So we have chosen this uh, topic for the research. So ethanol is one of the clean and renewable fuel that can be produced from the most of bio sources, majorly a grain straw or sugarcane and a brown seeded. And ethanol is best suitable alternative fuel for spark ignition engine because of its fuel properties, which are similarly matching to the gasoline, uh, like octane number and uh, other parameters. So usage of ethanol in an engine reduces carbon-based emissions, especially carbon monoxide, unburnt hydrocarbons, and ethanol is a carbon neutral fuel because whatever the carbon emissions are produced due to the burning of ethanol, the same carbon is again reconsumed by the plants. So we can say ethanol is somewhere a carbon neutral fuel. 
so many research works are performed on the usage of ethanol in stationary engines but usage of ethanol on real uh, transportation engines are scanty that's the reason in our bld engineering college uh, we have done the research work on utilization of ethanol on real road conditions therefore in this paper i am going to present the performance and emission characteristics of e20 that is 20% ethanol by volume and 80% gasoline so i have chosen e20 because uh, in the literature many of the author suggested till e20 there is no much modifications required for the existing engine infrastructure so i have chosen e20 for the uh, testing so i have given the comparative results of e20 and the gasoline so if you uh, see the uh, properties of uh, gasoline and ethanol uh, we have a high octane number of ethanol which is around 108.6 as compared to gasoline so which makes it more suitable for spark ignition engine instead of uh, compression ignition engine so that's the reason we have chosen ethanol and uh, if you see the properties of a car what we have used for the engine testing it is a tata nano car we have used which can produce a maximum power of 37 bhp at 5500 rpm and torque of around 51 newton meter at 4000 rpm which has a four gears and two cylinders and the total weight of the vehicle is around 600 kg so uh, we have done this testing on this particular uh, tata nano vehicle which is shown in the figure the tests are conducted on a road as per indian driving cycles the performance parameters such as a fuel consumption and the exhaust temperature were recorded ethanol and gasoline are blended on volume basis so e20 blend was prepared by the addition of 20% ethanol and 80% gasoline by the volume and this ethanol uh, is supplied by uh, us from the nearby sugarcane industry that is galgali sugar private industry they have supplied us for for educational purpose and so that ethanol we have used for the engine testing and the fuel consumption was estimated by filling an empty car tank by a 500 ml of sample fuel and the distance traveled by the car was recorded instantly and the same thing was recorded in order to estimate the fuel consumption the emission characteristics were recorded using the avl made uh, exhaust gas emission analyzer where we can get the value for carbon dioxide carbon monoxide hydrocarbons etc and if you look at the results and discussion the performance parameters such as a fuel consumption is shown in the figure if you look at the figure Uh, the fuel consumption decreased from around 50.1 gram per kilometer with gasoline to 47.6 gram per kilometer with the e20 and this is because of the presence of oxygen element in the fuel of fuel that is ethanol itself enhances the combustion uh, reactions so that's the reason the fuel consumption is decreased and about 5% re reduction in fuel consumption was observed in case of e20 as compared to gasoline similar way the energy consumption also we can compare and around 6% energy consumption was decreased by the utilization of e20 in the engine instead of gasoline but if you look at the exhaust temperatures so this exhaust temperature is measured by a k type of thermocouple which is fitted in the exhaust probe of the engine so exhaust temperature is high in case of e20 as compared to gasoline because of high combustion temperature and pressure so now uh, looking at the emission characteristics so ultimate uh, this emission characteristics are measured by using avl digas analyzer if you see these plots the carbon monoxide emission decreased from 3.4% to around 2.1% with e20 this is because of better oxidation of the ethanol fuel as compared to gasoline and this better oxidation uh, leads to increase slight increase in the carbon dioxide emission so that's the reason co2 emission increased from 7% with gasoline to 8% with the e20 similar way this below graph shows the variation of hydrocarbon emission 
as well as NOx emission. If you look at the hydrocarbon emission, the hydrocarbon emission decreased from 120 ppm with the gasoline to 80 ppm with E20. This is because of high in cylinder pressure and temperature, the whatever the unburnt carbon mo molecules, they are going to oxidize into CO2. That's the reason the HC contents will decrease. So as the NOx emission increased from 410 ppm with gasoline, and 489 ppm with E20. This is because of high in cylinder pressure and high in cylinder temperature leads to the increased combustion efficiency. So that leads to increased NOx emission. That increment of NOx emission is not desirable. It is slight variation, slight increment. And we have uh, we have also tested the cost variations. So. The ethanol, what we have purchased from the industry, which costs us only 40 rupees per liter, whereas this gasoline costs us around 84 rupees per liter. And if you compare the running cost, that is rupees per kilometer, we can say the running cost decreased from 3.8 rupees, rupees per kilometer with gasoline to 3.3 rupees per kilometer with E20. We can save around 50 paisa per kilometer if we run the engine with E20. And if we try the engine with 100% ethanol, we can reduce this running cost to around 2.5 rupees per kilometer. And that test we have not done, but this is a prediction that it can further, we can reduce the running cost if we are going with the increased percentage of ethanol. Therefore, I can suggest ethanol fueled engines are economically viable options. So based on this, I can conclude uh, the fuel consumption decreased from 50.1 gram per kilometer with the gasoline to 47.6 gram per kilometer with E20. We can save about 5% fuel when we are using E20 and we can reduce the CO and FC emission about 3.4% and 120 ppm to 2.1% and 80 ppm using E20. And obviously, a slight increase in CO2 from 7% to 8% by switching the operation from gasoline to E20. And the NOx emissions are increased slightly from 410 ppm to 489 ppm. But still, these values are under the BS6 limits and the running cost decreased from 3.8 rupees per kilometer with gasoline to 3.3 rupees per kilometer with E20. And I can say it can be further reduced to 2.5 rupees per kilometer if the car is operated by 100% ethanol. Therefore, the ethanol fueled engines are economically viable options as they are carbon neutral. And according to Niti Aayog's suggestion, and we can go for high percentage of usage of ethanol in case of uh, gasoline. So these are the different papers I have referred for this particular work. And uh, thank you once again. Thank you all. If you have any doubts, you can ask me, sir. Yeah, uh, very good presentation, uh, Dr. Ramesh. Thank you, sir. Yeah, uh, I suppose is this part of a research or it is a general study? Sir, this is the beginning part of my research. I have started this research using uh, my team of uh, UG students. Yeah, that's excellent. Yes, sir. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, nowadays this uh, changing from regular fuels to alternate fuels is going on in a big way. Yes, sir. Uh, with your uh, mechanical background, definitely uh, a good initiation with uh, with your students. Yes, sir. Uh, what What was the one concern for me was, uh, you have very well concluded with all the facts uh, yes. by testing it on actual vehicle also. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, my curious question is why still this uh, <coughs> ethanol is not coming in a big way and uh, why you are using the word gasoline because petrol and diesel are very popular with us. Yes, sir. Uh, because pet gasoline would become a pure, uh, better uh, form of petrol and diesel. Yes, sir. <laughs> Just a curious question. 
Yeah, uh, I have used uh, gasoline because uh, we have used 100% gasoline, sir. The, whatever the petrol present now, which is, which is available in the market, which is already blended with the 5 to 8% of ethanol. So that's the reason I have used the gasoline word, sir, because it is 100% ethanol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good initiation. Uh, this you have tested on the roads also. That's what you mentioned with cost comparison. Yes, sir. And uh, very good work. Uh, I'm sure uh, students may have enjoyed with uh, working. Yes, with sir. That. Actually, uh, still uh, students wanted to do some testing because <laughs> of COVID-19, we are not able to uh, yeah, do further, more, further more testing, sir. It happens. Yeah. Yes, sir. Fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe one figure which would uh, say. Suppose say if there were some, uh, there are some 5,000 such vehicles in Bijapur, what yeah. would be the net saving for the, uh, I mean, the country's economy like that would add a greater value to the work, right? Definitely, sir. Definitely, yes, I will sir. add that statistical value, sir. Yeah. Wonderful. Yes, sir. Thank you so yes, much, sir. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. Sir. Thank you, sir. We can go for next project. So, next we have paper ID 89, SM Bagi. I have made you present it. Hello. Uh, yes, sir. Chengapa, sir. Good morning, sir. Very good morning, Chengapa. sir. One minute, madam. One minute. Yes, sir. Please, sir. Go ahead. Chengapa, sir, one announcement you can make. There are also other attendees. If they have any right. questions, they can type in the chat box. Sure, definitely. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, they would have heard you. So uh, I request uh, the should, other panelists and also the. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure, sir. When they type the question, they should mention the paper ID. Definitely. Yeah. We'll do that, sir. So again, uh, to notify all the panelists and presenters, uh, if you have any interesting questions to our authors, please feel free to uh, type in your questions. We would be taking uh, in the Q&A session at the end of the present, each presentation. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am, you can go ahead. Uh, good morning, sir. Sir, am I audible? Yeah. Yes, yes, ma'am. Please, please, Hi, yeah. Sir, myself, S.M. Baghi from uh, BLD Engineering College, Tripoli Department. So, it's my immense pleasure to present uh, this paper. So, it's a general study, sir. Uh, the power quality improvement using the shunt active power filter for grid connected photovoltaic generation system. So, these are the contents as I'm going to discuss now. Introduction, block diagram, uh, its filter topology, simulated main circuits, its results, conclusion, references. Okay, uh, the power quality plays an important role uh, in grid-connected PV system. The use of grid-connected PV system has become popular now. A uh, large number of grid-connected PV system connect in distribution networks uh, through PV inverters, uh, which are potentially able to cause some harmonic problems. So, uh, these, uh, so in the proposed system, the inverter operates as a shunt active filter. So, now I'm mainly I'm concentrating on the shunt active filter compared with series active, uh, which works in multifunctional ways and it delivers power from source to load grid and helps in uh, power quality improvement. Uh, to solve the power quality issues, non-linear technique based on synchronous reference frame, a PI controller is used in three-phase inverter. The overall system is analyzed by applying unbalanced non-linear loads uh, and different conditions before and after compensation and checked in MATLAB and Simulink environment. So this is the block diagram. So here uh, it's consisting of grid connected PV system, consists of solar panel, uh, which is uh, connected to inverter through boost converter, MPPT technique is there, incremental, uh, uh, the technique we are uh, using here. And three phase current control inverter, which acts as shunt active filter, and which is connected to grid. So uh, here, uh, this three phase actor shunt active filter works in multifunctional ways, which index power from source to grid, and in turn helps in power quality improvement. And whatever the controller we are using, this is the circuit diagram. And uh, this is the main circuit diagram. The same block diagram is drawn in terms of circuit diagram. PV panel, boost converter, inverter, and connected to grid, different loads. So these are the different power topologies. Uh, based on different power topologies, it's classified as uh, voltage source based on converters, 
current source based on topology series and shunt active filter and based on phases 2 wire and 3 wire so here i'm concentrating on uh, shunt active filter over series active and series active if you, if you consider the series active series active injects the voltage component in series with supply voltage and therefore it can uh, uh, regarded as uh, controlled voltage source compensating voltage lag so here i'm concentrating on shunt active filter so shunt active filter compensate load harmonics by injecting equal and opposite harmonic components which compensate the current uh, in case of shunt active filter operates as a current injecting harmonic components generated by the load and this is the main control scheme this is the control scheme so uh, in this control scheme uh, the synchronous reference frame theory is implemented for the reference of current generation and this control technique is based on coordinate transformation which separates harmonic components from load current and pr controller is used over here in three phase inverter which helps in reducing current harmonics voltage fluctuations and all so this is the main simulated main circuits this is the pv model the amplifier technique as what uh, i am using here that is incremental conductance here the sensor parameters are both voltage and current so incremental conductance we are using here as compared to perturb observer and all and that is kind of boost converter and one thing here in pv in pv module uh, here we are generating total power output of 20 kilowatt that is number of pv panels 100 numbers and each panel capacity of 200 watts and cell per module 54 9 into 6 so whatever output you are getting from pv panel that is given to boost converter and uh, here um, the voltage we are getting uh, from boost converter uh, nearly around uh, 430 volt and for boost of 430 volt that is given to inverter uh, from inverter actually uh, here you are near nearly around 16 kilowatt i am getting as per uh, simulated circuit trial and error nearly 16 kilowatt Uh, these are the outputs pv outputs and the voltage and current uh, the total output total volt uh, sorry total power nearly 20 kW so voltage 242.4 volt sorry 242.4 volts and output current is 82.2 amperes and the boost converter output nearly 430 volt and these are the and mainly i'm concentrating on uh, harmonic distortion before and after compensation this is uh, source current uh, before it was uh, 10.08 and after compensating 2.66 and this is the load current so load current harmonics so here after before it was 23.40 so after using the shunt active filter it is reduced to 4.66 as per ITP standards so tsd value should be less than 5% so this is the conclusion the important shunt active power filter for photovoltaic generation system is analyzed and which avoids the use of passive filters that could affect the performance of compensation system so use of this filter helps in reducing and reducing the current harmonics introduced by non linear loads and which in turn helps in improving the power factor at pcc so the thd of source current is below 5% as per condition the harmonics limit is imposed by atpl standards so these are the reference and this first paper almost all i have referred this first paper remaining uh, few uh, concepts i have referred others but main paper is multifunctional power flow controller for photovoltaic generation system this is general study Uh, regarding uh, active filters thank you sir yeah uh, uh some good work uh, initiated here yes, i should put it in a, uh, i don't know if there are any other questions i'll be discussing uh, i request changappa sir if there are other questions you can always stop me yes sir actually my yeah, my yeah. research will be on renewable only sir sure sure that's what uh, what i observed where uh, what is with regard to application now what was the total capacity of the power plant uh, which you studied here sir here 20 so, kilowatt nearly regarding 20 kilowatt okay now uh, is there any uh, limitation for this like uh, can you can you do this for uh, even say 2 or 5 kilowatt power yes, plant sir, sir in this simulic we can sir and trial and error yeah. i'm doing no uh, usually what happens is uh, did you take any practical system data or it was no, again not a, no, no, uh, not see, there is one power plant on your rooftop of your college okay okay sir there is a hybrid system and i okay, suppose sir. you are also working there only yeah sir yeah sir then you could have very well used that data 
and okay. test it use that actual data yes, then your yes, works sir. become more practical i don't know okay. why you are not used yes, sir. in file you sir my future phd will be <laughs> no no oh, whatever you do in future but see, for this paper at yes, least sir, i will use the definitely you must use the... thing, uh, i wanted to tell sir in 2008 you have used you taught us to do the so sir no no that is secondary time. that we will not discuss only i am worried about this paper because these papers become more stronger with okay, practical data yes sir simulation is fine very good we do but if this same uh, thing was uh, tested for the actual system and yes, also sir. get your actual results will be with. that's what i wanted to mention yes sir right? i will sir. i will otherwise sir. good efforts you have put in i appreciate it yes sir thank you so much sir i'll uh, any other questions if they are there by other uh, participants or panelists or even chengappa sir also can ask from my side it is over sir yeah thank you sir um, i think we don't have any questions uh, at least on the panelists or the participants thank you so much uh, for giving opportunity sir to present this yeah. paper over here very good yeah thank you madam so uh, sir we will go to next i think uh, advait has already uh, promoted the paper id uh, 270 uh, sir we can see you we can see you on the video feed uh, you can start Yeah, you can start presenting from your side. Yes, yes, you are okay. Uh, I I have to change. I have to change that virtual background, right? So is it must like? Uh, uh, no. No, at this moment it will take time again. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You can go ahead. You can probably turn off your video feed and then start presenting your slides. That should be fine. Okay. Please bring yeah, up okay. the slides. Yeah. So share. Also, uh, are you able to see my slides, sir? Yes, 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 yes. yes. Uh, okay, okay. So uh, the, uh, today, um, uh, the topic for this uh, day would be fragile uh, energy storage. Uh, so uh, could you please go to slideshow mode, sir? Sorry to interrupt. Oh yeah, no uh, problem, sir. Um, yeah, slideshow. Yes, yeah. sir. View. Wait. Okay. One minute. ंग no no on the top there is something that is coming in that is disturbing me like uh, no, you wait for some time it will go away or okay. there is an arrow you can click that okay sir okay sir one, one, one more time i'll try yeah uh, every time you press the slide show no that arrow yeah. Comes. Uh, yeah yeah that one uh, box uh, comes uh, click uh, that arrow it will go away okay 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 no yeah then press that yes yes sir thank you sir thanks a lot uh, slide show Okay, sir. And now, uh, is it visible, sir? Yes, yes. Please, please, my dear. Okay. Uh, so my um, topic uh, for the paper is flywheel energy storage to AGC of two area power system, and my paper ID is two seventy. So my co-author is an associate professor at CMR Institute of Technology, Bangalore. and i am an assistant to professor presently serving at cmr institute of technology so essentially your name is zahid or zahid zahid sir yeah yeah zahid, okay zahid, zahid my name is zahid so uh, the flywheel energy storage system uh, as you can see is an inertia based system which has been utilized over the years it has been the oldest technology in use for the conservation of energy here in uh, we have the time constants associated this is the block diagram of the flywheel energy storage system wherein we can see there is a reference power so the flywheel en uh, energy storage system we uh, have utilizing is of a heavy capacity it's around 20 megawatts and uh, we are incorporating it to a wind penetrated two area power system so the conventional two area power system uh, is uh, a 75 megawatt system and all the values which uh, ever we have considered here we have converted those values into per unit system 
we are trying to introduce this flywheel energy storage system uh, uh, to the wind penetrated two area power system. So the main aim uh, in this particular study is to uh, see that when there is a load outage caused due to some disturbance, which is represented here by a step load disturbance. Uh, so the flywheel has to store the energy in event of an load outage and release this energy, uh, sorry, release this energy in event of a load outage. And when there is a load surplus, so flywheel will be storing the energy. So the process, the methodology that we have adopted uh, is coming in the next slide. So this is essentially the power uh, conditioning system for uh, flywheel energy storage system. So here we are seeing from the mouth, this is the electric utility system, this is the AC, AC. And here we have used this converter system wherein we have an AC DC converter. Then uh, this is uh, the DC DC two quadrant chopper. This uh, mechanism is uh, used. And uh, th these are the reference current calculations and uh, power calculations such that uh, in event of uh, 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 load outage, what happens is the current direction gets uh, reversed and uh, it supplies back to the system and in the event of a load surplus the energy is stored inside the flywheel so how this is done the methodology is that the dc dc converter as you saw the dc dc converter in the previous slide slide number two here over here this uh, is uh, based upon a two quadrant chopper and there is the variation of the duty ratio so there is the duty ratio of the chopper which can be varied from uh, zero to one so in an event of the duty ratio here, I have given this formula 2D minus 1. In case of D is equal to 0.5, so the, due, the total duty ratio would be equal to 0. So there it will remain in a standby mode. So whenever your duty ratio is greater than 0.5, for example, it is 0.6. So it would be 1.2 minus 1.2. At that time, it will start discharging. It will give the supply back to the system. And at the time when the duty ratio is less than 0.5, for example, 2 into 0.4. So you can see here 0.8 minus 1, it would be minus 0.2. So at this time, it starts to charge. So this variation multiplied by the voltage of this uh, FEESS, which is uh, represented in terms of inertia and other uh, constants, because this is an electric, magnetic, and mechanical system which governs the response of the system, whether it charges or discharges. So what was the objective and how it was possible to introduce this? So the main objective is there in occurrence of a load disturbance, it has to reduce the uneven, uneven profiles and frequency and type power deviations and uh, to store the excess energy and to release uh, the energy in case of a load outage. And uh, one more uh, important thing is that uh, the transients or the peak over shoots resulting due to the disturbance are less oscillatory with incorporation of this flywheel and it makes the system more stable. Now this type of system would be very much welcomed in uh, places which are uh, uh, loosely connected with grid or we can say weak grid connections. Weak grid connection would mean it would have lesser number of tie lines. And uh, like in our area, like Ladakh in the Kashmir Valley, and even in the certain portions of the world, like Australian deserts. So this would be very much helpful. So uh, what I'm doing is that I'm uh, introducing a load disturbance profile here. You can see this is 0 0.01 per unit. And uh, now uh, to incorporate the flywheel energy storage system, because we can see there are different time constants. Power system has a different con time constant now the wind uh, dfig based wind plant which we have incorporated has a different constant time constant now the amalgamation of this flywheel energy storage system isn't possible without making it to follow some reference uh, system so what we are trying to do is we will tune it with ref with the reference to a model uh, system that is representing a first order model here we can see and make sure that the variables, that is your proportional and integral variables, are tracking the system. Here we have given some system frequency and we have used integral square error criteria, such that my reference power command is following my actual power command. Once this tracking phenomena happens, our flywheel is good to be integrated with the wind penetrated to area power system. Now uh, coming to the results, when uh, we have uh, 
put the flywheel energy storage uh, with the wind penetrated two area power system. You can see with the, the disturbance which we are seeing usually with the uh, normal uh, without flywheel uh, is represented by the purple li line and uh, with the flywheel is represented by the red line over here and uh, the system is also becoming less uh, more stable and less oscillatory. Similarly, this is for area one frequency deviation. Same thing for area two frequency deviation. The third thing is for the type power deviation. As you can see over here, the same thing. Uh, it is becoming uh, it is becoming more stable, less oscillatory. And um, there is a table present over here, which is showing the comparative analysis. Like uh, peak frequency deviation in case without flywheel, it is 140 with FAS is 10. So in the area one, the percentage reduction is 93.24. Similarly, if you can go for the area two, it is 92.59, whereas the peak uh, type of our deviation is 60%. So the main objective and the discussion on incorporating FESs will be, it will, uh, the advantage for it would be to, it will uh, allow to load for more thermal limits. You can load power system and uh, moreover, it is helping in uh, energy storage uh, applications and it is helping for lesser fluctuations and mitigations in power and also helps to supply the excess power during heavy loads. The conclusion is like a much better strategy. Herein we have not uh, uh, gone for the flywheel uh, uh, energy, the, iner the inertia present within it. So the peak inertia, what it, uh, uh, what it can store or the it should the flywheel should not deeply um, like overcharge the system or flywheel should not deeply discharge the system so what uh, we thought that a much better strategy would be to use uh, adaptive generalized predictive control such that we can touch the limits upper limits for example we have an upper limit of 100 megawatt sorry 5 megawatts and lower limit of 2 megawatts for uh, uh, the uh, the charging for overcharging if it goes beyond 5 so it overcharges now if we are touching to the 5 megawatt limit on the upper side and touching to the 2 megawatt limit on the downside so what we find is that we are doing an optimum use of the flywheel energy which is present within it by, by this technique the management system is not able to incorporate the entire uh, flywheel energy the only thing which uh, we are uh, doing is uh, by varying the duty ratio and we have tuned the uh, flywheel but uh, to utilize it fully and better control st strategy would be an adaptive generalized predictive control or any other control strategy may be incorporated by other researchers which can be a SAMPA based or certain in my view I felt the adaptive generalized predictive control would be much better and this further incorporation of such systems with weak power system or micro grid can provide energy support. Such systems could be utilized in uh, Ladakh region as I already mentioned of J and K and Australia which have individual grids like called micro grids to give supply to few households because if there is a storm and uh, everything goes out of control by the time they repair it, we have some uh, energy storage via this mechanism. These are the references which uh, I have adopted for this case study. And uh, thank you. Any questions, please? Uh, uh, very good presentation, uh, Dr. Zahid. Thank you, sir. Uh, I just, uh, yes, sir. most of the power system studies go uh, on a simulation uh, basis. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Based on the model representation. So yes, sir. Right, uh, just out of curiosity, uh, I would just would like to know, have you ever had any chance to see a flywheel have have you ever have you ever, huh? have have you had any chance to visit a plant or yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah in, yes yes in kashmir we have a flywheel station near kangan so they yeah. have rotational energy mass so whenever the, uh, it is rotating at a very high speed what is the power rating there like storage uh, no, no, no. so so the, that uh, no no that plant is very um, like uh, that plant if i remember is uh, 20 megawatt so this uh -huh. flywheel, flywheel would be very less it yeah. is not that that huge uh, uh, megawatt, but but here what I did is by changing the inertia parameters, I can set that. 
uh and uh, by giving the reference command like uh, the pr value because what i am t- t- taking is I'm i understand a... see uh, let us not go more deeper into that yeah, yes yes a few curious questions because a lot of work goes on uh, uh-huh. yeah that. okay uh, kangan is there yes, uh, is, yes sir listen to my question fully yes sir okay then yes, you can yes. my curious only think i wanted to know whether you had any opportunity to no no i have been looking at a flywheel Okay. and suppose if you want to bring them in modern power stations where wind mm-hmm. and solar or anything is integrated mm-hmm. uh, in a grid or micro grid you mentioned what mm-hmm. would be the cost roughly for these flywheels based on their ratings any idea if it is there fine otherwise no issues mm, no no the, uh, see it uh, my phd study was like uh, with super capacitors and battery energy storage systems but as far as the flywheel is concerned because we cannot make a very small capacity flywheel so <laughs> it is That's what uh, i wanted to know uh, so the the thing is that ke, I, i have done this as a case study it's so not a no, critical study no so, there, there are yes. demands that okay. uh, many a times we have also discussed and had a discussion mm-hmm. that uh, can you store mm-hmm. energy in the flywheel and use it when required like that was going on so because if i initiate no, it, it will so be was, costly i just wanted uh, myself and also to the other members to know thank you jahid it was good uh, good initiation please thank continue the work okay thank you sir thanks a lot hello yes sir. thank you sir so the next we have paper id 290 i have made you present the paper id 290 pp yes good afternoon Yes. Uh, I'll present. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> Is my voice clear? Yes, it is clear. Can you hear? Yes. Yeah, Uh, good health greetings to all i'm preeti kagle working with prdc bengaluru i'm presently paper titled development and testing of iot based monitoring in both solar box hello sir hello hello sir hello sir hello ah you are you are audible please go ahead okay and we got to hear you please go ahead yeah thank you okay sir yeah uh, i'm preeti kagle working for prdc bengaluru Uh, i'm presenting paper titled development and testing of iot based monitoring interface for solar box cooper uh, and my co author is dr suresh chengam shetty sir hod triple e and uh, dean research at prakashwara engineering college kadal paper presents development and testing of iot based monitoring interface for solar box cooper a uh, key objective of developing the iot based monitoring system is to uh, ease the usage of solar box cooks which are at present unpopular and another objective is to eliminate the disadvantages that prevail in usage of solar box cooks some of the disadvantages with solar box cooks are longer cooking time day time cooking outdoor cooking manual monitoring of the cooking process and uh, heat loss during monitoring longer cooking time and day time cooking are due to device usage uh, since the cooking is outdoor ladies feel hesitant to monitor the cooking process manually which is considered as social ignorance also there is loss of heat due to frequent opening and closing of the solar cookers while cooking whether the food is cooked or not so other such issues and to popularize solar box cookers and attempt to create to develop uh, monitoring in advanced technology Basically, solar box cookers are located outdoors, and uh, it requires remote monitoring. The demand sophisticated system for automation of monitoring. So, Internet of Things (IoT) is one of such technology which interconnects sensors and uh, actuating devices so as to share information across different platforms through internet. Uh, that is used here. In addition. an android app is developed to provide easy and flexible way to access data from remotely located solar boxes 
preliminary data required to monitor cooking processes in our box cooker are the temperature inside box cooker and the food cooking time for different cooking items. Temperature data can be measured directly with the sensors and uh, to collect food cooking time, various tests have been done on a typical solar box cooker on a daily basis. Since solar intensity and hence box cooker temperature keeps on changing over a day, prediction of food cooking time becomes a difficult task. So a microwave oven uh, who's working with very similar to solar box cooker to collect cooking time data for a particular item at the cooking temperature. Uh, here figure three and uh, figure four shows uh, cooking time versus temperature graph for 50 grams and uh, 100 grams of vegetable. The data collected is analyzed and the mathematical model is developed to represent solar box cooking. The expression to determine change in cooking time is change in temperature is given by Delta T is equal to T2 minus T1 into K in the net. Uh, here, T2 minus T1 gives change in temperature, and uh, K is rate of change of temperature with respect to time. Sorry, uh, rate of change of time with respect to temperature. Uh, that is, change of cooking time with per degree change in temperature. Value of K is always negative because cooking process becomes faster with increase in temperature. With this expression, one can calculate uh, remaining cooking time for uh, particular right. This figure shows circuit diagram of monitor equipment for solar box. Uh, the entire setup has been designed with the PT100 and LM35 Arduino, LCD display, and a Wi Fi module with. The uh, interface with Android app. Here, PT100 and LM35 temperature and the solar box temperature and the uh, ambient temperature. A program has been written in Arduino to calculate cooking time for the selected item. Real time data of uh, ambient temperature, solar box temperature, and the uh, remaining cooking time of a particular item is displayed in LCD. And it is also communicated to Android at Wi Fi mobile ESP. The entire unit is powered by a solar panel with a battery pack. Uh, this figure shows flowchart for monitoring interface for solar box cooker. If the device is switched on, it will ask to select item and uh, quantity. Value of K will be specified. Uh, from the standard data table for the selected item and then initial value for the cooker temperature and the cooking time. Uh, in our device, temperature T1 is set to 100 degrees Celsius and the time T is to corresponding time. After a delay of 15 seconds, ambient temperature and uh, temperature inside box cooker are read from sensors and uh, Values will be displayed in LCD as well as in the app. Measured solar box cooker temperature is compared with the previous value. If there is change in temperature, uh, it will calculate the change of time in the corresponding remaining time. If there is no change in temperature, it's a delay of thing system that will calculate uh, remaining time for, for the selected food, quantity, food item and quantity. And then new value of temperature, that is measured value of temperature is assigned to T1, which becomes the previous value for the next cycle. This process will continue till the remaining time becomes zero. Once the remaining time becomes zero, a notification will be sent to the user, that is, uh, the food is ready to take. This is how the entire program inside Arduino works. Uh, this figure seven uh, shows the data displayed in Android app. Uh, here it is ambient temperature, cooker temperature, and uh, uh, remaining cooking time. Uh, once the food is cooked, it will also intimate that uh, your food is ready to take by sending notification. 
from this app, one can monitor the solar phosphorus sitting in his home. On the other hand, put in data of solar phosphorus bits and without monitoring unit are compared. Uh, this graph shows the comparison of putting time and for instant putting right. So from the graph, it is uh, observed that there is slight enhancement in the performance with respect to time. However, not much work is done in this paper. So to conclude, IoT-based monitoring interfaces successfully developed and implemented on a uh, 40.6 40 by 40.6 square centimeter box paper. Arduino Uno, ESP2 double six five module, and uh, Android app have been interfaced with solar box because it makes it not only smart but also user friendly. The Android app developed for smartphones not only monitors the put time but also indicates completion of the same process, the notification which is sent to the user, which makes it user friendly. The developed device has been tested on an actual solar box for at the professional engineering college partnership, Karnataka State, and uh, it is working fine. Technical reading is from Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, Dr. Changappa. Yes, sir. So uh, I do have one question for. Uh, it's also Madam. part of my work. So yes, if, yes. Are, if you have a question, you should ask me now. Sure. No, I just want to understand uh, from ma'am uh, that um, what was the most challenging part of this. Uh, uh, while developing the prototype that she had to face, and uh, how did she overcome it? Yeah, good question, sir. Riti. Okay, main thing is uh, uh, getting cooking time data is very difficult uh, because uh, box cooker temperature keeps on varying uh, for a particular temperature. What is the cooking time data? Uh, we cannot get. Uh, uh, deciding how much time it would take to cook. Is a very a difficult task here, yeah. and uh, so we have used a microwave oven where we can set the temperature and uh, uh, we can get the cooking time data and uh, cooking time. Question of uh, the viewers as well as our report. Hello. Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. Uh, Jangam Shetty, sir, uh, I think. Yeah, yeah, very good present from as a session chair. I will also. Any other questions from audience? I think there are no more questions. I guess we can go ahead with next one. Okay, sir. Thank you. So next one is uh, paper ID 178, <coughs> Ravindra. Am I audible? Yes, you're audible. I have made you present this. First, all the presenters to stay till the end. If all presentations complete, we will have a group photo session at the end. Uh, share content. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, I am sharing my screen. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, good afternoon, sir. I am Ravindra Kondoli. 
assistant professor bl engineering college bijapur i am uh, working yes, on we can hear you yeah please okay uh, i will be giving presentation on bismuth telluride thermoelectric generator uh, i am a research scholar at pto also my paper id is 178 track affordable and free energy uh, as we know energy can be Uh, cannot be created but it can be transferred from one form to another form like nuclear energy can be converted to mechanical energy uh, and mechanical energy can be converted to electrical energy using dynamo uh, but uh, my my study is conversion of the thermal energy to electrical energy that happens uh, by a principle seebeck effect seebeck effect and reverse uh, conversion of electrical energy to the thermal energy that is called as peltier effect we are using uh, seebeck effect we are converting thermal energy to electrical energy here uh, for our work and the application of thermoelectricity is at a large places like uh, we can cool using a refrigerator we can produce thermoelectric refrigerator means there will not be any compressor uh, Uh, thermoelectric materials can directly convert electricity to temperature difference and we can uh, using the thermoelectric uh, generator using the temperature difference of the exhaust gases of the automotive vehicle and the atmospheric temperature we can convert we can create electricity we can create electricity using uh, thermoelectric materials if we see a thermoelectric module a thermoelectric module it is made up of a thermoelectric material which are semiconductor basically semiconductors are good thermoelectric materials they will convert uh, uh, temperature difference into electricity there will be flow of electrons due to that electricity is produced actually thermoelectric module consist of a p and n type of semiconductors connected by a conductor and sandwiched in between ceramic substrate and uh, uh this is the literature that has been done uh, uh they have uh, using some equations uh, power produced by the thermoelectric uh, module has been calculated and uh, uh, some uh, in papers have been done uh, without calculate without uh, uh, using the uh, contact resistance and the objective of our study is to simulate a thermoelectric module commercially available bismuth telluride thermoelectric module in ansys and compare the results of the ansys with analytical result and to study the parameters like leg length temperature difference and number of thermoelectric modules on power produced by the thermoelectric module this is a commercially available thermoelectric module the figure which shown here this is a commercially available thermoelectric module and this is a model which has been done in ansys model that has been done and each these uh, th this thermoelectric module consists of these pairs 127 pn junctions this thermoelectric module consists of 127 pn junction which are connected electrically in series and thermally in parallel and we have resistance uh, we have applied load resistance uh, using uh, in uh, ansys load resistance has been applied across this so that uh, flow of uh, current uh, power produced can be calculated uh, uh, we have done mathematical modeling and we have calculated what is the power produced by the thermoelectric module we have used a simple calculation like uh, what is the heat supplied and heat rejected by that heat supplied minus heat rejected we have calculated power produced by the thermoelectric module using this equation this equation whatever q what is the heat supplied which heat supplied by this equation first one is seebeck heat second is joule heat third one is conduction heat and uh, by using this equation we have calculated power produced and uh we have modeled the same in ansys the same thermoelectric module which is available in the market that we have modeled in ansys and we have created 
uh, its analysis in ANSYS uh, CFX, uh, ANSYS Fluent. There we have got this uh, result, temperature profile of the thermoelectric module, and we have calculated power produced by the thermoelectric module. Here, by using this graph, by using this graph, we can see that power produced, we have compared the result from the ANSYS with analytical results. Here, we have seen that the pattern of the power producer initially increases as the load resistance increases and it reaches a peak here and further it has decreased. For the both analytical and ANSYS, this pattern is same. Uh, but there is a slight difference in the result of the analytical and ANSYS and maximum power produced by one thermoelectric module. One thermoelectric module, we have got around 15, uh, 12 watts for a temperature difference of 670 degrees Celsius. High temperature source is kept at a temperature, of, we have given a boundary condition for a source as 6, uh, 700, 600 degrees Celsius and the sink we have given a temperature of 30 degrees Celsius for that and we have varied the temperature also to study the uh, what is the effect of the temperature difference on the power produced by the thermoelectric module uh, and from this graph we uh, we got to know that as the temperature difference goes on increasing power produced by the thermoelectric module has increased that is one of the study we have done and we have also done uh, this study that is we have varied the leg length that is the pillar length of the thermoelectric module or the height uh, pillar length of the each of the P and N junctions we have varied it whatever that is available in the commercial thermoelectric module its pillar length was 1.5 mm we have varied it from 0.5 to 1.5 mm we got that as the pillar length or leg length is reduced power produced by the thermoelectric module has increased. Power produced by the thermoelectric module has increased. And we have also uh, used number of thermoelectric modules. We have modeled such that those thermoelectric modules are connected in series. If one thermoelectric module is there, we have plotted graph. Oh, we have plotted graph, what is the... Uh, uh, if one thermoelectric module is there, what is the power produced by one thermoelectric module? Uh, uh, this graph shows that uh, uh, power produced by one thermoelectric module. What is the power produced by one thermoelectric module, two thermoelectric module, three thermoelectric module, and eight thermoelectric module, which are connected in series. We have sh uh, we observed that. For one thermoelectric module, power produced is less. Further, for two, it has increased. But after four, it has not increased much. We have observed that it has decreased for eight for thermoelectric module again. Means uh, for every uh, temperature difference, there will be certain number of thermoelectric modules at which power produced will be maximum. That also we have observed here. And uh, from conclusion, we can observe that uh, it is observed that as load resistance increases, the power produced increases initially and later decreases. This indicates that when the load resistance is equal to the internal resistance, power produced is maximum. And it is also observed that as the leg length decreases, power produces by the thermoelectric module increases. And it is also observed that as the temperature difference decreases, power produced by the thermoelectric module decreases. And if thermoelectric modules are connected in series, that is for a temperature difference of uh, 6, 570 Kelvin, what has happened is initially till four thermoelectric module, the power producer has increased, but further it has not increased, but uh, rather it has decreased. These are the observations which we have done and these are the reference which we have taken for the uh, uh, study. Any uh, questions, sir? If, uh... Ravindra. Yes, sir? Uh, Ravindra, Kumar, Ravindra Kumar or Ravindra? Uh, Ravindra Kondogoli, sir. Ravindra uh, Kondogoli. 
yeah it's good uh, very nice presentation uh, you should be from mechanical department or uh, you are doing in i am from mechanical engineering yeah yes, sir quite naturally ah uh, yes, uh, i appreciate this uh, uh, tech i mean uh, technology that you are going to work but have you got access to the practical uh, this particular cell actual cell have you oh. brought it or purchased uh, i have purchased it sir the same yeah, okay. we are working experimental also how much, just how much does it cost uh it first is increasing we, we have purchased in january it was over 200 per thermal electric module now oh, it cost 4 400 uh, rupees sir <laughs> okay yeah just for your information it's a part of your research work you said uh, uh, the yes sir uh, yes, what sir. you are doing it's quite fine comparisons are also fine uh, yes, are you also planning you also mentioned about peltier effect uh, yes sir are you, yes, are you planning to work in that also that area also and combine both of them yes sir actually we want to develop a Uh, thermoelectric refrigerator using peltier yeah. effect for your for your information at our bc already one small micro 0.5 liter uh, refrigerator is done using this peltier effect in case yes, you yes. like to just check it solar powered it is done and is working fine i will check it i should always visit and use that uh, for your work no issues fine sure sir sure yeah. sir good work all the best for your work sir chengappa sir any questions are there you can take uh, i would also like to uh, echo your uh, feedback as well so the uh, author has done a good work on this um, and i also do not see any questions from the panelists or the participants so probably we can uh, move on to the next paper yeah next paper yeah thank you thank you yeah. well thank you sir So next paper ID three hundred. Karina Khan. Yes, you are all good. Can you try presenting the paper? Can you hear me? and my slides uh, are visible to you all yeah the slides are visible uh, ma'am uh, just speak a bit loudly okay so yeah is it okay now yes yes fine please carry on ma'am good morning to all of you uh, this is prena khan today i am going to present my work in uh, bsc chemistry printing i am from nepal university jaipur uh, i am a research scholar of work under the supervision of professor dr mukul sir from the nepal university jaipur Uh, the work which i am going to present is exploring theoretically the structure electronic and optical properties of solar cell materials uh, the my materials mg 0.875 ca 0.125 and g ge and t here are the contents which i am going to cover in my presentation uh, the renewable energy the renewable energy which is in the form of and present in unlimited amount and which can be renewed with time and the solar energy among uh, the renewable energy is uh, uh, widely used and widely can be uh, renewed uh, but the solar energy cannot be directly uh, used to uh, used as it is uh, available in a discrete form but the, to harness the solar energy into the It's used to form one of the devices we use in the solar cells. Solar cells are basically the devices which is able to convert the electrical energy into the uh, sorry, it is uh, used to convert the solar energy into the electrical energy. In this, uh, the light in the form of the photon from the solar uh, from the sun uh, is fall on the solar absorbing material. Some of some of its part is. Uh, the plastic and some of its part is uh, absorbed the part which is absorbed as electron we can cite and uh, the electron which is cited from its parent phase get jump into the cited state and creating the pool uh, there uh, thus the electron pool there is creating and generating the current basically the semiconductor are used in uh, the solar cells Uh, the material which I am using in my work is the chalk copperite compound. The chalk copperite compound basically the uh, crystal analog of the qubit zinc planar structure. It is a good semiconductor 
uh, which is the ternary semiconductor and uh, which fall in the fourth, second, fourth, fifth, and the fourth, third, fifth group of the periodic table. Uh, I'm using, uh, I'm computing my material by using the density functional theory. Density functional theory uh, is a method which is used to approximate solution of the Schrodinger equation as the uh, the parent Schrodinger equation is able to solve one electron system only, but in the practical uh, way, we have to solve the number of the electrons and the number of the system, which uh, which is, uh, can't be solved through this Schrodinger equation, which has become a big uh, bit hazard to solve through this equation only. So you, so we used the density function theory, which is based on uh, Bohm Oppenheimer approximation in which we uh, decouple the dynamics of the electron as well as the nucleus. Uh, and uh, the Kuhn's um, uh, theorem, which is used to uh, find out the ground state energy, which is able to explain all the material properties uh, which is required for a solar cell material like uh, the structural properties, electronic properties, and uh, electronic properties, and uh, uh, optical properties. The key highlights of my research work are I'm doping MGGE N2 by C because MGGE N2 is a wide cap band cap. Uh, material. Uh, so I doped uh, M2 by CA uh, to reduce its band gap and make it more, more favorable for the solar cell material. I also uh, shown its optical properties uh, because uh, to give its utilization in the photovoltaic device. Also some interband transitions also showing my work. Uh, uh, in this work, there's a the material is showing the rotable intensity in the three to five electron volt, which is the uh, basically the uh, region of the uh, visible uh, spectrum. The methodology which I followed to carry out my work is that I have been I'm using the Win 2K code software uh, for analyzing my uh, material properties, and this uh, Win 2K code is written in the Fortran language. Uh, for solving the crucial equation, I'm using the full potential linear augmented plane wave method, local orbital method. Uh, this method is uh, give accuracy in my approximation. Uh, also, the electronic and optical properties are calculated by using the approximation PBE GTA approximation. Uh, the uh, the optimal to uh, calculate my optical properties, I'm using the refraction, refraction, absorption, and the dielectric tensile spectra uh, to give my uh, to give the utility of my material to the photometry device. After doping, um, after doping <coughs> in my MD. Uh, MGG and example basically MGG and two is a bulk uh, bulk calcopyrite material. It is uh, apparently uh, in the pentagonal structure. The mass diagram second uh, figure second showing the structural uh, uh, structural uh, structure of the MGG and two and the doped MGG and two. I have doped C at MG size by twelve percent. And uh, it, it is observed that when I took the CA at the MG site by the 12 percent, it distorted its uh, uh, structure uh, from the pentagonal, it is converted to the body center molecular structure. Uh, the brilliant zone also uh, depicted in the diagram uh, in the figure second. And uh, with the help of the structural property in the brilliant zone, uh, we have plotted the band structure and the dot spectra uh, of the both pure and the doped MVG and two, uh, which is uh, uh, used to elaborate uh, uh, the electronic properties of that material. From the diagram, uh, from the figure number third A, 
the arrows diagram shows that the transition takes place from the valence band to maximum to the conduction band minimum at the different momentum points. Uh, through the doping, we have noticed that the band gap earlier is the 1.33 lactone mold, and after doping CA by 12%, it reduced it a bit up to the 1.28 lactone mold, and the band is still used to, uh, to um, specify the property of the material, as we can uh, say, uh, saw from the uh, figure 3A and 3B that. Uh, uh, both the con con balance and maximum and the conduction and minimum of both the uh, figures fall on the same momentum point, gamma point. And here we can say also that uh, both the uh, balance and maximum and the conduction and minimum fall at the same uh, momentum point. That by, uh, that's why we put this material into the direct band gap material as well as it is its band gap indicates that it is a semiconductor material also. Uh, the electronic properties can more enhance through more can more explain to the dot spectra that is the density of the state spectra. Uh, the peaks indicate here the crystalline and the amorphous nature of the um, material. As we can say, uh, as we can see from the figure number four A, that the peak is uh, sharp, but it is not that much sharp. So, uh, that is arises in the figure fourth B. So we can say that after doping uh, by a minute percentage of the C A, uh, the crystal the structure becomes a bit uh, crystalline, and the band gap also can explain to the uh, to the the diagram here. Uh, the Fermi energy is set at zero electron volt. Uh, these both uh, diagram are present uh, are calculated by using the approximation PBE GTA. And the optical properties of a material is shown through the four factor which are discussed earlier that the real dielectric tensile spectra, imaginary uh, dielectric tensile spectra, absorption spectra, refractivity spectra. Uh, the real dielectric tensile spectra is used to calculate how much energy is lost or gained during the whole process. Uh, its absolute value is collated in uh, table number Third, we can uh, observe that uh, by doping, its uh, value gets decreases. And the uh, uh, number no, I'm sorry, the, uh, you have crossed 10 minutes. Please find up within 12 minutes. Uh, I'm not understand. You have two to three minutes left. Okay, I have two to three minutes left only. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Sir. Second uh, diagram is uh, explaining the imaginary dielectric tensile factor. Here, the A, B, C, D, and E, F, G, H indicating the uh, transition peak, which is uh, also illustrated in the uh, band structure. And the absorption factor is the most uh, important uh, factor for uh, uh, telling the optical properties of the material. Uh, the absorption also decreases a bit uh, by doping, and the refractive factor is used to. Uh, tell about the transparency of the material and its value also de de decreases after doping as well. Uh, I have uh, discussed my all the confusion uh, along with the speaker discussion. Uh, these are the references which, I'm using, which I have used to uh, proceed my work. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, uh, it's a very good, Karina. Uh, uh, now, uh, I just wanted to know, this is a multi-junction solar cell you are developing or you are working with. Yes, sir. And, uh, uh, did you uh, try with these materials a single junction solar cell? Uh, not yet, but uh, not yet. I, just, I am just curious to know because with multi-junction we get very good high efficiency. Yes. But we haven't had, uh, except uh, this uh, silicon or germanium or all these things, 
uh, gallium arsenide all that but we we are looking for somebody doing even single uh, junction with other so as you are doing this all simulation work actual yeah, material we have to get got at the, uh, at the lab level these are to be yet to be tested or tried fine right? yeah. yeah okay good work we'll proceed ahead. Right. Try, try one single one junction one. also you yes, can also sure. try with single junction it will be easy for you to compare right yes, yeah okay so any other questions from others you can uh no sir we don't see any more questions yeah. uh, so probably we can go to the last paper id yeah. 317 for this session sure sure uh hello ha hello sir yes yes you are audible Uh, okay sir thank you sir uh good morning sir my name is raju lokhande uh, from a bld uh, uh, from civil department bld engineering college vijaypur and my co-authors uh, uh, colleagues those are sa varad and mb shorbal my it is a experimental uh, my topic is experimental investigation on geopolymer concrete cured at ambient temperature so geopolymer concrete uh, it is a innovative construction material and uh, we shall be uh, produced by uh, by the chemical action of inorganic molecules those are it is uh, 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 sodium hydroxide and sodium silicate we have used uh, for the chemical action with the fly ash and the, uh, it is a ggpfs and the geopolymer concrete is a innovative as well as it is a very eco uh, eco friendly material and uh, it is a alternative material for the portland cement and uh, jo, uh, by use of geopolymer concrete it reduces the uh, emission of uh, carbon uh, carbon dioxide so here it is a need so to find the substitute for the portland cement now we are using the for the concrete for the concrete we are using that portland cement so we are going to completely we are replacing with portland cement with uh, 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 with a clash uh, and ggpfs and it is reduces the emission of carbon dioxide and uh, to identify the cost effective also it is a very cost effective uh, as compared to the ordinary portland uh, ordinary uh, uh, concrete and here it is objective so my to enhance the strength of geopolymer concrete by uh, trial and error we have done the mix design and to check the workability of geopolymer concrete how much how it is workable with the uh, uh, with that uh, geopolymer concrete and they establish the economic and uh, environmental benefits of geopolymer concrete over ordinary portland cement so these are the ingredients of geopolymer concrete it is a uh, sodium hydroxide it is a uh, white it is a uh, uh, pellets uh, it is this is uh, white pellets it is a uh, sodium hydroxide and a ggbfs it is a powder and next it is a sodium uh, so, uh, sodium silicate and uh, it is a fly ash so flash is a by uh, product of coal and uh, the class of flash we have used uh, for the uh, making the geopolymer uh, concrete and it is obtained from ntpc thermal power plant kurigi vijayapur and uh, it is a ggtfs that is a ground granulated blast from slag it is obtained uh, from jindal steel plant balari karnataka and aggregates so we have used locally available aggregates uh, the maximum size of aggregate is 20 and the minimum 12.5 mm uh, size of aggregate we have used for making the concrete and m sand also we have used locally available m sand and al- so alkaline al- uh, activators so these are the we have produ- uh, we have got from the it is amar chemical lab uh, uh, sodium hydroxide Uh, bangalore and sodium silicate we have got from the uh, belgam and uh, sodium hydroxide we have to dissolve in uh, water with a different molarity we have maintained a molarity 12 molarity of uh, sodium hydroxide and uh, before 24 hour we have to make the solution we have to prepare the 24 hour before and uh, after that at the time of casting we have to use in the uh, site and next water so uh, fresh uh, fresh potable water we have to use for the uh, making the concrete 
and the preparation of alkaline liquids. So alkaline liquid is used in this study that is sodium hydroxide in the flake of form, okay, dissolved in water at a different molarity proportion. But we have, uh, as per the literature uh, survey, uh, I got uh, that. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, 12 molarity gives a, a, a good result. Hence, I have uh, it is uh, uh, I made uh, I sodium hydroxide. I have uh, made that uh, 12 molarity concentration, and uh, we have used the, the ratio of sodium silicate to sodium hydroxide was maintained a proportion of 2.5. Okay, and next uh, this is the preparation sodium hydroxide. It is mixed with water before 24 hours at the time of cast. And next, uh, sodium silicate, and uh, this is the we have to make it as a liquid at the time of uh, casting. And the next, uh, alkaline liquid plus extra water, and this is the aggregates and the GGBFS, fly ash, and all the things we have to add. And it may it, it gives the a geopolymer concrete. And uh, next, uh, so if we have done it is a we have done it is a uh, trials, okay? So the those are uh, it is a. Uh, Trial and error trials we have done, and that uh, some uh, we have referred some uh, uh, journal paper to that we got uh, some procedure to make the uh, so to separate the quantity of GGPFS, fly ash, coarse aggregate, fine aggregate, and so so we have got some uh, procedure from the uh, different journal papers, and that is we have followed. So it is 10 percent is GGPFS, 90 percent is fly ash. Okay, so GGPFS is 0.8 and 7. Point 1 percentage, it is a fly ash, that is 90 percentage. And the coarse aggregate and fine aggregate, CA is the coarse aggregate and FA is the fine aggregate, we have mixed it. And this is the sodium hydroxide with a molarity 12. And the next, uh, sodium uh, sodium, uh, sodium silicate 0.9. So next, uh, we have added water 0.5. So in the same fashion, it is we have, just it is a differentiated, one more, it is a GGFS, we uh, increase the uh, 10, uh, 10 percentage and decrease the fly per, uh, it is uh, decrease the 10 percentage of fly, fly ash. That means 20 percent is fly ash, 80 percent is uh, 20 percent is GGPFS and 80 percent is fly ash. So we got the different proportion for the GGPFS and the fly ash. And the remaining support segregate and fine aggregate, it is remain same, will not be changed. And similarly for the 30 percent is the third trial, 30 percent and 70 percent is 30 percent of GGPFS and 70 percent of fly ash we have used. And we got the different ratio of flash and uh, uh, GJ papers and port segregate and fine aggregate, it, it is remains same. So here it is. Uh, for the, this is the for the cubes. Okay, for the making the cube, we are going to find the compressive strength is most important for the geopolymer concrete or any it is concrete. The compressive strength is most important. For the six cubes, we have done this. Is. So for the uh, so for the three cylinders. Okay, uh, uh, 100 by 200 uh, uh, dimensions cylinder. So we have made once again the same calculation for the different value, and the same thing we have done. It is a trial and error. And uh, this uh, after that we got the result. Okay, so result uh, for the 10 percentage replacement, 10 uh, percent GGPFS and uh, 90 percent flash of complete replacement of cement. So it is uh, we got a slump value is 3.5, and we got a strength of 28 days. 36.22 uh, Newton per mm square. And the second trial, 20 percent is GGPFS and 80 percent is flyers. We got a 28 days strength is 39.33. And similarly for third one trial, 30 percent is GGPFS and 70 percent is flyers. I got the value is very good. That is 42.44. That is we can be uh, 42 Newton per mm square. The strength of concrete we can use for the construction of residential building g plus uh, two to g plus three uh, residential building we can easily we can be adopt such type of concrete and uh, the slump uh, it is very good also the slump uh, so for the third trial we got six it is a good uh, uh, slump and this is the compression strength uh, we have done in the utm machine and the universal testing machine so uh, these are the blocks getting it is uh, crushed at the strength of uh, uh, the third uh, 42.44 at 28 days. And the next it is a cylinders. Okay, split tensile strength is also most important for the concrete to take the tensile load. So we have got uh, the same, it is a proportion and the slump value, it is remain same. But here it is got, uh, it is a 3.3 uh, Four five newton per mm square the tensile strength for the uh, for the uh, for the building structure the concrete should have a very good strength in compressive strength not uh, tensile so strength uh, ten, minimum tensile strength is enough for the uh, structure so this is the cylinders we have done 
testing and uh, uh, of a size 100 by 200 mm. And uh, so here it is my conclusion is that so geopol uh, this uh, workability of geopolymer concrete increases with increases in the percentage of percentage of GGPFS in the geopolymer concrete. So increases the uh, this uh, GGPFS it is increases the slump value. And uh, next uh, cement is fully replaced with GGPFS and fly ash and achieved a very good compression strength and split and self strength of geopolymer concrete that is 42.44 newton per mm square and uh, ten split and self strength 3.345 newton per mm square with replacement of 30 percent of GGPFS and 70 percent of fly ash. And uh, this is the we can be uh, uh, we can recommend for G plus three to three uh, G plus four story building. We can adopt a 42 newton per mm square. Uh, the geopolymer uh, concrete strength we can adopt without any problem. And uh, here it is a it is a very cost effective also the for making one cube, meter cube of concrete around uh, uh, for making one meter cube of ordinary co concrete 3500 rupees cost. In that the cement cost is 3000 uh, 2400 rupees cost. Uh, remaining 900 rupees in that of course aggre fine aggregate it is around the six to seven hundred rupees and remaining around the four hundred rupees cost is around for the uh, course aggregate. And for the geopolymer concrete, it is uh, around uh, 2007, uh, the total cost is 2700. And in that, it is available materials that is the GGPFS and the flyers. These are the waste products from the, in the, in the thermal power plant and uh, as well as uh, uh, steel power plant. So it is a waste product and this, these are abundantly available and with a very low cost. And uh, that is we are completely replacing with cement. Hence, we can adopt that with materials and uh, we reduce the demand of cement. Cement, as well as these materials are available abundantly, and hence it is it is very uh, low cost. And we making that uh, by using these materials, we can make the concrete is less than uh, 2,700 and uh, less than that also. But uh, these materials are available. The, the one bag of uh, uh, nowadays the cement is 3,500, but uh, fly ash around it is a uh, 60 to 70 rupees only the fly ash bag, and GG papers in the same fashion also. So hence we can adopt this type of uh, concrete. <coughs> Yeah. So this is my reference and this is, uh, thank you sir. Yeah, very good. Raju, do uh, most of us are with circuit brand <laughs> and uh, this is one contribution for the uh, humanitarian uh, related uh, uh, topic. Uh, very new work, so, uh, we usually discuss about these matters with our uh, regarding uh, one thing uh, that curiosity develops that you are developing a new type of uh, uh, something uh, yeah, alternative for the cement that is being worked that's what i see uh, now you are always mentioning g plus 2 or g plus 3 g plus 4 uh, i was curious to know about the values of difference that would cause if it is g plus at 10 uh, where would the, this material that you are mentioning would stand with regard to the cement existing one? Sir, uh, so G plus 10 building, we have to go for the high strength concrete. So uh, yeah, it is a 43 point, uh, uh, 43 uh, Newton per mm square concrete will not be used for the G, G plus 10 building because uh, we at least we, we need a uh, G70, uh, this uh, new, uh, 70 Newton per mm square strength of concrete is at least we need for the G, uh, uh, G10, uh, G10, uh, G10, uh, G plus 10 story building. So that time it is uh, such type of okay. it is concrete, so not clear, it is good. So we can do the research work and we can okay. be enhance the strength of concrete and we can be used. Sure, sure. Yeah, I'll interrupt here. Is this part of your research work or this is a general Sir, study? Sir, it's uh, my general study. I'm, uh, uh, no, no, I really appreciate it. And while I was looking at all the chemical materials that you were mentioning, how you are getting this uh, geopolymer uh, cement or uh, uh, mentioning. I wanted to know what would be the final equation that is chemical equation for your, uh, I mean, sorry, that uh, cement thing, what you are coming up with. If possible, that would have given a uh, more impression about that final equation, chemical equation. Okay, you can think of that okay, later. Okay, 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 sir, okay. I got some. This is the final equation of. Okay, yeah, yeah, this I saw this. I also saw this analytical, but a equation which says just like photosynthesis has an equation, definitely you will be getting out something with all the chemical materials that you are mixing up. Fine, okay, okay, sir. Good work. If there are any questions, uh, Professor Changampa, if I would like, uh, uh, shall I summarize and 
close i mean conclude yes yes uh, yes sir uh, please go ahead with your closing remarks uh, this is uh, you can you can unshare you i mean uh, uh, stop the presentation okay sir mm -hmm. yeah this particular track uh, had a very good uh, uh, paper presentation till uh, now we had totally uh, seven seven uh, papers presented two three four five six plus two eight papers presented and uh, of that three were from uh, blde one from tumkur one came back to one from prdc then uh, we had one from jaipur so all across the country we had people uh, submitting their work uh, one paper was from civil quite uh, interesting and uh, impressive also so i really appreciate the efforts those of uh, some research college some it is it still continues to impress me so much that uh, Uh, even though it is not part of the research but individually they are contributing that is uh, really appreciable and you must continue to work uh, this is mine uh, that is uh, two or three papers of where of that category where clearly they were doing a general study two papers were uh, of uh, a general uh, study where uh, still uh, i mean uh, things would have been uh, taken to a research level so some some new contribution can always be tried when you uh and think of but uh, there is a you have also mentioned your future work related to uh, this so i highly appreciate all the presenters your efforts because a lot of efforts go in uh, submitting a paper to such a wonderful uh, conference that is first of all secondly trying to organize that entire information into the in the form of a paper so i congratulate all of you it was very good learning from me and knowing uh, most of the uh, speakers and uh, the way you have presented it was quite good and the organizing i should thank uh, dr changappa for a wonderful smooth presentation there was no uh, hitch in anywhere that there was delay or anything uh, very well uh, organized i should also appreciate and uh, congratulate uh, all our uh, ipcc bangalore uh, section people you know a lot of work goes on when a conference is to be organized i really had a very good time uh, as a session chair and quite good learning so i hand over to uh, i congratulate all the uh, presenters and also the organizers i hand over to uh, uh, professor changappa sir uh, thank you so much sir uh, thank you for your encouraging words and uh, uh, accepting our uh, request to be a, a track chair for this session Uh, so it uh, it was indeed a great pleasure to have you with us and also learn from you and i am of course that all our participants would have definitely consider uh, considered your pointers and would be implementing them in their uh, further research as well uh, i would also like to thank uh, mr advait uh, student volunteer from our section who was uh, uh, with us throughout the session uh, managing and helping us uh, to the smooth flow of the session as well so with this uh, probably i think we can uh, conclude the session uh, for today and uh, we would be resuming can you can you ask request yeah yeah so yeah we will do that camera and sure, sure 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 sir we'll do that so i request all the uh, speakers we have promoted you as a panelist so you can just like turn on your video feed uh, so that we can have a, uh, um, a photo capture and then wrap up the session all presenters yeah one second sir one second on camera yeah that's really good sir you want to put on <laughs> one second sir i'll do that
Yeah, there we are. Uh, Adwait, uh, could you also take a snapshot from your side? Yeah, all are serious. That is very serious. <laughs> you have presented a wonderful work, and we should be very happy. Yes, sir. How to get everyone in the work? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks. It was again a great pleasure to have you all with us. So uh, we we would be breaking now for lunch and resuming the uh, uh, session by 2 p.m. You can join the same bridge for next of the plenary sessions. And definitely there is a huge um, uh, knowledgeable speakers lined up. So I think you can definitely gain from their uh, presentation and panel discussions. Thank you all, and we would be uh, okay. seeing you, meeting you uh, at 2 p.m. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you, much. Sir. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. Okay, Changapa, sir, I'll take uh, leave from this. We'll join again after lunch. Thanks right, for the same bridge by 2 p.m. Yeah, 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 sure. Okay, bye. Thank you. Virtual lunch break. We are again coming. Uh, we are again joining back, and we are very, very honored to have very distinguished panelists with us, Dr. Farooq Mistri as well as uh, Dr. Nagin Simha. And this whole uh, sustainable smart village session is curated by Dr. Ashok Das, who is also with us. I am Puneet Kumar Mishra. I am. Chair by IEEE Bangalore section as well as I am the general chair of IEEE Bangalore Human Aid Technology Conference. So I would like to welcome all of you for joining this panel along with my co volunteers Neha as well as Chengappa who has also joined as a panelist here. Mm -hmm.
So what plan are you willing to have of this uh, sustainable smart village session is from Dr. Farooq Mistri, who is from Mosia Oklahoma, USA. So before introducing him, I would like to just give a brief about this session. Actually, the idea of having this conference, it was in the year 2016 when we met uh, me and Dr. Ashok met for the first time in one of the IEEE conferences. Then we decided that we will have one focus conference or a workshop which will be only focusing and bringing the people on the same single platform which will be focusing on technology for humanity. And it took almost four years to from conceptualization to reality. <laughs> In between, Dr. Farooq was kind enough to join us and he also provided all the necessary support as well as expertise in bringing out this session so well. So I'm honored to introduce Dr. Farooq Mistri. He is the co-director of System Realization Laboratory and LA Comp Chair of the School of Aerospace and Mechanical Engineering at the University of Oklahoma in Oklahoma. The SRL, which is System Realization Laboratory, SRL research is focused on collaboratively defining the emerging frontiers for the intelligent physical social systems when the computational methods are incomplete and inaccurate. The lab focuses on various such systems, including the food, energy, water nexus for rural development. Professor Mistri is fellow of ASME, associate fellow of AIAA. He, he was named the ASME Root standing engineer design educator in 2011. In September 2012, he was the IIT Kharagpur. In December 2012, he received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the International Society of Agile Manufacturing. He has co-authored two textbooks, two monographs, and more than 400 technical papers. Farooq's passion is to have fun in providing an opportunity for highly motivated and talented people to learn how to define and achieve their dreams. Professor Mistri is a BTEC from IIT Kharagpur and PhD from University of California, Berkeley, USA. So welcome you, sir, and floor is yours. We are really eager to listen to you. And especially at the wee hours in his, you know, at 3.30 a.m. Yes. Of his time. Great. Thank so you. let me share my screen, please. Yes. Chengappa, please give him presenter's right. Good morning from Oklahoma. It's absolutely delightful to be with you and uh, to have this honor uh, in uh, setting the stage for this particular session. I'm most grateful for the introduction and the invitation and to be able to participate in, in what is about to take place. My work today is to uh, provide the setting for what we are all about and what this session is about. So everybody's on the same page in terms of what we expect and how we plan to achieve uh, the outcome that we look for. What is absolutely beautiful is that Ashok and Puri have put together a program that is anchored in first listening to the voice of the stakeholders. The stakeholders have been partitioned into three groups, customers, finance, and the ecosystem. The customers include village sarpanches, social entrepreneurs. For finance, we have the Smart Village Research Group, Government of India, and various foundations. And for the ecosystem, we have academia and organizations. So what is the desired outcome? So we have lots of players, lots of partners, lots of potential uh, uh, members of this community. So the desired outcome is a report that is going to be, that is titled tentatively Smart Rural Development 2030. The editors of this report are Ashok Das and Mishra, 
and the contributors are all the people who are presenting who are presenting today and so our request to the presenters is to present elements that are relevant to be put into this report. The organization is that from 2 to 5 p.m. your time, there will be short 10-minute uh, lightning talks relevant to the vision and the way forward. Ashok has been in touch with you and has requested each of you to present your vision of what your organization does or your goal, what worked, what did not work, and the way forward. At between 6.45 and 8.30 p.m., we will be dealing with the road, uh, 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 we will be having a dialogue to identify the broad structure for developing uh, uh, a roadmap for smart villages. My email address is here, my cell phone is here. I love to talk and would love to have, uh, to communicate with you. So the IEEE Bangalore Humanitarian Conference, uh, technology conference that was conceived four years ago, the objective is to explore technologies for improving the life of people in the world. There are three dom particular domains, environmental, societal, uh, uh, and, uh, and development, that includes educational health challenges that are faced by humanity across the world. The way in which this conference has structured uh, its approach to these challenges is to anchor what we talk about in the 17 Sustainable Development Goals uh, that the United Nations has put forward. I've highlighted some of these goals. At this end, there's community building and governance, peace, justice, and strong institutions. This is a must. We recognize that the way forward is through partnerships, through coalitions, at different levels of the, uh, of the, of the enterprise. And what is important here is that we recognize that we have people from government uh, and, uh, and other organizations who are participating and trusts who are participating in this workshop, and we hope to build a partnership. But you may have a partnership, but you have to have a strategic plan, a way in which you proceed. So what are the goals that we would be shooting for in this part partnership? We would like to mitigate hunger, that's sustainable development goal. We'd like to foster good health and well-being. We'd like to foster quality education. We'd like to foster gender equality. We, we want to pay attention to clean water and sanitation. We'd like to have affordable energy. We would like to build sustainable cities and communities. We would like to have responsible consumption and, and production. We would like to uh, touch upon climate action. Oh, sorry. We would like to be participants, activists in climate action. We would like to protect life below water, life on land. Now, I left out eight. Why is this important? Because we suggest that the way to start, uh, 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 when we are thinking in terms of rural development, is decent work in economic growth. Given that we start start with uh, with a sustainable development uh, a goal eight. The question that comes up: What is the strategy? What is the roadmap? How do we proceed in terms of touching upon all these these sustainable development goals? In this session, in this session, our objective is to to explore technologies for improving the life of people in the world. But starting with sustainable development, uh, go into decent work and economic growth. This is an extremely important logo that has been put together. Uh, you will see that two human beings here, and at the back of this is at the back of their mind: 13, 14, and 15. What is 13? Climate action. What is 14? Uh, uh, life below water. What is uh, what is 15? Life on land. So this is what we keep at the back of our mind. This is for humans, this is for fish, and this is for plants. So this is at the back of our mind. This is what we want to protect. This is what we want to take care of. At the top, how do we want to do it? We want to think in terms of mitigating hunger, increasing education, and improving health. What is, what is foundational to make this happen? 
foundational to make this happen uh, is is uh, 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 energy. We need energy. We need water, and this is economic growth. These two are tied into economic growth. If we are able to do these things, then we look at 11, 5, and 12. What is 5? What is particularly important throughout the world is minimizing the inequity in gender. So that's 5. What is 12? Uh, 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 12 is responsible consumption. Responsible consumption and production. That ties to industry. That ties to human beings. That ties to how we how we use our resources wisely. And if we did did these things, then guess what? We are able to achieve the level, which is is uh, uh, sustainable com communities. This is extremely important, sustainable communities. So what I'm looking at, this is what we have in mind. This is this is our value system. This is where we wish to go, and these are our goals, these are our enablers. So when we're thinking in terms the desired outcome here, the key deliverable from the session with all the people talking is a vision and a roadmap for, de uh, for developing sustainable smart villages through collective participation and collaboration. We have invited the speaker to highlight the use of technologies for sustainable holistic development of the rural hinterland anchored in the SDGs. We are suggesting that we start with eight and then we proceed in a systematic and organized manner to touch upon the, the other sustainable development goals. The best practices, we, we are looking for speakers to highlight the best practices based on what they have done, what has worked and what has not worked. We are, we are, we are uh, requesting speakers and we've organized speakers to come along and say, what are the elements of village development? Agriculture, water, relevant livelihood, energy sufficiency, uh, rural industry, health services, sanitation, etc. So we are looking for people to touch upon these things. So what is the desired outcome? I keep coming back to this because this session has been put together not from the perspective of people coming along and saying, this is what I'm doing. Thank you. I'm leaving. The session has been put together so that we're able to build a community that collectively wishes to move forward. The key deliverable is a vision roadmap for developing uh, sustainable smart villages through collective participation and collaboration. So lightning talks from 2 to 5 p.m., 10 minutes each, 6 to 6.40, setting the roadmap, and 6.45 to 8.30 p.m., we, we will have a moderated dialogue and the way we've set it up is that we have people uh, who, are, uh, who are recording the lightning talks. The synthesizers are listening to the lightning talks, and the synthesizers uh, will, present the, uh, will present their findings that we can include in the report uh, 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 during this moderated dialogue. This will be a post-conference uh, report edited by Ashok Task and Pony Mitra, and the title of that is Smart Rural Development 2030. So I want to make a distinction between social and business entrepreneurs, and this slide is particularly important. You will see that on the, uh, in the first column are the elements of a business entrepreneur. In the second column is uh, uh, elements for a social entrepreneur, and in the third, are the NGOs. The goal of a business entrepreneur is to capture a market securely. The goal of the social entrepreneur is to fill the market gap and change the world. The NGO is to address social need. Each is different and each has a role to play in this endeavor that we are, this journey that we are about now. The objective for the business person is to build a business and earn profit. The social entrepreneur is to create sustainable solutions for social change. And the NGO, the focus is to implement solutions for, uh, for social change. So it's not us versus them. It is sharing to gain and how each of us can make a contribution to help the millions of people in India 
who live below the poverty line, but not just below the poverty line, but who live in extreme poverty in India. So a word about what we mean by sustainable development. It's a development that meets the needs, the needs of the person without compromising the ability to meet future needs. It contains within it two key concepts. The concept of the needs of the world's poor to which overriding priority should be given. And by the state of technology and social organization on the environment's ability to meet present and social needs. I'm going to spend just a second on explaining what is meant by poor. I invite you to replace the word poor with the word inequity. So when we think in terms of the goals, the sustainability development goals, think in terms of inequity. We wish to minimize the inequity in gender, gender opportunities. We wish to minimize the inequity in hunger. We wish to minimize the inequity in opportunities for education. That should be, is our goal, and that is how we wish to proceed. There are three spheres of sustainability, environmental, social, and economic. It's when these three spheres interact that we have sustainability. But it's not sufficient just to think in terms of environmental, social, and economic. For us to move forward in the roadmap, we have to take care of the tension between environmental and social, which is the social environmental tensions. We need to take care of the tensions between economic and social. We need to take care of the tensions between environmental and economic. And the solutions between environmental and social must be available. The solutions between social and economic must be equitable. And the solutions between environmental and economic must be valid. It is only when we collectively work together to identify bearable, equitable, and viable solutions can we think in terms of sustainability. So the key question in this session, I ask you, to, I, I invite you to address the following. First, recognize that rural communities in India differ from one another. Each community has different resources available, social, environment, and economic. And each community has different set of constraints on these resources. So the question is, how can limited resources, limit, uh, resources are huge because of the CSR Act that was passed in 2013, because the government of India, the state governments are committed to improving the quality of life of all people in India, particularly those at the bottom of the pyramid. So that can be leveraged to empower people. The idea is not to tell people how to live, but to empower people living in rural communities in India to continue improving their quality of life by addressing the inequities that is anchored in the definition of sustainable development that I just uh, gave you, associated with the nexus of three drivers of sustainable development, namely people, planet, and profit. So let's think in terms of sustainable development. The first uh, is broken up into five categories, anchors, value proposition, goal, outcome, and impact. We wish to start with uh, decent work uh, and economic growth so that we are able to have sustainable communities over a period of time so that we have uh, good governance through peace, justice, and strong communities. And this is to be developed over time. We touch upon smart technologies that allows us to deal with no poverty, zero, uh, uh, zero hunger, et cetera, two, uh, two, three, four, five, and 10. We develop partnerships. We, we have responsible consumption. And we recognize that we have smart technologies uh, uh, that allow us to move from, from uh, that allow us, uh, that, that are based on value propositions associated with clean water, uh, alternative uh, 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 clean energy, uh, uh, et cetera, to come up with these outcomes. And these things are anchored in climate, in life below water, life above land, and the notion of people, planet, and profit. So this is the big picture that we are looking at. What we are looking at is this is the impact. These are the intermediate outcomes that we have to plan on. The, this is where we start decent work and economic uh, growth, creating partnerships. These are the smart technologies that we wish to, uh, uh, wish to develop for clean water, 
uh, 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 responsible uh, consumption and production, etc. We suggest that what we are looking at are empowerment, education, and entrepreneurship. We are anchoring the the, the empowerment, uh, entrepreneurship, and education in in people, planet, and progress. So over the number of years, we will start with, st uh, with stage one, that's a smart intervention. Then we go to stage two, then we go to stage three. And in each of these, we work with the community in partnership with the community so that the community uh, is able to proceed further uh, uh, and be happy and feel uh, empowered to do so. If we proceed in the systematic and organized fashion, we will then have sustainable cities uh, uh, to proceed. So finally, the, re the report, the, the end of the report is as follows. The executive summary, a frame of reference. For the frame of reference, there would be the stakeholders, and I've identified the, and, and the primary stakeholders are the people who are presenting out here, the players, the target community, resources, and a statement of what is meant by smart rural development. And, and there are two presentations, at least, that I have seen. Uh, one is by uh, NN Sinha uh, on, on, on smart rural development, and the other is by Sir Brian, uh, uh, who will be talking about or who will be addressing what is smart rural development. The state of practice, there are people who are going to be tell us about the success factors, the challenges, the requirements for the way forward. Then the state of theory. We, we need to anchor this in theory, simulation, technology. And so critical evaluation of models that have been offered for rural development have been used for rural development. And then smart rural development. What is this plan? What's involved in this? Smart physical, cyber physical, social. System. What does this mean? Metrics to evaluate progress and sustain progress. We must have metrics. It's not good just say, I did this, give a photo opportunity for the CSR person and the person from government to come along and, and take a look, uh, uh, take a look with, uh, 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 take a photo, I get a press uh, from the uh, 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 photograph that is published. But how do we evaluate it so that we're able to, to decide in a responsible and systematic manner where the next in investment must be made, what changes should be made as we move ahead, and then propose a plan of action to attain smart rural development by the year 2030. We come out then with recommendations uh, to the government, to the social entrepreneurs, to the self-partners, to the foundations, to CSR, to social workers, to NGOs, to impact, inve uh, impact investors, and most importantly, to to the influencers, and then of course their acknowledgments and references. So now I come to the end of uh, my introduction. So one, I would be happy to answer questions for clarification. Two, if you are interested in contributing to the report titled Smart Rural Development 2030, or interested in joining us in improving the quality of life of Indians living in extreme poverty. It's not just poverty, living in extreme poverty. If the answer is yes, uh, please uh, email Puneet Mishra, uh, or text him at the number given here, or email Ashok Das uh, with the email that has been given here, uh, or text him at this number. With that, I, I yield back the screen, and I'm open to comments, questions, and certainly dialogue. Dr. Farooq, for really setting the stage wonderfully. It was an excellent and delighting uh, presentation from you, and I can see that a uh, lot of attendees, they are asking uh, questions. So if you are having any questions, please type in the chat window. We will be very happy to say those things. But we are also having another very, very distinguished speaker with us. We know he is having a short of time. That's why we have pre phoned his session from uh, evening session to this session so that immediately after this, we will be trying to host our next speaker. 
who is uh, Dr. Nagendra Nath Sinha, Secretary, Rural Development, Government of India. So we'll be coming to you, sir. But before that, because this being the virtual conference, we would like to virtually give a flag to Dr. Farooq Mystery. So definitely, physical flag will be reaching to you very soon. But in a virtual environment, we please accept our token of appreciation. Thank you. Yes. So the next session is coming really directly from the government. We are very honored to have Secretary of Rural Development Government of India. In the slide, the flag was not visible. Now it is visible? Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I think someone has taken uh, my presenter's role so that I could not show it. <coughs> so quickly we will go ahead with uh, Dr. Nagin Nasinha because he has to leave at 3 o'clock. <coughs> For the audience, I will read his bio. In the sustainable development community, his known is very well known, but at least for students and other delegates, I will read out his brief bio. Sri Nagin Nath Sinha, IES of Jharkhand Cadre in 1987, took charge as Secretary, Ministry of Rural Development, Government of India, on May 27, 2020. His major interests lie in the domain of sustainable development, use of ICT, infrastructure, health and institution building. He has held sensitive assignment both as central government and the state government, which is darkened as well as in Bihar. As Secretary Rural Development, he is responsible for formulating, coordinating and implementing programs that address the development needs of the rural areas focusing especially on mitigating and eradicating poverty and creating sustainable employment and livelihood opportunities. His programs rely heavily on use of technology for furthering sustainable development. His previous assignment includes Secretary, Border Management, Ministry of Home Affairs, Chairman, NHAI, Managing Director, National Highways and Infrastructure Development Corporation Limited, Additional Chief Secretary, Rural Development, Government of Jharkhand, besides Secretary or Principal Secretary in Department of IT, Road, Construction, Industry, Mines and many others. Sri Sinha is a BTA from IIT Kanpur and MS in Health Sciences from John Hopkins University, Baltimore, USA. Sir, we are really honored to have you and as I quickly also, we vouch for technology for humanity and this conference is basically meant for sustainable, sustainable development goals and we are also trying to play our role in eradicating poverty as well as making the, for betterment of humanity. To you, sir. So, thank you very much, uh, friends. Uh, Dr. Mistri, Dr. Ashok Das, Puneet, uh, uh, Sir Brian Heap, and uh, all the people who are available on the video uh, conference based uh, conference on the smart rural development and the smart. Uh, I've been in this sector for quite long, and the issues that have been underlined. Uh, by the professor history while staking out the controls of the workshop and the uh, issues that need to be addressed uh, in this regard are extremely important and uh, we must uh, address them and as soon as possible because on the today this society evolves, the country evolves, and the way we are able to meet the constitutional obligations and the constitutional liabilities and constitutional promises to a large number of Indians. 
I had had some experience uh, with uh, formulating a program in the for the smart development of the villages while as working as the secretary, principal secretary of the rural development in uh, state government of Jharkhand, and as secretary in charge of the rural development ministry in the government of India, coordinating many uh, programs that address uh, the aspects of the uh, equitable rural development uh, through programs focusing on the employment generation, uh, the rural infrastructure creation, the creating community of women uh, and fostering their livelihoods and among many others. There have been programs uh, which address the issue of uh, furthering focus development, uh, which uh, many in the panel, many in, um, in the audience would have heard about. Uh, there is a program called Sansad Others Grammy Yojana, which uh, focuses the energy of the local MP for uh, focused and uh, sustained development uh, of a particular Gram Panchayat. And uh, there have been 1,500 such Gram Panchayats. There is another program at the central level, which is known as Shavapshad Mukherjee Urban Mission, which kind of takes up uh, the developmental challenges in the uh, the rural areas for a cluster of uh, villages, and uh, which are urbanizing fast, and so so that their developmental needs are met and their aspirations are satisfied, but uh, are we practicing the smart uh, village approach uh, which relies large, very heavily on the use of the technology for leapfrogging the decades of underdevelopment, deficit in development. So I think uh, my talk would address some of these issues. Uh, so I will begin by uh, ad addressing this issue of a what do we mean by smart village? I have taken three uh, uh, definitions from three distinguished institutions, and uh, let us see what they tell us. So, if you go to the UC Berkeley, uh, which has a group uh, focusing on the smart village, so they say it's a community empowered by digital technology. So, the IT backbone is the uh, principal spine around uh, which. Uh, the entire development sort of uh, pursued and fostered. If you go to the International Telecommunication Union, they say it's an integrated approach to digital development, uh, which have accelerated impact on the multiple uh, sustainable development goals uh, that uh, Professor Mistry spoke about, and uh, aims at increasing last mile access and making sure that there are right digital solutions which reach people. There is another solution by European Union which have another uh, program particularly focusing on the mountains uh, and remote communities. They define smart villages as the communities in rural areas that use innovative solutions to improve their resilience, building on local strength and opportunities, uh, rely on a participatory approach. Uh, their strategy improves economic, social, and environmental conditions by mobilizing solutions offered by digital technology. So unlike the two I spoke about, uh, it talks uh, digital technology as the principal vector, uh, and uh, including many, many other technologies uh, which uh, kind of uh, address the uh, kind of goals uh, that were mentioned by social history uh, in the uh, state setting talk just a few minutes earlier. Next slide. So I would like to mention some initiatives uh, which have been there uh, in this regard. Uh, I uh, kind of uh, uh, request uh, uh, people not to be offended because this is uh, from my limited knowledge. There have been many other attempts and uh, I'm sure uh, there would be a large number of attempts which would not have been so one was, of course, uh, done in my cadre state, so it is Smart Gram Yojana. Then there is a scheme called Smart Maharashtra, which is state of the 
Maharashtra Agri Business and Rural Transformation Project, and it spoke uh, largely on the value chains, uh, post harvest management, resilient production systems, and access to new and deepening the market. It was sponsored by the World Bank. However, uh, this does not speak much about, uh, say, improving the water supply uh, situation and sustainability in those regards, or sustainability in terms of energy. Uh, uh, utilization and the source, uh, source of getting those energy or <clears throat> addressing the equity aspect. We also have a project uh, which was initially sponsored uh, by President of India and then the government of Haryana wanted to uh, take it across thousand such uh, villages. However, uh, uh, when I was going through the their document, the concept is still very nebulous and they more or less uh, focus on creation of infrastructure without being guided by a, a specific uh, philosophy or a very well-defined, well thought of. There is another program in UP uh, which is called Ice Pulse. Uh, although it was launched in 2016, however, it picked up momentum in 2020 and it aims at uh, it. Uh, now takes up about eight villages in uh, Gorakhpur, and it uses multiple technical solutions uh, 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 addressing the agriculture sector, the water su water supplies, the uh, clean energy by using solar devices. Besides uh, some issues addressing the uh, physically handicapped and challenged persons, and improving environmental by tree plantation. There is another issue uh, uh, which relates to climate smart villages and uh, we know that the climate is changing very fast and therefore uh, uh, the technologies uh, need to adapt themselves to the uh, changing climate and there has been an attempt by uh, CJIR, uh, CCFS program uh, which developed some climate smart villages and uh, this principally address uh, having the uh, seed varieties, uh, getting agronomic, agronomic practices right, uh, which uh, adapt, are well adapted to the changing climate situation, uh, use of uh, uh, mechanized devices, uh, besides uh, uh, focusing on the land and land soil uh, <clears throat> and water conservation. Then there have been uh, private uh, initiatives on the smart villages. Uh, one is Chutki, uh, this is in Angulisa, and uh, Dr. Subhas was the proponent there. Then there is a group uh, called United for Hope, and it uh, did a project in UP. And there are many others uh, who have not been able to do for want of time and for want of due diligence from my side. So. <clears throat> Now I take up uh, this issue uh, which I initially alluded to that uh, is the ICT is is the only technology which is which needs to be included uh, in the technology package for develop uh, development of the rural areas. My answer is no. It's, uh, it's obviously IT and ICT are the backbone, but there are many areas of technology. Uh, which are also in needed in order to improve the lot of difficulty. Uh, so, climate smartness I spoke about, uh, which would include cropping system practices, seeds, uh, integrated pest management, uh, many others. Then, environmental smartness is another area uh, which needs to uh, be focused uh, because until unless the environment situation is managed, the way environment getting degraded uh, uh, the uh, fate of the humanity and the entire planet is out and still unless each one of us does things right uh, the, the sustainably the goal uh, is not going to be achieved so management of water land and soil resources is critical biodiversity management is critical uh, the forest uh, and uh, other <coughs> Bioresources is critical. Uh, so, all of these need to be uh, included in the environmental smartness, uh, which 
while delivering the right kind of output does not have a heavy toll on the environment or we are giving more to the environment uh, than what we are taking. So that's the kind of uh, net goal that we should have. Precision farming uh, minimizes the uh, use of resources while enhancing the uh, production. Uh, that's another area. Smart energy management is uh, the goal of many uh, proponents and uh, certainly uh, the smartness in this regard is important, not only from the point of view of uh, burning of carbon fuels, but also from the point of view of reduction of uh, the uh, the uh, dependence on the other providers and remote providers of energy. Then creation of dispersed economy is another uh, goal that we should uh, aim at. Uh, we have seen the heavy toll that the uh, COVID has taken on the population. And, uh, large scale migration of about a crore of people was seen uh, uh, following the lockdown and that that happened because the cities and the urban areas are the center of growth and until unless you disperse the growth and uh, create the employment opportunities uh, in, uh, throughout the length and the breadth of the country such things are want to happen not against the migration migration has multiple benefits but uh, migration happen i mean the migration because of the economic compulsions uh, is an area which we should uh, we should uh, probably try to mitigate as much as possible because it takes heavy toll on both the recipient and the giver community and therefore it's very important. Social engineering is important uh, has been mentioned by Professor Mistri uh, uh, both from the gender point of view, from the partnership point of view, from the harmony within the society removal of the social stratification of the kind that we have been recently hearing and reading uh, in Indian newspapers. Uh, so these need to be addressed. And uh, I think uh, uh, technology, uh, social engineering uh, technologies should be uh, to the extent possible. So what distinguishes smart village approach from the approach which has been followed uh, for the development uh, so far uh, by the governments across the world and certainly governments in India. Uh, I, I, I believe the technology as the organizing principle, uh, the key principle is the is one very critical uh, distinguishing approach of the smart village movement. It's led, co-led by technology savvy movements, those who are aware of the potential of the technology to leapfrog uh, generations of development uh, and uh, move things uh, towards a more desirable kind of situation, more equity, more sustainability. So sustainability is another key parameter. Uh, we spoke, uh, we have spoken in detail, so we will not uh, speak more. Improving digital connectivity uh, is another area and access, uh, digital access also one of the key goals. I think uh, we couldn't emphasize it enough. Uh, even today when the uh, rural areas have about 277 million smartphones uh, phones within the uh, country, uh, these are largely concentrated among the upper echelons of the rural society. There are a large number of people, uh, uh, women and children, uh, who don't have access to the Digital devices. And until and unless we do enough to improve their access, uh, the development will come in, but it will only uh, help the rich people. Uh, thereby, the issue of equity will remain. And uh, I think uh, uh, the goal of equitable, equitous society will remain. And enhancing social impact with technology. So, how do we make sure that? Uh, Whatever, I mean, uh, taking a very concrete example, whatever Sarpanch does or Mukia does is well known to the people. People are able to access what all developmental benefits are they entitled to. So, so, enhancement of the social impact with technology is another critical uh, distinguishing mark of the uh, smart village uh, kind of approach. 
Uh, now I come to the uh, driver's fault report. My uh, feeling and belief now is that uh, the conditions in India are uh, just right for a very uh, fast and accelerated movement towards the uh, smart village kind of a digital kind of a growth. One is COVID, uh, and we all know about it. Uh, so the uh, remote uh, working, work from home, uh, one people getting uh, dispersing throughout the country from the urban areas. I can say it with a little bit of authority because my department uh, organized the main program called uh, Gari Kalyan Rozgar Aryan, uh, focusing on 116 districts uh, which uh, try to mitigate the impact of the COVID-related uh, difficulties people, which people face both in terms of their livelihood, uh, in terms of their entitlements and rights. So, uh, <clears throat> so uh, it's a it's an impact uh, which uh, has taken each and everyone, and I think uh, all, all of us are thinking uh, very deeply as to how we could ensure that uh, our villages develop as much as possible and uh, their difference, their deficit, their uh, gap in cities and uh, urban areas are less and less possible. Uh, you would be aware that uh, there is a program called BharatNet, uh, which uh, aimed at connecting about um, all the Gram Panchayat uh, headquarters uh, with the broadband uh, fibers that we connected to all such GPs. And as of now, about 1.5 lakh GPs have been connected and they are service ready. But Honorable Prime Minister led a very ambitious goal of uh, getting fiber to all villages in the next thousand days, uh, is 15th August at this, and uh, the government is working very uh, seriously towards achieving it. Uh, you may not be aware, uh, that is why I have included it, uh, the Ministry of uh, IT Information Technology, Electronics and Information Technology is now conceptualizing a program called Digital Village Program, which, I am set, which is addressing around 100,000 villages on uh, uh, providing services uh, on the IT backbone, digital backbone, in the area of telehealth, education, skills. Uh, this is going to be a major program, and I think uh, the goals of the smart uh, village movement and uh, the digital village program are very similar. So it's a uh, 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 there is a call for uh, converging of uh, resources uh, and picking up benefits from each one of uh, the such programs, then uh, so that uh, our impacts are enhanced. There is a program called uh, Pradhan Mantri Grameen Digital Sakshata Abhiyan, so it aims at uh, making about 6 uh, crore or 60 million people digitally literate. Then there is a major program which has been recently launched, uh, which is called National Digital Health Mission. And, uh, it would have uh, uh, patient records, it would involve all the uh, service providers besides the health facilities. Uh, so, uh, in a way, uh, anyone uh, uh, from any place in India can go at any other place and get himself treated without uh, bothering or uh, Without worrying for whether he is taking his, uh, let's say, X ray or ultrasound along with him or not. So, this is going to be another game changer uh, for the uh, country and can certainly be a component of the smart village program. Uh, digital edu education has also, because of COVID, moved into top gear. There is a program called uh, Swayam, uh, which uh, is which provides materials for uh, 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 digital uh, kind of education from class 9 to PG. It has videos, reading materials, self-assessment uh, tools, and online discussions on uh, various topics. Then you have a Swam Prabha, which is a book of 34, digital, 34 TV channels. You have a uh, digitized books available in EPG Parsala, and there are many others 
or lack of time in space or something. Then the, uh, the digital payment platforms has also expanded greatly uh, and pulled, if I recall the numbers correctly, 3 billion, uh, 3 trillion transactions are taking place, uh, uh, or 3 billion transactions are taking place on a monthly basis, uh, uh, probably 3 trillion uh, uh, rupees uh, is the transacted value. So it, Again, it has uh, struck deep root because it's connected with all the banks and various uh, payment platforms like Google Pay, Beam, etc. Ride on it. Then there are um, various ministries, uh, say for example, Agriculture, Financial Services, Criminal Justice System. They have also launched digital initiatives. Now we have a, uh, uh, a call given by our Prime Minister for the Atmanirbhar Bharat, uh, which kind of uh, aims at uh, creating the self-reliance of the country and it, uh, it has within itself the uh, element of the rural areas also trying to uh, become as much self-sufficient as possible. Uh, dispersal of economy, creation of job, all job opportunities and all other things that come. And then uh, various funds like agriculture infrastructure fund, uh, any other uh, similar schemes have been announced which uh, kind of disperse the development. So uh, if there is time then I would uh, like to mention about the uh, CM Smart Gram scheme in Jharkhand, uh, uh, which was conceptualized in 2016. It was a small scheme uh, in that testing waters as to uh, whether we could, using technology, uh, uh, address the development deficits of the area. So the key areas that I have already mentioned by Professor Mr. so I won't uh, mention them again. Uh, user friendly, cost effective, and at cost tech support was the uh, defining parameters. Harnessing innovation, improvisation, and technical competencies of the various uh, partners uh, was the approach being used. Community mobilization and institution building uh, were to be there for uh, sustainable uh, movement forward. Detailed situation analysis was the key. There are many institutions of excellence, uh, they were also to be harnessed uh, in order to make it happen. And uh, progressive PRI leadership uh, was one of the key prerequisites. Uh, I think uh, uh, this will be a uh, key for all such development. So, until unless you have progressive uh, leadership, uh, which uh, is uh, very sensitive and uh, wants to receive uh, ideas about technologies carrying forward his village, uh, his or her village uh, forward uh, the desirable directions. Uh, there would be difficulty in uh, how do we address, how do we educate, how do we uh, sensitize the PRI and local uh, community leadership it will be one of the key challenges. And the, uh, of course, the convergence for development of development in some multiple stakeholders. So I will now come to the last slide of the presentation, which uh, kind of lays down uh, the catalysts uh, which are important for the success of smart village programs. One is the project champions. I mean, we have laid out uh, all the ingredients, but unless there are chefs. Uh, you, won't, you won't have the uh, meal ready. So project champions are extremely important. Supportive PRI leadership is uh, very important because those, those are the gatekeepers to the community and therefore uh, uh, we need supportive PRI leadership. Uh, institutions of excellence and tech, tech ecosystem obviously key. Untied funds for the program would also be important because all the other programs, the programs of the kind that I listed, may not be able to meet uh, the local aspirations and goals and local uh, potential for the utilization of uh, new technologies uh, suited to their needs. So, untied funds is another area. Availability of ICT networks and access devices cannot be overemphasized. Opportunities for people of uh, People who are interested in such areas, uh, uh, 
uh, meeting together, uh, particularly the PRI leadership uh, and the community leadership meeting together and uh, harnessing their energies uh, by working together, seeking the learning best practices from each other, uh, another key area, and supporting state government and district administrations. Again, I, I think uh, the idea that uh, uh, the uh, uh, the at the end of it, uh, report would be prepared uh, for taking uh, these initiatives forward uh, by 2030. Uh, that would be a very key uh, document for all of us because uh, going forward, uh, our ministry should be interested in uh, developing this program. Uh, all the invitees and all the attendees of this workshop. They are partners in this initiative, and uh, their ideas not only uh, through this conference, but they can always connect to me. Uh, I will request the organizers to uh, send um, my, uh, contact details uh, to the participants, others who are interested in organizing. Uh, if there are any questions, I would like to ask them. Otherwise, yeah, thank you, Nagin Sinhaji. Thank you very much for providing a very wonderful perspective of government initiatives. So if we go through all the initiatives, what you have shown, what I can understand is there is no such for government initiative. If we are really able to successfully implement all these initiatives, then there is no need of any sustainable smart village kind of program right now. But where we are likely to the implementation portion, because from government side you are able, you have been creating policies as well as initiatives. But sorry to say that we are not able to implement it the way government is looking for. I think they are only NGOs as well as our technical infrastructure or human resources which is available which I totally can play a really important role because all these initiatives what is there they are technology based but engineers they don't want to go back to the village so I think we have to initiate a program mostly for engineers who are technologists those who are well versed with all these things which can be implemented at village level otherwise we will be uh, showing that these are the initiatives available from Government of India, but there are no people, are there, no human resources available to implement that. With that, I would like to stop here. And I can see there are scores of questions, but I will take one or two. One question is there. These digital concepts seem idle. At the village level, these things have not reached. The same thing what I have told. What does a smart village mean for a government is different from what it means for a village. How can we bridge this gap and take it at grassroots level? So, as I mentioned, uh, the issue of uh, the programs being there uh, is also it's very important uh, for uh, project proponents to put all of these ingredients together and make a good dish, a very palatable dish. So, I think mentioned Puneet uh, that uh, we need to have people, we need to have uh, engineers, social scientists, uh, NGOs, uh, PRI leadership, uh, whichever is savvy towards technology and uh, is conscious of the power of the technology to lead to uh, generations of development, uh, those all people can put all this together uh, and uh, visualize a path in consultation with the communities. Uh, I think uh, the role of local factors, uh, local proponents, uh, in all this together uh, cannot be overemphasized until unless you have uh, such uh, people, such uh, champions coming. Uh, many places uh, developments will happen, but <coughs> their synthesis uh, and interaction uh, 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 good tapestry will not happen. Uh, so, project champions is the key and I invite uh, through your uh,
through you uh, and through this uh, work, forum of this workshop, uh, people who are willing to try out, uh, our ministry will uh, encourage. I will so, take uh, one more question. Uh, How do we disseminate traditional know-how and educate urban India on the importance of biodiversity, traditional medicine, etc., as part of smart village, making cities and urban people smarter as well? You have to live, I think, right? Okay. Uh, you are you are on mute. Uh, so uh, I would have to log off because I have another. Video. Yeah, I I saw that it's three o'clock. Yeah. So I, I okay, think. Okay, so thank you, Jack. Uh, yeah, he he's trying to address that. He can, he can address that question. Very very briefly, uh, the uh, the. Uh, Traditional medicine and traditional technologies are very much welcome, provided uh, they address the developmental issues uh, in the manner that we desire. And uh, I think gender equity or uh, 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 equitable uh, sharing of resources, these are the key. And uh, if traditional medicine, traditional knowledge uh, is able to address them, I, I don't think uh, we should be a side of them. In fact, uh, as you would have seen very clearly from my talk, that uh, I don't uh, wish to rely entirely upon the IT technologies to take the development forward. It's a bouquet of technologies which will take the people forward, and it may come from the traditional sources, it may come from the most modern of the institutions. So I, I think the entire bouquet is welcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your wonderful this being a virtual conference, we are also able to provide you virtual plaque. Physical plaque will be reaching to you very soon. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'm logging off. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank Thanks a lot much. for coming, Nagin. Thank you. Bye. We, we, will, we will work through this document and keep you in loop. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. So after these two plenaries, now we are having the curator of this entire session, Dr. Ashok Das. So it is my privilege to introduce my co-host as well as co-TPP chair of this session, Dr. Das. Just give me a few seconds till my slides are getting uploaded. Kabul. Okay. 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 Yes. So we are going to start now our sustainable smart village workshop. Now we are going to start the voice of the customer session, the village stakeholders, where we are going to have village sarpanches as well as the secretary. I will I will stop here. I will introduce only the moderator of the session, and Dr. Asodas will take over and he will give you the entire perspective. So I will just read out his brief bio for our delegates who don't know him, but he is a very famed person on the Smart Village community. Dr. Das is the founder and CEO of Sun Moksha, with decades of experience with global companies in semiconductor manufacturing, software development, smart microgrids, IoT, renewable energy, smart irrigation, rural electrification, smart villages. He has a decade of hands-on experience as well in working on rural socio-economic development with state-of-the-art technology interventions. Based on his 
on the ground assessment of the issues of rural development he has developed state of the art technology solutions and business models to address these issues his innovations have received several national as well as international awards and applause he is a btech from iit kanpur and phd from university of south california la usa over to you dr das you can take over from thank you thanks a lot trying to get one of my speakers in so chengappa please help uh, uh, ajay singh he will call you okay i have just sent you the message sure Hi. yeah thank you thank you punit thanks for you know holding the fort and uh, thanks for being a co-partner in this crime that we are committing today and uh, i hope that at the end of the day we will be you know defining some actionable points that uh, the ministry is looking forward to that all of us are looking forward to that where do we go and how do we go so we'll uh, you know without any delay we are already 15 20 minutes late so without any delay we'll start with the next session i'll invite uh, my panelists uh, so in the in this session is the voice of the customers and the voice of the customers are people who are working on the ground people who are the beneficiaries people who you know if someone asks that you know government is saying smart village in one way how do the people are seeing the smart village so that is the discussion that will have take place in the first session after that it will followed by a session on you know how do you fund these uh, projects how do we bring eco, you know uh, finances to such village development uh, i know the government is one source but there is uh, there are other ways that can we get this done so we'll have that that session and the last will be that you know we have ecosystem players who are partnering who are working on the ground to take this uh, you know village you know smart village mission forward so we'll hear from universities we'll hear from grassroots enabler organizations that how they see smart villages going forward and after the tea break we will reassemble in the afternoon in the evening to deliberate on what these stakeholders have said what are their views and how can we use all of these collective wisdom to create the vision document that farooq outlined in the beginning that how do we create a road map document so that it can be shared with everybody and we can collectively start working on it so we need a group of people we need many many people to take this agenda forward so may i call mr uh, you know amitav ghosh bhakti sharma Dilip Tripathi, Uttara Narayan, can you please uh, unmute yourself and also switch on your videos? And uh, Vijay Gupta is helping Ajay get in. We can start with Dilip, uh, Dilip Tripathi, or Bhakti Sharma. Hello, Bhakti. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I can. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Bhakti, good. So Bhakti will start first. So we have, you know, you know the rules. You know the. Go ahead. Okay. So um, yeah. Hi. Thank you so much, Shubh Dasji. I was uh, listening to Mr. Farooq Mistry and also to Mr. Uh, Nagendra Ji, Nagendra Sinhaji. He he spoke really good on the um, all the government policies. Um, so as a, sta- a stakeholder, uh, you know, with five and a half years of experience of being a sarpanch, there are some things that I would like to you know um, speak on. So um, you know, when we speak of smart villages. So I'm going to basically give example of the Panchayat of Randi Sarpanch. The Panchayat is Balkhiri Abdullah. It's uh, 16 kilometers from the capital city of Madhya Pradesh, that's Bhopal. Um, so um, you know, and uh, from past five years, we've been actually trying to make it more or less like a smart village, where you know we we have um, digitalization, we have education, um, we have good infrastructure. So when we when me as a person, I would think of a smart village. It's not about infrastructure. 
um, but it is also an ecosystem which constitutes the political aspects, the, the social aspects, the financial aspects. Uh, because um, in the past five years with the government policies on the Panch Parameshwar Yojana or the, the, the money that we get from the Jilla Panchayat, the Janpat, from the Legislative Assembly members or from the Member of Parliament, um, China has been working on infrastructure uh, and more or less we have been successful. Uh, having 14 roads made of 4 crore rupees, um, having 3 check dams and stop dams in our panchayat, um, and uh, these roads with the proper drainage system. Um, then um, uh, panchayat being ODF, now we are working on the community toilets, um, and then housing scheme, uh, job cards, Aishwan Bharat cards. So uh, more or less, when I, when I look at the government policies, these things have been you know, successful. But uh, even when uh, I work on the infrastructure, what I believe has lagged behind not only my panchayat, uh, but, but more or less some 400, 500 uh, more panchayats which I have visited in this tenure, um, you know, I've always faced that there has been a lack of proper planned housing society uh, in Madhya Pradesh, in Chhattisgarh, Rajasthan, Jharkhand, uh, respectively. Um, and then even if we have the housing scheme of the Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana, um, I don't know, it should also include the rainwater harvesting. Um, because I was going through some of the data and some surveys done by uh, the Kerala universities and uh, and also from Tamil Nadu and Karnataka, I got to know that, uh, you know, water storage is still a very big uh, issue when it comes to our, our country. And um, also, you know, uh, one thing that we have been proposing, uh, but hardly, you know, much of the work is not done, it is the lack of the kitchen gardens uh, around the houses is, is something that uh, I also wish to pro propose that this could be done. And um, our panchayat has solar street lights, um, but yes, there's more to be done uh, with ev uh, every single household that they should also have uh, you know, solar uh, lights in their homes. Um, we have been working on drinking water, um, you know, the, the clean drinking water by the Naljal Yojana. We have approximately 1.2 crore rupees on the on the Naljal Yojana, um, and then we have approximately 21 tube wells and 16 hand pumps in our panchayat. Uh, but yes, still, rainwater harvesting is a is a big issue that we we should focus not only uh, at the at the perspective of the homes, but also when I see the farmlands. Um, uh, you know, there, there's, a, there's a strong shortage of water uh, that uh, uh, that we could see. And um, yeah, um, looking forward to also to the storage, um, you know, the, the warehouses, the cold storages, um, is the need of an hour, especially after coming up of the farmer, uh, you know, uh, bill. And uh, also the FPOs being formed in Madhya Pradesh and Rajasthan and Chhattisgarh, exactly in the same way it was formed in Maharashtra. Uh, so um, storage uh, is a very big, um, you know, issue. It's, it's actually a vital thing uh, that needs to be fixed. Um, we, we in our panchayat 12 SSGs, that is the self-help groups under the SRLM and the NRLM. Uh, but uh, you know, g uh, giving them good skill is not an issue because at that point, as uh, even um, you know, one of the hosts said that you know, while speaking to Nagin to sir, that the policies are really good, but we have an issue with the implementation. Yes, indeed, because um, it is still a difficulty uh, for the local products to find a market. I yeah, and yes, the problem is because of lack of digitalization, lack of engineers at the village level, or lack of some kind of a one single platform where which would be applicable across India, where we can have um, the different um, local traditional things in on one single platform or an app or a market, uh, which could be viable not only for the country but yes, uh, for the world as whole. And um, you know when I when I talk of the political aspects, we're doing really good uh, because um, uh, you know when I became the sarpanch, there were hardly you know any gram sabhas that were done. Uh, but yes, continuous discussion with the women, asking them to come out of their comfort zones and trying to break that lopsided system that breaks or that doesn't allow the women to have a spontaneous growth. That, that was something that we tried to hit on, and uh, when when the iron was hot and uh, we were successful. And now is a situation that in our Gram Sabhas, we have more than 60% of the 
who have come to be Gangamas and also one thing that I've learned um, is the Mahila Sabhas, you know. Uh, the government is also focusing on it because Maharashtra was one of the first states that focused on it and today we can all, all proudly say uh, that, you know, our continuous discussions with the women have uh, boosted the kind of the confidence in, in them, one thing. Second, they are also trying to understand that, yes, SAGs are important. Third thing is because the women are now, uh, you know, uh, being one of the stakeholders, they speak with us. So they are the ones who tell us that what kind of the infrastructure is needed, what are the basic facilities that we need in our panchayat, and what places without politicizing those issues. And third thing that I've understood is that the kind of the self-confidence and the capacity building that has happened uh, when the women have started coming in the Gram Sabhas and in the Am Sabhas and the Mahila Sabhas, you know, it has created so many good things. And uh, one of the best things uh, that I have also felt is that uh, across the world, whenever we talk, one thing that comes to everybody's mind is, okay, India is a country where there's so much of caste system and, you know, there are these uh, some traditional suits that have been happening. Um, but yes, once the women are actually included in it, I see that, uh, you know, personally, if I talk of my panchayat in past five years, there's not has been a single case of domestic violence in our panchayat. Second thing is that there's, there's not been a single uh, woman or a man who has been talking on the um on the caste issues uh, and, and I'm, I'm very privileged uh, when I say this because um, you know women have uh, come all together and they're trying to break a lot of stereotypes and they're trying to break those glass ceilings which have come in the way um, and uh, yeah politically I also say uh, that you're good because uh, very recently two weeks back one of these uh, 22 year old girl told me that yes, uh, when next time you're going to have elections I'm sure that I'm also going to contest and Didi you don't contest the election. Um, so yeah, that means I can say that uh, you know there's been a strong uh, independence and a confidence boost up in these women. Um, yeah, and um, and also on the social aspects, I said that we're good because uh, when it comes to the maternal mortality rate, it's zero in and shot. Infant mortality rate, it's zero. We don't have a single child who's malnutrition as of now. Uh, there were six uh, children um, last year. Last year, they were malnutrition, so we took uh, you know. Basically, uh, me and my family and some more, um, uh, you know, some good business people that adopted them. Um, so, uh, as of now, good with it. And uh, yes, I said we hardly have any domestic abuse. Uh, and yes, um, you know, we have been focusing on the girls' side education. Um, it does give me a lot of privilege to say that now there are girls who are preparing for medical. There are girls preparing for one of the girls is a fashion designer on Panchai. And um, and also in the social aspect, uh, uh, one thing that I we focus is the rural urban interaction, uh, where we uh, what's I've said, ki chalo gaon ki or. So we've been focusing on the young boys and girls, and also the ones who have been studying in good colleges and schools in Bhopal. We try to get them to our village uh, for a day, for three days, or for a week, and um, we show them. Uh, how the, uh, you know, the, the village panchayat works, what are the main things in the village panchayat, whether that be the joint family culture, uh, whether that be the ecosystem where women are given high privileges. So these, these are some things that we've been focusing in and out in our panchayat. And um, what didn't work for us, if I would focus, is uh, the medical facilities. Um, somehow it is not working for us. So for that, we have collaborated with uh, two NGOs and two hospitals where every week on Thursday a doctor, a, a, a medical ambulance, a nurse and uh, would come to our village and do a free checkup of everyone. Uh, this was happening uh, till uh, we had this Aishman Bharat card and uh, now we have that for each and every household. So um, still for the, for the smaller issues, uh, we are still working in collaboration with them. We have had free card operations. So these are these uh, one thing that I would really want everyone to understand is that the community engagement is something that has been a key role uh, on which I focused when uh, I became the Sarpanch. Uh, for the education, we, uh, yeah, that one thing that did not work is that uh, our school is only till eight, and uh, and we, uh, the girls and the boys travel 4.7 kilometers to uh, you know go up to 12th education. So um, we have very recently, last month, in collaboration with CII, YI, Bhopal chapter, we have uh, incorporated a, a smart TV in our panchayat uh, for the kids due to the COVID session because they're not, you know, going to their schools. Um, Thank you. Yeah, Bhakti, we'll have to close. So.
uh, yeah, we are also running short of time. So, uh, 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 can you can you see my slide? To share my. Yes, we can see that. Yeah. Sorry. So uh, I I didn't have the host uh, keys. I forgot to introduce all of you. So Bhakti is one of the youngest sarpanches in India. And uh, uh, she's uh, well, uh, you know, well regarded in this small village. And uh, she took up the challenge of development by getting into the government and saying that, okay, we make it happen through the government. Um, similarly, we have another uh, speaker, Dilip Tripathi, a very young, dynamic guy from UP, and he has uh, done wonderful jobs, wonders in his village, small village at the upper north part of. Uh, uh, Uttar Pradesh. Uh, we have Ajay Singh, who is from Jharkhand, and uh, he is one of the five uh, Smart Panchayat Yojana uh, recipients, award winners, uh, and he has been to trying to bring changes in his villages or his panchayat, a uh, petawar in uh, Bukaro, Jharkhand. Uh, after th that, will be followed by another stalwart in village development and giving this, you know. Uh, perspective from the village that is Amitabha Ghosh. And he has been in the village, he has been on the grounds for more than two decades. And he will share his perspective that what is the voice of the customers. And last but not least, we have Uttara, who is working with a lot of uh, women in the village in Karnataka and trying to change their lives on the ground. So with this, uh, huge variety of speakers on our panel. I'll invite Dilip Tripathi next to speak about his work, what has worked, what is, what are the challenges, and how he thinks we can all work collaboratively to move forward. Dilip? Dilip Tripathi? Is the Lipter party there? She was there. Okay. Uh, is Ajay here? Ajay Singh? Ajay Singh? All right. Uh, sir, he has connected and was promoted, uh, but intermittently got dropped off. Uh, so you can just promote him to okay. the panelist. I see him on the. I can't do this. Okay. Yeah. Joined in back sure. again. And is Dilip here? Dilip was on the panel, right? Yes, yes. I had promoted him, but I am not seeing now uh, him now. Okay. So in the meantime, we'll get started with uh, Amitav. He's there. So Amitav Ghosh, the floor is yours. Amitav. Amitav Ghosh. Can you unmute yourself? Amitav? Okay. <laughs> now it's a rule. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, and now we can hear you. Go ahead. Go ahead, Amitav. Uh, can you switch on your video? Uh -huh. Yeah, hello. Who is this? No, I don't have time. I'm in a conference. Con Amita, you, we saw your video a few minutes ago. I don't know what has happened nothing. now. It was showing, but then it is gone. Now it is okay. Let's so, let's go ahead. Let's continue then. Uh scene is keep uh my bangla uh Hindi me bolu ya angri me bolna bolu. Aapko jisme bolna. Hindi a chala hai Hindi bolu. If Ajay is there, to main Hindi me bolna jaun. Ajay is there. Ajay ji hai na. Hindi bolna toh main samal. Hindi bolna toh main samal. Aap boli. 
सो ऐसा है कि हम लोग देखते हैं जब हम मैं झारखंड से हूँ और झारखंड का ट्राइबल एरिया में काम करने का अनुभव में हम लोग ये देखते हैं कि यहाँ का सुबह जो शुरू होती है वो एकदम अर्ली मॉर्निंग गांव के महिलाएं जो है वो लकड़ी लाने के लिए चली जाती है दूर एंड इट इज ऑलमोस्ट डेली प्रैक्टिस जो ओवरलोड दे कम बैक और इस पोर्शन में उनके समय भी जाते हैं क्वालिटी टाइम भी जाते हैं फैमिली के लिए उनके हाउस होल्ड के लिए प्लस उनके इकोनॉमिक एक्टिविटी के लिए फिर भी वो सपने देखते हैं और इन सपनों में बच्चे के बच्चे को बड़ा करना लड़कियों को पढ़ाना सब कुछ आता है और और भी एक आता है इम्पोर्टेंट इशू कि उनका इनकम कैसे बढ़ेगा ताकि उनको बाहर चंडीगढ़ मुंबई या बैंगलोर जाना नहीं पड़े और कोविड के बाद तो ये सिचुएशन और ज्यादा बढ़ गया कि लोग घरों में रह के कैनो हेयर मी यस यस गो हेड सो ये हम लोग देख रहे थे और समझ भी रहे थे जिस समय सेंट्रल ग्रुप लेके काम हो रहा था आज से 20 साल पहले एस डी एस वाई के अंडर में उस समय भी हम लोग रूरल डेवलपमेंट की बात कर रहे थे आज के दिन भी बात कर रहे हैं और नरेगा आ गया पीडीएस आ गया विधवा पेंशन आ गया लेकिन गांव बढ़ेगा कैसे गांव का डेवलपमेंट कैसे होगा इसका एक कॉम्प्रेहेंसिव आइडिया हम लोगों के पास आ नहीं रहा था तो हम लोगों ने गांव वाले से ही बात करना शुरू किया था अशोक नोज अशोक खुद भी उस विजिट में रहे हैं एंड भक्ति जो इशू पर बात कर रहे थे वाटर कंजर्वेशन का हम लोग गांव में पहला काम शुरू किए थे उसी से कि वाटर कंजर्वेशन कैसे होगा तो उसमें हम लोग ये काटा सोला गांव जहां हम लोग ये काम करने पहुंचे उसमें सबसे मजेदार चीज हम लोग जो देखे कि पानी जैसे ही जुगाड़ हुआ तो लोग आके बैठने लगे कि हम क्या खेती और कर सकते हैं क्या खेती कर सकते हैं तो उन्होंने खेती में पहले सिर्फ धान करते थे वो सरसों और दलहन भी करने लगे लेकिन इससे उनका कोई बड़ा समाधान नहीं हुआ वो लोग हम लोग जो हॉर्टिकल्चर का काम किए थे लोग आके बोलने लगे नींबू दादा बिक्री नहीं हो रहा है उसके पहले ही जमीन पे गिर के सर जा रहा है आम ले जाना मुश्किल हो रहा है बाजार में दादा आम बचा के रख नहीं पा रहे सो नाउ द क्वेश्चन इज ये प्रोडक्शन होने पर भी हमें और कुछ कमियां आ रही है अर्थात हम गांव वालों को प्रोडक्शन एनहांसमेंट के लिए तो कन्विंस कर लिए लेकिन क्या हम उनको एक विलेज डेवलपमेंट के कॉन्सेप्ट में ला पा रहे हैं देन वी स्टार्टेड आइडेंटिफाइंग प्रॉब्लम कहाँ है प्रॉब्लम कहाँ है ये जब हम लोग देखना शुरू किए तो इसमें हमारे लिए बड़ा सबसे ज्यादा प्रॉब्लम आया कि काश अगर हमारे पास इलेक्ट्रिसिटी होता और हमारे पास कोल्ड स्टोरेज होता तो ये जो साग सब्जी टमाटर नींबू आम है ये हमारा वेस्ट नहीं होता काश अगर हमारे पास एक अच्छा सील्ड स्टोर हाउस होता तो हमारा मुआ करंज शाल इमली इसको चूहा खाके बर्बाद नहीं कर दिए होते तो हमारे लिए पॉइंट डिफरेंट आने लगा इश्यूज डिफरेंट आने लगा और हम लोग को ये लगा कि स्टोरेज फॉर पेरिसेबल प्रोडक्ट्स एग्रीकल्चरल एंड हॉर्टिकल्चर ट्रांसपोर्टेशन एंड सेल्स ये जो अकेला फार्मर करता है तो शायद कुछ कॉमन फैसिलिटी अगर तैयार किया जाए एंड ये प्रोडक्शन तो तुम करो लेकिन अगर हम स्टोरेज प्रोक्योरमेंट एक जन कॉमन फैसिलिटी में करते हैं ट्रांसपोर्टेशन कॉमन फैसिलिटी में करते हैं तो शायद इम्प्रूवमेंट हो सकता है इनके जो आप समय वेस्टेज होता है अर्थात एक फार्मर एक औरत 30 किलोमीटर तक पैदल चल के अपना टमाटर साग भिंडी लेकर पहुंचते हैं शहर या मुफसिल के मार्केट में और लौटने के बाद और क्या करेगी फैमिली के लिए 
अगेन नेक्स्ट मॉर्निंग उसको जाना है नेक्स्ट मॉर्निंग और नहीं जाना है तो खेत में जाना है देन वी केम टू ए थॉट एंड यूनाइटेडली हम लोग एक जगह में आए गांव वाला हम लोग और डॉक्टर अशोक दास ये भी पहुंच गए कुछ टी एस जी पी एल कंपनी के लोग पहुंचे सब लोग इस बारे में कंसर्न थे कंसर्न थे हमारा डिप्टी कमिश्नर ईस्ट सिंह मुंबई इस स्थिति में जब हम लोग पूरा चीज को देखें तो हम लोग को लगा कि सबसे पहले यहाँ पे इलेक्ट्रिसिटी चाहिए इलेक्ट्रिसिटी वैसा इलेक्ट्रिसिटी नहीं जो खाली एक बीस वाट या तीस वाट का बल्ब जले इलेक्ट्रिसिटी ऐसा चाहिए जिससे हमारे पंप से पानी आए हमारा गेहूं या दाल को हम प्रोसेस कर सके हमारा अगर मसाला उगा रहे तो उसको कर सके तो ये सारे काम हमें दरकार है दरकार ये भी है कि एक छोटा सा कोल्ड स्टोरेज भी गांव में रहे दरकार ये भी है कि एक रेफ्रिजरेटर भी चले जिसमें पशुओं का दवाई आदमी का इमरजेंसी दवाई हम लोग रख सके एक एटीएम भी चले जिसमें जब पैसे दरकार हो तब चले लोग ये भी सोचने लगे टिकट काटने के लिए हमें बाहर जाना पड़ता है दादा क्या हमारे यहाँ एक कंप्यूटर कम, सेंटर हो सकता है जहाँ पे हमारा टिकट काट सकते हैं ट्रेन का क्या हम लोग आधार कार्ड ऑपरेशन करा सकते हैं क्या हमारे यहाँ एक पॉस मशीन एटीएम मशीन चालू हो सकता है सो ड्रीम्स स्टार्टेड कमिंग इन एंड दीज ड्रीम्स कंपालेशन ऑफ दीज ड्रीम्स आर smart village concept for us i would like to stop here if anybody has any question uh, they can share and otherwise there are a lot of issues where i can uh, do some segmented ideas but ab tak itna hi mai bolna chahta hu thank you thank you uh, uh, thank you amita i know you have been on the ground for for such a long time and uh, we will continue to use your input in the road maps that we develop you know together we have developed the jharkhand smart panchayat now we have to take this role uh, you know model to the other parts as well so must must identify the you know the gaps uh, i invite now i invite uh, ajay singh ji ajay singh mukhya from petewar jharkhand अजय जी आप सुन रहे हैं हाँ आपकी आवाज आ रही है बताइए जी सभी को नमस्कार प्रणाम नमस्कार मैं अजय कुमार सिंह पेट्रोवार बोकारो झारखंड से स्मार्ट पंचायत जो पांच गांव जो चुने गए थे हालांकि चुने नहीं गए थे ये कंपटीशन वेस पे विजेता हो गए थे पांच गांव कोई मर्सी पे नहीं मिला है स्मार्ट विलेज का जो लेवल लगा है वो मर्सी पे नहीं है कंपटीशन पे है हर लोगों ने कंपटीशन फेस करके अचीवमेंट हासिल किया है ये लेकिन ये 2016 की बात है 2016 आज संजोग है कि आज ही के दिन का बात है 2016 में आज के ही दिन में चयन हुआ था पांच पंचायतों का उसमें मेरा एक पंचायत था लेकिन हम ज्वाइन नहीं कर पाए इस मीटिंग में पहले मैं ज्वाइन नहीं कर पाया था लिंक प्रॉब्लम के कारण में बाद में अभी अभी ज्वाइन किया मैं बहुत सुन नहीं पाया हाँ ठीक है अजय जी कोई बात नहीं आप आप जस्ट कंटिन्यू कि आपके क्या 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 आपका क्या लर्निंग्स है आपने क्या समझा क्या काम किया क्या नहीं किया मैं उसमें रहा हूँ दो हजार सोलह से लेकर के अभी तक दो साल चार साल बीत गए स्मार्ट uh, पंचायत का जो कंसेप्ट था और वो ब्यूरोक्रेसी में ब्यूरोक्रेसी के कारण मैं स्पष्ट रूप से कहना चाहूंगा कि हम आज एक भी कदम आगे नहीं बढ़ पाए हैं और एक तरह से अभी दो साल का जो अभी हमारा एक्सटेंशन मिला है समय का और पांच तारीख को ही हम लोगों को देना था डेबीआर बना करके हम मैं तो आभारी हूँ अमिताभ भैया का अमिताभ घोष भैया का उन्होंने कहा था कि अजय जी मैं आपके लिए मैं फ्री ऑफ कॉस्ट बनाऊंगा लेकिन फ्री ऑफ कॉस्ट बनाने की आवश्यकता नहीं डी पी आर उसके लिए सरकार ने लिया है तो आप उसमें हम लोग बात करेंगे लेकिन जिला वाले जो है जिला के जो टीम है वो एक्सेप्ट करने के लिए तैयार नहीं है वो ईगो ईगो पाल करके रखे हुए हैं कि मुखिया बनाएगा वो जो काम जिला का है जो काम डी का है वो मुखिया क्यों करेगा और उसके सहयोगी लोग क्यों करेंगे तो अभी एक कदम जिला भी आगे नहीं बढ़ पाई है और अगर यही रवैया रहा तो 
निश्चित रूप से मैं कह सकता हूं कि आने वाला जो दो साल है वो भी जिला के भरोसे अगर हम लोग रहे तो वो कुछ नहीं हो पाएगा इसके बाद अगर रांची की भी मीटिंग होती है तो मैं वहां पर स्पष्ट रूप से कहना चाहूंगा जाकर के वो मैं मैं लिख करके देने के लिए तैयार हूँ कि या तो जिला को बीच से हटा दो मुखिया जब फॉर्म जब फिलअप किए थे उस समय जिला नहीं था अभी जिला कहाँ से आ गया और वो जिला आ गया तो भी कोई बात नहीं है कोई आगे कोई आदमी आकर के पूरे झारखंड से नहीं पूरे इंडिया से इंडिया से नहीं पूरे दुनिया से कोई आकर के मेरे पंचायत को स्मार्ट बनाने में अगर सहयोग करता है तो मैं तो उसका स्वागत करता हूँ लेकिन अगर कोई इन्वॉल्व होकर के और काम आगे बढ़ाने के बजाय वो पीछे की ओर लेके जाएगा तो मैं चैलेंजेस हैं और उन चैलेंज उन चैलेंजेस को हमें यू नो ओवरकम करना है हमें उसको संभाल देखना है और हम लोग इसीलिए ये यू नो ये ये गोष्ठी हुई है कि हम उसका समाधान खोज सके राइट हम आपस में मिलके इसका समाधान खोजेंगे कैसे इनको आगे बढ़ाया जाए तो धन्यवाद आप आपके विचारों के लिए अभी वी आर स्टिल वेटिंग फॉर दिलीप सो इन द मीन टाइम मे आई इन्वाइट उत्तरा टू प्लीज शेयर हर थॉट्स उत्तरा इज द को फाउंडर ऑफ बाजूमैन एंड शी हैज बीन वर्किंग ऑन द ग्राउंड इन द इन दू नो रूरल एरियाज ऑफ कर्नाटका ऑन द लाइवलीहुड एंड अदर इश्यूज फॉर वुमेन उत्तरा प्लीज Thank you, uh, Ashok. Uh, it's indeed an honor to be part of this uh, panel and to be able to share our thoughts. So I will I will hand over the speaker's uh, baton to you. Okay, just one minute. 
Are you showing the presentation? No, you can, you I, can uh, show it. You can show it. I'm just giving you the control. Uh, just a second. Just, I don't have it open yet. Oh, I can open it then. So if you showing. want. So I just. I can do it. Not a problem. I, um, I feel this uh, session has been uh, interesting to hear other as well. And you can, you can that, uh, switch out the yeah. video, then the bandwidth may be a bit less, uh, better. Sure, yeah. sure. Share, share your presentation. Right. You're sharing your presentation, right? Uh, I'm not even to the share button is uh, muted. No, now you yes. can. You uh, go yes, click on share and you will be. Yeah. Yes. Are you able to see this? Yes, please. Yes. Um, so, but women, we equip underserved women with knowledge, skills, and opportunities at their doorstep to find sustainable solutions and to live a life of dignity and self-reliance. Um, if you see the underlined words, we actually are a capability-building organization. Um, our NGO for the past eight years has been working in Karnataka, in the south of Karnataka. And we do this at the doorstep of the women. So it is very important. So we've been calling it micro-education like how microcredit or finance reaches the doorstep, we also want to reach the doorstep of the women so that their uh, responsibilities that they feel around their household and for themselves, they don't compromise on that. Um, and for us, it's important that the self-reliance or the resilience is built. Um, and we realize that that's what the women also want. Um, the path that we take, and this sort of explains the entire work that we do. So we actually have a van. Um, you can call it a bus or a van that goes to the villages. We do a simple training, a two half day session around financial management, entrepreneurship and personal development. What we realized was before talking about sustainability, empowerment, leadership, etc., it's important for the women to, uh, to look at things that they believe in, right? Or they need at that moment. And for a lot of them, it is about finances and management of that finance. Um, of course, all of them ask for money first, but once they realize that it's the management of money, which is the problem, and not really the access of money. Um, that's what we focus on. And among these women, on day two of the training, we ask them to identify a local uh, woman among themselves uh, to become an anchor. We call her an anchor, community anchor. In the local language, we call her a galati. Galati meaning a sati or a sakhi. And she becomes the coach uh, for the rest of the community. For this anchor, we have an inspiration fellowship and we don't call it training we call it fellowship because we bring 10 anchors or 15 anchors from a certain panchayat together and we channelize their energy and skills and we nurture that to becoming community change agents the realization that firstly um, uh, behavioral change is long term it takes a long time and you also need somebody to nudge you uh, over a period of time um, we also have a digital app which has information audio video uh, written content, which the women can use. Uh, but please note that in the areas that we are present, only 35% of the women have smartphones, which means that not all of them are able to use it. They some, sometimes share the information, uh, but we are building this platform also with the belief. Um, I think Nagindraji also mentioned that there is a, a push towards digital, and we also believe that towards probably a five-year period time, all of them will have access to it, and we want to be ready. Uh, so that they can have the uh, information um, in their own hands. Um, moving forward, uh, buzz beehives. These are uh, beehives within the community. Uh, among these women that are created, and the anchor woman sort of brings them together uh, for personal, professional, uh, societal, community problem solving. Uh, the belief that if they come together and have dialogues and conversations, that they're able to solve those problems. We're also basing this on peer consulting, that women can consult with each other to solve their problems. Um, a newer initiative that we started recently, Buzz Green, is about awareness on climate change and what are the climate actions that they can take. Um, um, in, at, at, and again, this is in their doorstep. This includes what um, um, Bhakti Ji talked about in terms of the vegetable garden, or it could be about rainwater harvesting. It could be about the bunds that they can create in their village, uh, in their farm. Uh, the idea is that the information is readily available, and also there are champions or motivators for this climate action. 
um, at a micro level. Uh, so we are not talking at the macro policy level, but day to day living and how that can be done uh, in at the village level. Uh, we also have a program on bus business, which is around connecting them to markets. And I think um, uh, uh, Bhakti ji again spoke about how market is a challenge. It is a huge challenge. Uh, but one of the things that we are working on is creating cluster enterprises and enabling the women to look at local production for local consumption. A lot of, we are finding that almost 70% of the products that they consume today are coming from outside of the village or the panchayat or the taluk level. Can we reverse that where locally they are able to produce and they are consuming it locally also, which also means the market problem gets resolved. But this also means mapping. So we do a lot of mapping along with the community on what are the local resources available, uh, how they can make use of those local resources and what are the what are the skills that is available locally to be able to produce the local goods. Um, and the belief is that in this path, the way it goes, that we that will be empowered communities with women influencers. Um, as you can see that we are very much focused on the women. Uh, becoming the influencers and leaders in their community. Again, believing that they have been marginalized and they have been underserved till now and they didn't have the opportunity. Also because there is a skew in a way the world is thinking right now because there are probably more masculine energy uh, in terms of thinking, in terms of leadership, in terms of taking decisions. So we believe that if more women come forward, that can be balanced uh, with the feminine thinking and nurturing. So if you look at the empowerment bit, there are four aspects that we look at. We're looking at economic empowerment, ecological empowerment, social empowerment, and also psychological empowerment. The belief is that it has to be holistic. You cannot look at only one aspect and it's not linear. It is not that you'll do economic first, then something else, and then something else, because um, that's what has brought the world to what it is today. We believe that we have to look at all the aspects of it and to nurture it continuously. The journey is different. Every village uh, might take a different journey. Every village, every woman is unique. Every family is unique. We need to give that space or we need to provide that space, not give, provide that space where they can think about, okay, where am I at that journey and what is it that I need to focus on right now? Um, and in this journey and in this process, what we have taken, uh, we've been able to reach around 2.25 lakh women in the past eight years. Um, we have been uh, honored uh, with community anchors, uh, around 3,600 of them, who have been part of this journey now. Um, if you look at the statistics here, it is very, very skewed towards the economics, because that is what we have been able to measure easily. We, have, we are still struggling to measure the confidence, the psychological aspects, um, and the, the social connect aspects. So we know that there are women who have been able to solve community issues by com coming together, Women are claiming that they are feeling more self-confidence now. Uh, so this is, again, something that we are working on, something called a Women Empowerment Index, to look at what are the holistic aspects that we need to look at for women to, um, to be able to measure their own journey. Um, so the lessons for the future, we believe that this is something that is needed for a smart, sustainable village. Uh, we need to build those steps. Okay, those step capability building is important. A bottom up approach where the community is involved in the process and the women are also chief influencers and the dialogue creators in their own community. Um, as we enable social capital and to bring in this a little more, there are self help groups and uh, uh, I mean, self help group has been around for 25, 30 years now. Definitely a very, very key to this process of creating smart villages. The only issue there is it's becoming very transactional now. The self-help groups are looking at only, you know, saving money, taking loans and business and things like that. We need to actually um, enable the idea of becoming like a social capital, like how money is a capital that even uh, each other, the, the, the psychological support and the social support or the community together itself a capital in itself. And of course, to focus on the holistic development, which is economic, psychological, social, and ecological. Um, to bring back, um, I think, what the conversation has been with the speakers till now, see, all the infrastructure in the world will not make any change if the human attitude and behavior is not broadened. So I think we need to also work on that aspect and, and, and the government and other organizations, everybody is working a lot on the infrastructural aspect um, and the technological aspect. 
But somewhere we need to look at it a little more holistically and also look at the behavioral, the trust building aspect, because no social change can happen without trust being built. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, I'll Great. stop now. Great. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks for, uh, you know, you know, your last point about, you know, human empowerment. How do we change the attitude? How do we change the behavior? That is one key component. And uh, in the evening, in the afternoon, you will hear, uh, you know, you'll hear from a few speakers how they are able to uh, go and make that happen. Uh, I'd like to compliment uh, the lady who just spoke. Uh, yes, sure. I think uh, what you have identified here in six slides is absolutely outstanding. And uh, uh, we could, uh, I would love to invite you to participate in putting the report together. Uh, the idea of enabling, uh, enabling social capital, the idea of focus on holistic development, the notion of uh, the Women Empowerment Index to see how progress is made, because we need to have these sorts of industries and met, uh, metrics. So, Uthara, uh, yeah. I am very uh, touched by your presentation and the way in which you've gone about it. And I'd like uh, very much for you to think in terms of being an active participant in writing this report. It will be an Thank honor. You. It will be an honor, uh, Ms. Mistrick. It will be definitely an honor. So please do please do add me into the loop of whenever you have this conversation further. Would love to contribute. It Thank starts you. tonight. It starts today evening. So be there. <laughs> yes, right. yes, of course. I'm here. I'm, yes. here. I'm here. Yeah. So you we will we will definitely chart chart you chart you in. Uh, our next speaker, uh, I will invite uh, Mr. Dilip Tripathi. Dilip ji, can you up uh, sun sakte hai mujhe? Dilip ji, unmute karenge? Ha, namaskar. Uh, aap abhi kaha, kao se hi bol rahe hai? Ha, daum hai hai sir abhi. बहुत अच्छी बात है तो जैसे जैसे आपसे बात हुई थी हमारी कि आप यू नो आप कई सालों से वहां पे गांव गांव में कर रहे हैं आपने कुछ चीजें की जो सफल हुआ कुछ चीजें की जो सफल नहीं हुआ आपको आपको बाधाएं आई तो यदि आप हम सबों से वो यू नो शेयर कर सकते हैं तो बहुत अच्छा रहेगा मेरी ग्राम पंचायत दिसंबर 2015 में नई ग्राम पंचायत के रूप में गठन हुआ इससे पहले मैं क्योंकि बाहर रहता था अपने गांव से करीब 2005 में बिजनेस के पढ़ाई के और बिजनेस के लिए मैं बाहर गया फिर अपने गांव आना जाना बहुत कम होता था गांव में विकास के लिए जो भी पैसा आता था क्योंकि प्रधान वो जानकारी के भाव में या उसको कहाँ कैसा क्या खर्च करना है वो लोग खर्च नहीं करते थे बेकार के कामों में वो लोग यूज कर देते थे या कागज में सिर्फ पैसा खर्चा हो रहा था पर 2015 में गांव में जब चुनाव हुआ तो गांव के लोगों ने मुझे पहली बार गांव का प्रधान चुना उसमें मैंने डिसाइड किया कि मैं अपने गांव को एक ऐसा गांव बनाऊंगा जिसमें सुविधाएं सब शहर की होंगी लेकिन मेरा गांव गांव ही रहेगा उसके लिए सबसे पहले मैंने अपने गांव का जीआईएस मैपिंग किया क्योंकि तो गाँव में जो सबसे बड़ी समस्या होती है वो होती है जमीन का लोगों को यही नहीं पता रहता कि मेरी जमीन कहाँ है खेत कितना है और तालाब कहाँ है सरकारी लैंड क्या है और इससे उनको काफी समस्याएं तहसील और जिलों की टक्कर काटने पड़ते हैं पूरे जिले गांव का मैंने जीआईएस मैपिंग के माध्यम से डाटा कलेक्ट किया कि कितने मेरे गांव में कितने चक रोड हैं कितने चक नालियां हैं जीएस लैंड कितने हैं तालाब कितने हैं उसके बाद मैंने एक मास्टर प्लान बनाया कि इन तालाब से तालाब हमारे यहाँ है तो उस तालाब को हम मनरेगा के माध्यम से खुदाई करा के उसमें मछली पालन का व्यवसाय कर सकते हैं नाले जो हमारे यहाँ हैं उन पर भी हम चेक डैम बना के या उसकी खुदाई करा के रेन हार्वेस्टिंग सिस्टम के रूप में वाटर लेवल मेंटेन करने के लिए यूज कर सकते हैं या मछली के तालाब मछली पालन के लिए पट्टे पे दे सकते हैं जिससे रेवेन्यू भी बढ़ेगा गांव का इसके अलावा गांव में कौन कौन से चीजें ऐसे हों जो हमारे गाँव की ज्यादातर आबादी मुंबई दिल्ली में रहती है करीब थर्टी आबादी बाहर पलायन करके लोग बाहर में अपने रोजी रोजगार के चक्कर में रहते थे सबसे बड़ी समस्या जो आज गाँव की है वो है पलायन की उसको देखते हुए मैंने अपने गांव में ही लोगों को कि किस तरीके से गांव में ही लोगों को रोजगार उपलब्ध हो और उनको कैसे कैसे हम यहां से और शहर की दूरी को मिटा पाए 
उसके लिए गांव में ही हमने सबसे पहले बकरी पालन का लोगों को आइडिया दिया बकरी पालन लोगों को शुरुआत कराया नगदी फसल के रूप में सब्जी की खेती की शुरुआत कराई जहां लोग धान गेहूं परंपरागत खेती किया करते थे जिससे उनको बीघे में माने उनको मैंने समझाया कि आप एक एकड़ में तीस से चालीस हजार कमाते हो लेकिन अगर आप नगदी फसल करो सब्जी की खेती करो औषधीय खेती करिए तो आपको उसी एक एकड़ में एक लाख से लेकर डेढ़ लाख तक तक कमाई हो सकती है इसके अलावा जो गांव में डेवलपमेंट के लिए मैंने टेक्नोलॉजी का यूज किया जो पूरे गांव में वाईफाई हमने दिया सात हाट को स्पॉट लगा के पूरे गांव को वाईफाई जोन में कन्वर्ट किया है तेईस सीसीटीवी कैमरे लगाए पूरे गांव में जिससे पूरे गांव में मैं गंदगी से लेके कोई चोरी या महिलाओं के साथ छेड़खानी ये सब न होने पाए उस पर मॉनिटरिंग करता हूँ और जो सबसे नया हमने प्रयोग किया अपने गाँव में पब्लिक एड्रेस सिस्टम का क्योंकि गाँव में जो सबसे बड़ी समस्या है सरपंच और जो गांव के लोग रहते हैं उनके बीच में एक दूरी रहती है लोग डरते हैं कि इनके पास जाऊंगा बात करूंगा क्या है कैसे नहीं उस दूरी को मिटाने के लिए मैंने हर दूसरे पोल पे पब्लिक एड्रेस सिस्टम लगवाए जिसके माध्यम से मैं सरकार की सारी योजनाएं सुबह शाम प्रसारित होती हैं जिससे खुली बैठक होनी होती है उसमें भी मैं अनाउंस करता हूँ की आज खुली बैठक है आज राशन का वितरण होना है तो गाँव के आधे किलोमीटर दूर खेत में भी लोगों को स्प्राई पड़ता है और हंड्रेड लोगों तक ये बात पहुंचती है की आज गाँव में ये अधिकारी आने वाले हैं या आज गांव में पटवारी आ रहा है गांव में आज पंचायत सेक्रेटरी आ रहा है तो जो पहले लोग तहसील और ब्लॉक के चक्कर लगाते थे वो दूरी कम हो गई अब उनको जिले पे मैंने गांव में ही वो लोग आने लगे तो उनको सुविधाएं मिलने लगी इसके अलावा एक हमने पंचायत भवन भी हमारे गाँव में बना हुआ है जिसको उसमें सारी फैसिलिटी वीडियो कॉन्फ्रेंसिंग से लेकर लाइब्रेरी और डिजिटल लाइब्रेरी भी है इसमें आई एस से लेके और सारी तैयारियों के किताब के हमारे यहाँ स्कूल स्कूल के बच्चों को और यहाँ पंचायत में उपलब्ध है सबसे बड़ी समस्या थी एजुकेशन का सरकारी स्कूल जो था वो उसमें बहुत कम बच्चे आते थे ज्यादातर बच्चे कॉन्वेंट में पढ़ते थे उसके लिए सब मैंने स्कूल पे पहले ध्यान दिया और उसको मॉडर्न तरीके से जैसे कॉन्वेंट स्कूल होता है उस तरीके से उसको कन्वर्ट किया और आज वहाँ हमारे स्कूल में पोजीशन है कि सोलह बच्चे सरकारी कर्मचारियों के पढ़ते हैं जो स्कूल में जिससे हमारे जो आंगनबाड़ी है आशा बहू है जितने टीचर हैं वो भी अपने बच्चों को यहाँ पढ़ाते हैं जिससे गांव वालों का विश्वास बढ़ा कि नई सरकारी स्कूलों में भी बहुत अच्छी पढ़ाई होती है हर कमरे में यहाँ स्मार्ट क्लास लगा हुआ है प्राइमरी सेक्शन हमारा जो है यूपी का पहला ऐसा विद्यालय है जो पूर्णिया वातानुकूलित हमारा विद्यालय है सड़कों के किनारे हमने वृक्षारोपण कराया है गाँव में करीब डेढ़ नीम के पेड़ है हर घर के सामने नीम का पेड़ आपको मिलेगा जिससे पर्यावरण का भी है इसके अलावा करीब छह हेक्टेयर वृक्षारोपण हमने जो जीएस लैन था खाली करा के उस पर वृक्षारोपण भी कराया समूह भी गठन हमारे गांव में पांच समूह है जो जिसके माध्यम से महिलाओं को रोजगार देने का हमने एक प्रयास किया है मनरेगा के माध्यम से अभी हमने ओपन जिम भी बनवाया है गांव में समूह सेट भी है और बकरी सेट भी गाँव में बन रहे बने हुए हैं लोगों को हर्बल पार्क का भी मनरेगा से हमारे गाँव में निर्माण हुआ है इसके अलावा एक ऐसा पुल भी हमने मनरेगा से बनवाया जिस पुल को बनाने के लिए सरकार एक से सवा करोड़ रुपया लगा लग रहा था सरकार का उसको मैंने मनरेगा के ही माध्यम से मात्र अठारह लाख रुपए में बनवाया वो पुल गांव में पूर, पूरी तरीके से अंडरग्राउंड नालियां हैं चालीस डस्टबिन लगे हुए हैं जिसमें डोर टू डोर हम कूड़ा कलेक्शन होता है गाँव की हर गली कोई भी गली ऐसी नहीं है जो पक्की ना प्योर ब्लॉक से बनी हुई है गांव की जो मेन समस्या थी हमारे यहाँ रोड की थी वो रोड का भी सोल्यूशन निकल गया इस साल टेंडर हो गया है अब हमारे गांव को जहाँ तेरह किलोमीटर की दूरी घट के तीन किलोमीटर स्टेट हाईवे से जुड़ जाएगा यहाँ पे इसके अलावा जो गांव की कलाकृतियां हैं वो गांव के हर दीवार पे आपको गाँव के अलग अलग कलाकृतियां जो पहले कैसे खेती किसानी करते थे और कैसे महिलाएं आटा पीसती थी आज भूखों के हमारे आने वाली पीढ़ी आदि रख पाएगी वो सब भी हमने गांव पूरे पिन कराया हुआ है जो हर दीवार आपको एक कुछ कुछ मैसेज देते नजर आएगी जैसे गांव में आप इंट्री करेंगे तो एक दीवार पे आपको आर्मी से रिलेटेड सारे लोगों का रहेगा कि जैसे कारगिल विजय कैसे हो सेना में तीनों सेनाओं के लिए सर्जिकल स्ट्राइक का तो वो एक अलग अलग दीवार पे लोग जाते हैं तो उनको एक कुछ ना कुछ मैसेज मिलता है दीवार से अब गांव में अधिकतर लोग अब बाहर शहर छोड़ के गांव में ही रहना पसंद कर रहे हैं क्योंकि सुविधाएं सब सारी चीजें यहां पे उनको उपलब्ध हैं अभी शुद्ध पेयजल ना होने नाते काफी दिक्कत हो रही थी तो गांव में ही हमने आर प्लांट भी लगाया है और पांच रुपए में बीस लीटर गांव के लोगों को पानी उपलब्ध पानी उपलब्ध कराया जाएगा
बहुत अच्छे और ये हम लोग अभी एक यू नो आपसे जैसे बात हुई थी हम लोग उस डॉक्यूमेंट में काम कर रहे हैं एक रोड मैप बनाने के लिए कि आगे कैसे हो हम सब मिलके कैसे काम करें तो आशा है आप हमारा साथ देंगे और यू नो उस उसमें अपना यू नो अपना योगदान देंगे और उसको उसको आगे बढ़ाएंगे तो बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया आपका हमसे बात करने के लिए और अभी ये सेशन और चलेगा तो गुजारिश है आप सबों से कि आप लोग रहिए यहीं पे एंड आगे सुनिए कि आगे क्या हो रहा है सो लाइक वी डेड इन इन वेरियस अदर इन प्रीवियस सेशन तो इट्स अ वर्चुअल कॉन्फ्रेंस आई वुड लाइक टू थैंक ईच ऑफ आवर पैनलिस्ट एट दिस टाइम एंड द so thank you very much and uh, we will send you these physical you know plaques uh, you know as and when possible but thank you utara thank you bhakti thank you uh, uh, amitabh thank you ajay ji and dilip ji bahut acha laga aap logon se baat karke ab hum log dusre session ki taraf move karte hain so the next session uh, you know on smart uh, village finances will be uh, will be coordinated and moderated by sir brian heep and uh, we will have on the panel if uh, chengappa can bring all of these uh, you know speakers on the panel that will be great uh, while i introduce uh, sir brian they are there sir we can continue okay so sir heep uh, he's the yeah sir heep has uh, you know he started this uh, smart village uh, you know initiative a couple of years ago and uh, we have been working together since then on the various uh, initiatives and he has, they did a uh, road map uh, meetings across the world so he brings a sleuth of experience uh, throughout the world you know how smart villages and how you know how we can we are going to advance these uh, you know initiatives on smart villages especially on technical tech, technological financial and political uh, aspects of the smart villages he is uh, uh, he was a director of the institute of animal psychology director of research at biotechnology and uh, okay yeah and uh, so he has been the president of the royal society uh, uh, foreign secretary for the royal society and uh, he is currently at cambridge and he is uh, and uh, we are still continuing and continuing his work on smart villages across the across the world so sir he it the uh, floor is yours please thank you very much it's very good to be here today and thank you for including us in this uh, exciting program that you set up uh, i'd like to share my <coughs> video which i will try to bring up uh if it will come i hope it will come let's see. Uh, let's hope the video works well because the, sometimes the sound has a problem but we uh, right. can try <coughs> So shall we see if it comes up? Can you enjoy it to your end? So stop the machine. Let me try to share content again. Uh, Uh, patience, patience, patience. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, it is coming. It's coming. Very good. Yeah. So. Does it work? Yeah. Can you go into presentation mode? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, 
just double click on the first icon, sir. Mm -hmm. Or go to the presentation. Click on the presentation icon at the bottom of your screen. Thank you. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. Can you see it? Uh, I, we don't see it, but uh, let's just go ahead. Uh, you can just uh, flip the screen here. Uh, okay. okay. Yeah, fine. Now, now you can just go into the presentation mode. It's not, it's not working. Click on the presentation mode. Uh, uh, shall I share the presentation, sir? Yes, why don't you do it from your end? Okay, I, I will share mine. I will share from my end. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, it was working previously, but... It doesn't seem to work. Hey, okay. Go ahead. Uh, okay, fine. So this is a <clears throat> short presentation on a project we've been involved in over the last six or seven years, new thinking for off-grid communities worldwide, and the Small Villages Research Group, uh, which uh, started with being based in both in Cambridge and Oxford, and we've now moved to develop this in, in a variety of ways, as you'll see in the next slides. Next slide shows that 47% of the world's population and 70% of the world's poor don't live in cities. And yet there's been an enormous emphasis on cities. And we, what is the new idea? The new idea is to shift the balance from cities to villages, to the rural communities, and shift the balance of opportunities between cities and villages using game-changing technologies, which of course require investment to achieve this. So this is the session in which we're looking at the way in which funding can be uh, taken as a very serious element as we discuss the future of smart villages internationally. The next slide shows the way in which we focus on the concept that energy and the provision of energy and the provision of ICT are two key technologies that can be transformative. And so we're looking at the way in which energy can actually be the catalyst for development. <clears throat> the intention is that it's a village-led approach. It has to involve the village communities. It's a bottom-up approach in that respect. It's catalyzed by technology because the energies that can be derived from solar, wind, hydro, biomass, and hybrids of those can bring the energy into villages that have previously been energy deprived. It also involves engaging the entrepreneurial skills of the communities, and particularly, as we've heard just recently, the important role that women play in this respect, and it addresses multiple SDGs. And as you can see from this slide, the village itself provided with energy and ICT, two key components can have then a great influence on food security, health and welfare, on education and local businesses, and also enable villagers to participate in democratic engagement, particularly in India, where you've developed electronic voting systems. The next slide shows us that we are in a position to 
examine what are the things that we've learned from our own experience. So the Smart Village Initiative worked on integrated community development since 2012. We're committed to open access and we're committed to being not for profit. And we've had over 40 workshops across Africa, Latin America and Asia. And we built a network of about 2000 partners. And our experience has been by that has been derived from community engagement in these villages, focusing on an integrated system, not just focusing on a single element like solar or uh, irrigation, but looking at how these things can be integrated and developed together and then measure the impact. And for this purpose, we've had strong, we do have strong ties with the university base here in Cambridge and in Oxford. So let's look at three things that we've derived from this experience. The next slide. So the next slide shows the importance of integration and coordination. It becomes very important in this concept to bring the different components together. Instead of having individual silos, we have to address the ability to development holistically. And so collaboration is essential from those items that I described there. It's very important to have clear and supportive and stable policy frameworks, which have a strong political backing and also provide the resources for development. There must be a simplification of procedures so that red tape is reduced and the transaction costs are contained. And it should be done within the context of a national energy plan, uh, because otherwise there is a risk that will be either competition or overlap in the activities. So the first thing we've learned is the importance of integration and coordination. The second thing that we have learned from our workshops and interacting with these communities is in the next slide. And it's to do with the science and technology. Initiatives that support collaboration between university researchers and frontline organizations is critical. Also to take advantage of the technical training for young people in villages and expose them to new technologies and show how they can also use frugal innovation because these things attract young people to stay in the villages rather than migrating or even coming back into the villages. Because there are still some key areas for research and development which require science. And I've listed batteries, recycling, intelligent control systems, and so on. The next slide tells us that the third aspect that we need to look at is providing an access to finance. It's been estimated that if we're going to have universal energy access by 2030, the funding will have to increase by a factor of three to 10. And this will inevitably need to involve the private sector. Credit guarantees will be needed for the private sector investors, stable and supportive policy and regulatory frameworks. There needs to be familiarity on the part of financial institutions with the concept of smart villages and what it entails. Very often we found that, uh, for example, banking systems don't understand even some of the elementary aspects of renewable energy of the type that we're discussing here. And so there has to be uh, an educational component for the financial institutions in many of the countries which we've been working in. Reducing transaction costs is important, and that can be done by bundling projects together, by forming cooperatives in the village, and by de developing an innovation fund for off-grid enterprises. So this is where the funding of this aspect becomes so important. And I think the final uh, summary that I've listed here is the importance of building markets. Renewable energy and ICT can be used to develop off-grid productive enterprises. And let's just bear in mind that nearly a billion people still live off the grid. What a huge market that is for potential investors and for governments who are interested in 
uh, the development of the rural communities. And so very important to build effective markets for the products and the services that can be developed within the village. Mini grids are at the heart of this. And finally, we think of the future, which will must involve uh, not only the science community, which is quite often well keyed into these ideas, but the villagers and the frontline workers in the communities, those involved with policy and regulatory communities, but particularly looking at how to scale up so that it's not just single villages, but clusters of villages in rural communities, and show to the investment community the opportunities that, that exist for the future. And I put onto this slide the website from which you would be able to get further information. So I think I'll leave it there, Ashok, as a means of uh, opening up this discussion that we're going to have on the voice of the funding agencies. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Sarai. Uh, we uh, thanks a lot for setting this uh, context. And uh, you know now you can uh, we can invite other speakers. So perhaps we can start with uh, Mr. Gigi Mamen. Uh, Managing Director of NAFPINS. Gigi, sir, are you there? Good okay. evening. Good, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, yes. Do you have any presentation or you are just oh, going no, to speak? I, I will be just speaking only. Perfect. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, thank you for making me part of this uh, deliberation. In fact, I feel a bit uh, out of place in the sense I feel I'm an odd man out because whatever I heard so far are from the uh, from uh, the grassroots level wor workers. They have been doing in the work at the field level, whereas I am not in the grassroots level. I am basically in the policy level at the top level and the part of uh, NABAD as well as NAPFINS. Let me tell you, I am right now heading a company called NAPFINS, which is a uh, subsidiary of NABAD, National Bank for Agriculture and Rural Development. And uh, when I'm talking about the sustainable smart villages, basically my deliberations would be what NABAD has been doing to support the sustainable villages. Because as NAFINS, you know, it's a it's a subsidiary company of NABAD doing microfinance uh, business, basically to support the self-help group program, which NABAD started in 1992. In fact, Madam Utra has rightly said, when we started the SOG movement in 1992, it was more for the empowerment of the women and the community. Basically, it was more like uh, bringing people together for uh, finding themselves the strength together, bringing the pulling the strength together and working for the community and also for uh, their own self-reliance uh, and self-support. But subsequently, yes, as the program moved on, when the government programs took over this self help group movement, and when various other developmental programs started part taking self help group as a base for their uh, developmental activities, the goal of uh, empowerment and all have gone and it's become more of a transactional activity. So, right now, I am supporting that uh, transactional activity. Basically, we, as NAFINS, I am supporting, I am financing this self help group, which has been promoted by various various NGOs and other governmental institutions, other non-governmental institutions. We are a uh, microfinance institution. We provide funding to the self help groups. And also we give funds to the JLGs, joint liability groups of women, basically to take care of their funding needs of their uh, economic activities, basically to make them economically, uh, economically sound and economically self-reliant. So that is our present goal. So I live about uh, NAFINS here, and I'll move to the NABAD, the parent organization where I had been you know, working all along for the last 35 years. Uh, in the process, I had been associated with Amidaba. I have been associated with some other uh, people in this forum. So it's really happy to be part of this forum. And uh, as NABAD, as you know, see, it started in 1982 as a you know, as, a, as an apex organization for integrated rural development. Basically, we talked about the integrated development of the villages or the rural areas. So as part of that, not only agriculture, but non-agriculture activities, non-farm sector was also part of our focus. So in 1992, we started the self-help self group movement, basically to make the women self-reliant, 
to pool their resources and make them self uh, self supporting uh, for meeting their own credit needs uh, for meeting their their own uh, or developing their own inner strength to become empowered so that is how we started the program and uh, today self help group program is a, a program with uh, more than uh, 10 crore uh, families involved in fact you have more than a crore as it's about 100000 uh, sorry uh, 10 million uh, 10 million self help groups are there in the country uh, which started with the promotion of program in 1992 now it is being promoted by various agencies of which a large number is promoted by nabard and the associated institutions so this was the first step i would uh, like to share here one of the first initiatives of nabard where it aimed at uh, sustainable villages second one was uh, about uh, developing the tribals because uh, in the morning uh, also when mr mistri was talking about the poorest of the poor the tribal population supporting them basically to because they are all uh, used to migrate to uh, other areas during the uh, off season time for looking for jobs basically because they didn't have a source of income from the on land because most of the lands were degraded they were not productive they were not giving them the sustainable uh, the income so that's how the wadi program the, uh, the tribal development program was started where we supported the families of uh, uh, tribal people by developing one acre at least one acre of land for productive purpose with uh, plantation activities some kind of fruit crops that to a combination of two crops uh, maybe mango and aula or mango and uh, uh, peru some two crops two uh, plant two types of uh, uh, fruit crops were planted in this one acre of land along with that the water conservation and soil development those kind of things were supported and in the process we were able to support more than the the, the families were able, able to get employed in their own land for developing the land as well as they were able to start getting a sustainable income from the third year and fourth year onwards in between along with the intercropping which they were uh, they were encouraged to do they were also able to get some kind of uh, income during the initial 2 3 years but after 2 3 years once the plant grows and it becomes in the productive stage that continued their, that provided them adequate income for their uh, livelihood so that is how that body program was continuing and we have we have uh, done more than 750 such projects across the country we have supported more than 4.5 lakh of hectares of uh, developing these tribal lands for this purpose this was another initiative third one was about an integrated watershed development program basically when uh, we know that more than in india more than 60% of the land is rainfed of which uh, a major majority are land are not very productive or they hardly give, give some kind of a, a single crop that too with a very less production so how to develop the lands how to bring them into a full production capacity how to, how, to, how to make them more more productive that is how when we started this integrated integrated watershed development program along with the uh, german german agency kfw and gs gis together we started an integrated watershed development program way back in 1995 and uh, this continued and uh, so far we have uh, supported more than 2200 such project across the country and develop about 2.3 million hectares of land by providing all kind of water conservation measures soil conservation activities plantation with the various type of crops which would be suitable to that particular geography so like that we have supported this kind of a program which have been come to a stage where people are able to do uh, take the second crop third crop and also have a continued and sustained income in this land this has really proved uh, quite uh, successful and based on our initiative several governments have started their own uh, watershed development programs so that is continuing and that is some of other one thing which i would like to bring to this table of this conference another one was uh, basically uh, when you are talking about the financing because nabard is basically a refinance agency we don't that's why i said we are not a grassroots organization we basically lend to the other uh financial institutions like commercial banks cooperative banks or regional rural banks we finance them for financing to the individuals for the farmers or the entrepreneurs 
basically we are a refinancing institution but then we also got into a direct financing mode from 1992 uh, onwards uh, 1995 onwards uh, for financing the infrastructure needs of the supporting the finance infrastructure needs of the country especially the infrastructure required for the rural areas like irrigation uh, re- infrastructure or the uh, or the transport communication and transport in, in infrastructure or the warehousing and in, uh, go down infrastructure so those kind of infrastructure has been supported under the fund called rural infrastructure development fund so this we had been doing for the last 25 years from 1995 onwards this fund has been there and more than 3.78 lakh uh, 3.78 lakh crores that is about 3.78 trillion indian rupee was being financed under this program to various state governments we have developed a huge uh, irrigation facilities across the country we have developed so many roads and bridges across the country we have developed so many uh, warehouses and uh, uh, storage facilities across the country so this is another thing which has been helped the, the especially the rural areas to become self sufficient now now the recent initiative of the government under the atmanirbhar nirbhar bharat we have also taken certain steps to make the villages self sufficient one of the thing which we have done is that because every uh, in india if you see every villages have a village cooperative society most of the cooperative societies are in a bad shape may not be doing well they don't have adequate income so what what we thought but thought was that we should develop this uh, pri- primary agriculture cooperative society as it is called us or the primary societies to become a one shop one stop shop uh, one sh- uh, stop shop for a, uh, for the village so not only they provide the credit most of this village cooperative society they provide credit for the agriculture season for the agriculture purposes agriculture credit they disperse but apart from that can they also be developed into some other kind of uh, uh, service institutions like uh, as i said go down facilities providing go down facilities providing primary processing facilities or providing some kind of uh, other services which are required to the villages i have seen some of the uh, primary cooperative societies doing so many additional services other than the credit including running a, uh, a petrol pump or having a, a textile shop or having a provisional stores or having a, a medical stores so these are all several things which they can do it when we are talking about sustainable village i am sure this is an institution which can be really developed as a as a central point for all kind of business support system for the village so this this is what nabard also thought about so we have a program called uh, converting primary societies into multi service cooperative societies so we have started this program and now we have been financing and uh, we have aimed to develop 10000 uh, primary agriculture cooperative societies during the next 2 3 years and this also gels well with the government's uh, atmanirbhar pro- program where atmanirbhar bharat pro- program where they are also looking at uh, uh, supporting with agriculture infrastructure fund so this uh, primary societies can also uh, avail this agri- primary uh, agri infrastructure fund and start having some kind of primary processing activities in the villages so this is what we are trying, trying to do nowadays so this is another initiative which i thought we should uh, i thought we will uh, uh, flag on and fourth one and the fifth one i just wanted to say that's my last point is about the credit guarantee which uh, uh, right now uh, um, mr heep had talked about nabard has been also started uh, having a credit guarantee fund for some of the funding activities one of the funding activity for under this agri infrastructure fund wherever the cooperative banks or the region rural banks are financing nabard has is has supporting as as uh, created this fund uh, this uh, uh, guarantee fund which will support their funding to the borrowers to the institutions to the uh, ngos or to the sgs or to the any other uh, micro enterprise entrepreneurs so we are giving a uh, credit guarantee support for that there is another program of the government uh, uh, called the animal agriculture infrastructure fund under which government is planning to support for animal husbandry uh, processing activities like meat processing or uh, or 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 the, or the 
the, the cattle feed processing, those kind of things are being sub, uh, financed through animal husbandry infrastructure fund. They are also Nevada has created a uh, created a uh, guarantee fund, and we are providing funding support, or we are providing the the, the support from this guarantee facility, and which is helping the banks to fund further. So these are some of the things I thought I will bring to the table, and if anything more is uh, required, any, anything is to be discussed, I am open for discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So you know that you know, Nabat is a key partner in any rural development, and that is why I we think that you know Nabat's participation is equally important. So if you also think that we need to bring someone else also from Nabad into this working group, please Definitely. do suggest, and we will we'll get the right stakeholders as well. Definitely, I feel uh, yeah, one person from Nabad itself would be much more because I am although part of Nabad, but now I am moved mm -hmm. out of Nabad and uh, in, uh, heading another institution. So better to have somebody from Nabad itself. Definitely, sir. Thank you. Sahib, yes, you'd like to... Ah. No, no, it was a very interesting presentation, and I think it uh, expands very much on some of the brief thoughts that I mentioned at the beginning. And I think we're now moving forward to our next presentation, which I think will be from Fumima Do from the Tata Trust. Are you there? Yes, Purnamali. Afternoon, Sahi. And uh, okay, thank you, uh, Ashok. Yes, uh, thanks. Can you, uh, uh, we will make you the we will make you the presenter. So I think if you can, given the network, if you could uh, uh, anchor the presentation from there. Okay, I can do that. Yeah. Just, just, yeah. Continue. I'm just bringing over the presentation. Sure. So as it is coming in, uh, uh, it's been interesting to hear what everybody has to say. And uh, uh, I represent the Tara Trust, and I uh, look at a vertical called data-driven governance. Uh, at the outset, many of you would be familiar with the Tata Trust. We are one of uh, uh, we are actually India's largest private uh, philanthropy and do work across uh, various sectors ranging from health, education, livelihoods, etc. And uh, um, from Shubhadeep uh, Ashok, uh, is, is it easier for you if I present from here? We could try that as well. Okay, I no, I, it was in PDF, so I had to search for it. It did not open in present in PPT. So I have the I have the PowerPoint here. I can share it. Yeah. Okay, please. Yeah. So uh, to give you an overview, the trust works across multiple domains, and uh, um, in, over the years, what we have found is that while data and uh, uh, you know technology have been used a lot in the uh, uh, private sector. Uh, it has never been, you know, more important to, uh, you know, identify patterns, protect the vulnerable as much as it is in the current context. And we find that across the board, uh, uh, this uh, issue of not having information to take decisions uh, or, you know, adequate information to take decisions has impacted things both in the rural and in the urban sphere. We see this across the world, but particularly in the uh, Indian context, what we do see is that... Um, Having the right kind of information systems, and I thought it would be useful to focus on this piece for this group since uh, uh, IEEE does look at both uh, people from the technology and the information sciences and various other engineering communities, both in academia and uh, in business and in the social sector. So uh, today I will focus on some of our efforts towards, uh, you know, how we have tried to plug this information asymmetry gap and uh, where we see the possible opportunities for the future. So information platforms as a public good is something which uh, I think has increasingly become something which is of importance. Uh, let's, be, let's move to the next slide. And in the context of that, if we looked at what we as uh, 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 we and my team as data-driven governance do, we've tried to look at this question of 
how does the rural and the urban uh, uh, decision making space use data and technology and what can be done to improve that uh, so if we looked at our theory of change uh, on the left hand side we looked at the gaps in planning and service delivery which is a you have inadequate public service systems this issue of access to clean drinking water healthcare energy which he was talking about they are also driven by a large part of poor fund allocation execution you know and some segments of that i think the uh, uh, screen we've lost the screen right now are you all able to view it are you able to view the screen i am not able to view it Uh, Ashok sir, we are seeing a grayed out screen from your end. Sorry about that. Okay. No problem. Thank you. So, if one is looking at the poor, this issue of uh, uh, we can be at the previous uh, screen itself. Uh, if one looks at the theory of change of uh, you know this inadequate public service delivery, poor fund allocation, execution, there was a lot of conversation in the previous session also about the gaps being around implementation and not so much as design. One crux of the problem is this lack of governance tools and resources. you know a lot is still based on a paper based kind of reporting system you know and uh, decision makers continue to be in a fire fighting mode where you know you have a lot of information but the ability to translate that into decisions or have it readily available with you uh, if and if we look at these decision makers a district collector a municipal commissioner these are actually they are actually like very large ceos who have to handle competing demands at any given point in time and for them to be able to do what is essential having the relevant governance tools and resources becomes extremely important and this as players in the sector what we also find is that the government is a very large player and if they if one is able to develop tools or techniques to enable and unlock uh, uh, certain resources or systems there then the multiplier effect of that it can be extremely high so our effort has been towards creating sustainable solutions one being in the space of creating governance tools so how do you triangulate information build dashboards and work closely with the system itself where you are having on ground support technical assistance to some of these players where they can use information for better decision making build it as a part of their regular review processes and thirdly look at this as a continuum towards improving development outcomes so the real idea is not to you know get very consumed by the tech or by the uh, fancy you know data analytics which are possible but more to focus on what part of this can help improve development outcomes make it easier for the system to know who are all those people in my domain who need access to services and for the people to know what schemes what services what uh, you know opportunities are there which i can get access to so building this kind of a bridge uh between you know uh, and and plugging this knowledge gap is what is something which we have tried to do and i'll talk a little bit about the tools and resources we've tried to develop around this next slide please and very briefly this is trying to do at scale uh in depth with about four or five states within india and uh, at a broader level with a number of districts so currently our footprint is across 91 districts and a number of urban local bodies and we've seen capacity building also emerge in the last couple of years particularly as an important area because having the tools and technology is one thing but building capacity of the system which could be people right from the frontline workers to heads of state and government to use these tools and to you know uh, uh, make it happen if i were to give you a quick example let us look at you know today's uh, webinar itself a lot of the voices from the field we were only able to hear their voices we were not able to see them right and i missed that and i think some part of it is either because the technology has not been able to support it or their own comfort with the technology or a mix of various factors so when we are talking about smartness i think we need to look at how do we you know create these pathways so that everybody's voice can be a part of it everybody's uh, you know information can come in in its entirety 
Next slide, please. So we try to locate it across certain pillars, and our core tenets have been micro planning. How do you use data based planning to be able to draw out village development plans? There was discussion about the GPDP, the Gram Panchayat Development Plan, in the earlier session as well by the uh, Honorable Secretary. And uh, the government centrally has taken some steps around it. But we've seen that there is a lot more that needs to be done if this has to drill right down to every Gram Panchayat and every village so that their information becomes part of that larger story. Monitoring and evaluation using technology. Third is community mobilization for social development. So the Gram Sabha as an active space and making those voices heard and using digital tools also to you know assimilate some of those that information. Uh, and I think Uttara in the previous session spoke about not giving space but providing space. You know, I thought that was a very nice articulation of what we've also tried to look at because part planning being more participatory becomes very important. And we've tried to look at, you know, how do you uh, uh, bring and converge both data which comes in through surveys, but also use PRAs, participatory rural appraisals, as a way of bringing consolidating information which tells you what the local priorities are. I spoke already about capacity building. The uh, uh, next tenet that we think is very important is SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, and their integration. So the Indian government has been doing a fair amount of work around localization of SDGs. So we've tried to build that also into our efforts so that any information that you're bringing in, it has an SDG lens so that you can look at which of the SDGs is it actually targeting. Let's proceed. We have a lot of programs. I'm not going to go into each of them in the interest of time. I will focus on one specific one, which is uh, an effort called on around micro planning, which we have termed as Delta. So uh, we started this, and this is uh, the acronym leads up to Data Evaluation, Learning, Technology, and Analysis, Delta. It's a name that evolved as we went ahead with our work. And where this started was, uh, when the government of India announced this program, this is the slide, Sao right? Yes, this we are is the right. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. So when the government announced this thing called Sansad Adarsh Gram Yojana, the uh, we started working with some of the members of parliament as well as some of the district uh, authorities to look at how do you understand your local profile? If you wanted to make sense of where I need to invest my money which are those priorities that I either as an elected representative or as a bureaucrat need to focus on. And the same question could apply to funding agencies or anybody who is trying to solve a localized problem. Understanding the local regional profile becomes very important. So if you look at the left-hand side corner, we started with a tablet-based data collection. Where first we did a regular uh, you know, survey-based information where it was manual, and then we realized that to go to scale, this needed to be technology-based. Today we have moved to a mobile app basis, which we do our entire household surveys as well as institutional surveys. And when we did this in Vijayawada, we did this across a span of 264 gram panchayats. And we then realized that having this kind of information, so what did we collect? We looked at the village-level survey which gives you at a unit of a village, what is the status of infrastructure, land, agriculture, connectivity, communication facilities? Does it have a bus stop? Does it have access to a pakka road? You know, specific things like that. Then we looked at some of the three core institutions. The Anganwadi, which provides health services to young mothers and infants. We looked at the schools where all the children get enrolled right up to the uh, high school level. And we looked at the health facilities. So your primary health centers as well as the uh, uh, tertiary uh, uh, support systems which are available. And in all of these, we looked at what is the status of human resources, infrastructure, facilities, and which services are people being able to access to it and which they are not. And the, the last thing which we looked at was fairly intensive for the household. Earlier, I mean, when Chitala sir was there, they had proposed. I think uh, I would request someone. I think someone is on. Needs to on mute. Probably we know sir, but here sir, you said here operations made all. Consider that, ma'am. Please go ahead. 
you can carry on. Third one. Yeah, yeah, carry on, please. This is the last slide, so we'll finish it here. All right. So, so this this tool and this methodology we have used across a number of. Uh, uh, if you could you could go to the next slide, I'll I'll finish with that one. So delta as a method which looks at how information can get collected, how it can flow into a village development plan, and how that plan can be used for these three things. One is to create an action plan along with a sustainable development goal, have visualization through dashboards, have a tracking, which makes it possible for you to track whether the roads which needed to get built, which came up through the village development planning process, whether they got done or not, and using for the district collector to use this as a tool when they go out to do their reviews. We did a variant of this further called Delta Plus, which looks at how do you then train communities and the Gram Sabhas to use the outputs of this tool to also uh, conduct these meetings and these uh, the decision making so that right from the plan to what comes in through the budget, it uses an information based system. We've had and this kind of tool, I think the Ministry of Statistics and Program, Program Implementation was also very happy to see that a generic tool of this kind uh, has been built. Um, we are also uh, where where we see areas for improvement and further work is adoption of or usage of these tools by government. So we work very closely with the bureaucrats in a number of places. And what we feel is that while we while development of such tools and methodology does happen, uh, adoption by government from the pilot to it getting institutionalized into the system. A lot of work has been done where we've also built their capacities extensively, but there is a need for centralized budget uh, and deputing dedicated people who will take ownership of such tools once they are developed for the administration so that it can run seamlessly tomorrow, even after you know those who initiated it may or may not be there. Uh, also technology, the, the kind of capacity building which is required needs to happen right from the top. We've started developing some capacity building modules as well, but these are spaces where we do see opportunities for startups, for uh, those who are in the information technology space, because knowledge, capabilities, and tools are going to be the three areas which, if plugged well, can help address a lot of these gaps. It's not a panacea for everything, but uh, we've seen it work if you can do it in a very specific and a contextualized manner. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Heap. Yes, thank you. I think uh, that, that's a very interesting approach to the question that we're looking at today. And I think it would be interesting to also frame this in the context of uh, pointing towards the private sector, not just the government sector, but how this might also draw in the interests of the private sector investment, which has to be an important component for the future for the development of smart villages on an international scale, as well as in India itself. So thank you very much. I think we're running way, way too late. Uh, so let's invite the other two speakers and a little uh, let's move a little faster. That will appreciate from everybody. And uh, next, uh, Naima Uruj, if you can share your thoughts. You can go ahead and share your presentation if you want. Hi, everyone. Um, so if I may request, uh, Mr. Ashok to, to please support me and anchor the presentation for me as well because my system is acting a little uh, right now, if you don't mind. Oh, so you want me to show it? If you could, please, yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So, in the meantime, um, so I have, Yeah, go uh, ahead. I did I'm not know you want me to, so... Perfect. Go ahead. You You try. So I would be speaking about um, Mahindra and Mahindra Group, uh, the CSR vision and the kind of programs that we're doing, especially with regard to the rural development. And uh, also a little bit about Tech Mahindra Foundation uh, and what are the kind of programs, even though we are uh, located in urban location, uh, we are located in urban cities, 
but what are the kind of programs you are running and if they can be replicated in a rural setup to make it uh, to uh, turn it into a smart village that you are or uh, can you see the slides uh, no no uh, okay so uh, jay krishna can you make me the presenter thank you so um if i could just uh, speak about thank you yes so um we, we will talk about the csr vision a little bit so uh, our efforts are in uh, the uh, in mnm our efforts are uh, towards development of girls youth and farmers specifically with innovation uh, and uh, making use of technology also in the meantime and focus on health and environment uh so that's the vision that we have as an organization uh yes i think we can move to the next one so just wanted to give a glimpse of uh, uh mahindra footprint and uh, so so i would rather focus here on the number of uh, csr projects that are running across the country and also the uh, budgets that we have for uh, csr so there's a, there's over 300 plus crores of Budget which is which is two percent of the profit that is that gets used up uh, for CSR and there are over hundred plus projects that are running and a lot of focus is on rural uh, space development so a lot of projects are running in rural areas. Uh, can we go on to the next thing? Yes. Can we go on to the next slide too? Okay. So um, in the next slide, uh, this is the flagship program for. Mahindra and Mahindra. So anybody uh, who talks about Mahindra and Mahindra CSR, this is the first program that comes to mind because this is very close to the heart of uh, Anand Mahindra also, and it was launched in 1996. Uh, so what happened in this program, and I, why I want to speak a little bit about this, is because uh, the focus is a lot on girl-child education, which uh, any any space that we are trying to develop, uh, this should be also at the core of that space. Uh, so what happens is that we uh, set up academic support centers in these uh, uh, in the schools itself which will run either before the school starts or with, or after the school ends so uh, two hours is what would be given to the uh, girl children to come to the center and uh, basically go through different academics like uh, they they can use make use of technology there is an ai uh, app available called mindspark and uh, there are tabs available in these centers. So students will come here and uh, start exploring different things, start learning about uh, math, science, English, social, all those subjects they'll start studying from here. And uh, this, this becomes core. Apart from that, uh, we also uh, have, as part of this program, uh, there'll be sports curriculum that will be, uh, that will be available at the academic centers also to encourage girl, girls to participate in sports. And we also provide school supplies, uh, which there'll be kits available, including barracks, stationery, and special component is, of course, um, the hygiene requirements related to men menstruation. So, because a lot of girls don't stop coming to school uh, once they start uh, menstruating, so this became a very important factor to get included. Um, so, as you can see, we have over uh, 450,000. Okay. So I'll, yes, I'll move to the next one, yes. Uh, but yes, Nani Kali is a very special program for us. Moving on to the next slide. Yeah, so uh, so Project Haryali is something that is uh, basically plantation, tree plantation. And the focus is to have 1 million trees every year planted. Uh, now, how this becomes uh, relevant in a rural setup is that we did a pilot uh, as part of this project. Uh, in Andhra Pradesh, Araku Valley, and uh, uh, the, we entered into agroforestry livelihood generation program. So what happens under this program is that with plantation, we try to make livelihood opportunities, generate livelihood opportunities for the tribal farmers to start earning income by planting and bearing trees. So, uh, so in Araku, we could see that uh, this program really helped in sustaining co coffee plantation, which yielded really high uh, uh, returns for the tribal population in the area. Uh, and um, 
this is something that after after the piloting we started focusing more on plantation of trees that are that have economic values uh, such as fruit fruit bearing trees and um, trees that uh, help in arresting soil erosion and climate change so these are the kind of uh, so th this becomes uh, special because with plantation you are able to generate livelihood uh, so apart from that there is also uh, we also build toilets uh, in the villages and as you can see here a little bit has been said uh, about uh, the number of toilets that we have built so far and the maintenance uh, one year maintenance is what we take care of. Uh, after it is built. So, in, can we go to the next slide, please? So, this is uh, this slide talks about the program that uh, that focuses on empowering small and marginal farmers, uh, and it's called Vardha Family Farming Project. Uh, so, this began in 2015, and in three years, and it began in an area called Vardha uh, in Vidharbha region, which is very famous for the climate changes and the challenges that. Uh, farmers face there, so a lot of distressed farmers face. Uh, so what we did here is that we went through several stages of there was land preparation, then uh, how how do you implement drip irrigation systems to plantation, then how can you do intercropping? Basically, how can you improve? Uh, uh, how can you improve um, output, uh, farming output, and how do you make cultivation sustainable? Uh, so the program is of course focused on small small and marginal farmers and uh, we train them in effective farming practices uh, so there'll be a lot of uh, crop uh, crop planning and rotation involved and uh, this particular program uh, we were able to spread in 79 villages and uh, 750 farmers were able to uh, benefit from it and uh, so uh, in the first harvest that happened uh, it, it's a pomegranate harvest that happens it happened in the year uh, 1819, and the first harvest yielded uh, income of 60,000 rupees. And in the year 1920, when we, when the uh, last harvest happened, uh, the income that you can see here is 2.36 lakh. So there was a substantial increase because of this crop rotation and focus on um, um, focus on cultivating pomegranates based on the uh, climate and other conditions of the space of the place. So this is one of the other programs. If you go to the next slide, please. yes. So this is the program that Mr. Gigi also just spoke about, uh, integrated water watershed management. We have done this alongside Nabad uh, in Madhya Pradesh and in Madhya Pradesh in three, three areas. We started with Damo and uh, the intervention, the main focus of the intervention is soil and water conservation and um, productivity enhancement and livelihood generation. So uh, the initial, Pilot in Damo uh, helped us in getting to know that this integrated watershed, create, creating watersheds, can really help in improving a lot of things. Like uh, uh, the groundwater availability was improved. Then um, the average percentage of income in the households got improved. Uh, there was an increase in that, and uh, there was also an increase in the uh, household in in the income of agri uh, income coming from agriculture. So. Uh, after seeing a good success in Damo, it was implemented into other places in uh, Madhya Pradesh along with uh, Nabad. So it's a PPP model uh, where 50% partner, 50% stake is uh, ours and 50% is public. Uh, so it was then implemented in Bhopal and Hatta in Madhya Pradesh. So the success rate has been phenomenal in this, and uh, uh, the water conservation and groundwater levels greatly improved through this particular program in the rural area, making it more sustainable. So coming to Tech Mahindra Foundation, uh, in Tech Mahindra Foundation, there is a, fo the focus is entirely different. Uh, we focus on employability and school education. And under both the programs, disability is something that uh, is, uh, that becomes um, really important factor. So it's a cross-cutting theme. And um, uh, under employability, uh, we promote inclusivity and we promote centers that will uh, enable people with disabilities to come into the mainstream and start working, start getting employed, and um, uh, start earning their livelihood. So, if I can, if you can please move to the next slide. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So, this, these are the main programs here. Uh, employed under employability, 
uh, we are running academies. Uh, there are healthcare academies. The first two that you see are healthcare academies. We are running uh, academy in logistics. We are running academy related to digital technology. And then there is, of course, this program, which is called uh, Skills for Market Training Smart. So we are running centers. So uh, there are smart academies and there are smart centers under employability. Mm -hmm. I'll speak a little bit more about employability in the next uh, slide. Um, and yes, so um, so under employability, we have first we have a, a smart academies here. Uh, the smart academies um, basically it's fairly new. We started with smart, and after seeing the success with smart, and after um, going through a lot of uh, ups and downs there to make it work. We uh, we thought that uh, it's time to enter and make it a full-fledged program in the form of academies. And um, these are, we started with healthcare academies, seeing the need uh, of employability there, uh, seeing the opportunities available there. Uh, so these, uh, th this particular academy offers a range of courses in healthcare. And uh, um, these, and the infrastructure is something that uh, that, that matches with any good hospital. So uh, if, if I'm going in uh, uh, to get a diploma or a certificate uh, in critical care, so I will have uh, equipment, uh, state-of-the-art equipment that I can work with and uh, get trained on. So uh, the faculty is top-notch and uh, the placements are, have been very, very good because uh, there is a huge demand in the sector. And, uh, and and the salaries are pretty good in the sector also. So if you can move to the next slide, please. So this is the flagship program, SMART. Uh, previous slide, please. SMART. The slide before this. Yes. Thank you. So this, this is how this basically led to SMART Academies. It's an employability initiate where um, who are dropout students, young people, able to uh, complete their schooling to, uh, for various reasons and uh, are looking for such, uh, are looking for a career growth, not just an employment, but a career uh, progressive career. They come to these centers, they get trained in multiple trades. There are uh, more than uh, 40 courses that are being offered at present, and this is running across 11 cities that were there and in 93 centers and. Uh, so this program prepares you. You you come here, you get trained, and we ensure that you get placed in a good uh, in a good company. And then there is we also follow up and see that your career is progressing and that you're satisfied and you're moving ahead in life and not getting stuck in one place. So so this led to the idea of the academies and uh, academies are a higher range of this. So uh, the salary range is less, and academies will give you better salaries also. So this is our employability initiative. Then we do something in education also. So that's an all-round improvement uh, program uh, in school education where we focus on uh, four major aspects. So academic is, of course, a big focus. Then uh, community, role of community, role of parents in running the school, the education of their child. Then infrastructure, how a good infrastructure is also important for uh, for a class, for a space to be conducive to learning and then organizationally because you, you can't uh, function without the support of the government so how it is important uh, for for a school to function um, uh, effectively so this this is also one of the things that uh, i think could be a part of uh, the smart village that we're talking about improvement everywhere uh, yeah. So, we envision everything uh, coming together in a smart village. Uh, there are aspects that are important. So, employability is important, livelihood, livelihood is important, your children are important in the village. So, you can't leave behind anybody. You have to take everyone together, only then uh, there can be sustenance, there can be improvement, there can be development. So, if, if we take together these programs, and so these are dispersed, and if we ideally look at uh, geography where all of this can come together, then I think uh, it would make a very good model for uh, a smart village. And of course, uh, different things that people are people here are also talking about. So, we're talking, yeah. So I think uh, bringing it all together in one place and creating this uh, model will be 
uh, yeah, it will be worth. It will be something to watch out for. I think yes. So thank you so much. I hope I have been very quick. <laughs> and <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. I yes. now I have to use something to wake everybody up. <laughs> also. <laughs> All right, let's go to the next one. Uh, let's finish. Uh, uh, Sarheep, uh, any comments? And then we'll start the next. A very brief comment. That was a very interesting presentation also. And I think it does raise this really interesting question that we shall need to consider in our discussions about how that wonderful investment in education could be integrated into the development of other aspects of a smart village. Uh, so that it's not simply something that's done separately, but it is actually coordinating with a lot of other activities that take place that once you have uh, energy introduced into a village through one of the methodologies that I discussed earlier. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, I know Divya, I'm pressurizing you, but please go ahead and try to summarize <laughs> as fast as you I can. Will. I will try my best. All right. So Divya is with uh, Swiss Development Corporation and at the Embassy of Switzerland, and she has some interesting experience to say that how village development is a challenging, you know, proposition and how we can handle this. Go ahead, Divya. Thank you so much. I, unfortunately, I don't seem to have rights to present, it seems. Uh, either somebody you have the rights. Right? You have the rights, but please uh, limit to the to next five minutes. I want to at least start <laughs> the next session. <laughs> and, you know, it's only 45 minutes, one hour late, but that's okay. Uh, I will give yeah. you the presentation, yeah. Right. Anyways, I will, I guess uh, I'll just uh, skip some of the things, uh, you know, and uh, so you will hear this. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So just to be very quickly, uh, you know, give you a brief background of what SDC does in India. We essentially work in the space of climate change adaptation, working both in the space, uh, you know, on the dimension of low emission development and at the same time climate resilience. Uh, our footprint uh, today in India is, of course, across Pan India, especially in the Himalayan context, considering that we are an alpine country and we do have experiences to bring to uh, this region from Switzerland. Uh, I will skip this slide and I'll go directly to this uh, singular intervention that uh, SDC has been supporting, which is about building climate resilience of forest dependent communities. Uh, this was done in Uttarakhand. If you know, 71% of the state area is actually under forest land and uh, nearly uh, three fourths of the rural population depends on natural resources for their livelihood as well as food and water security. Uh, if I go down already, sorry. So under this intervention, we actually undertook a small uh, project. You know, really, it was just a very tiny pilot in a place called Fairy Kimora, which was in Kerry Garwal. Now, this is uh, a region which was selected based on the fact that when we did uh, an extensive uh, vulnerability and risk analysis for the entire state of Uttarakhand, Kerry emerged as one of the most uh, vulnerable districts of the state. And within that, this village was selected because it is uh, a community which depends entirely uh, on the forest resources around uh, uh, itself. And uh, it was we, our idea here was not really to do something on a scale, but actually to use it as a hands-on capacity building exercise for the uh, you know various government departments to learn on how to work with for uh, you know uh, uh, with communities on the ground and in an uh, you know to develop uh, bring about development in an integrated manner. So if you actually see again the scale, as I said, very very tiny, just about 500 people spread across an area of 100 hectares. And uh, what was the, what is it that we wanted to do here was, the, the thing was that ideal, as I said, it was all about building capacities of the government department. So the lead for actually implementation, implementing this intervention was not with SDC, it was not with any of our NGO partners, but with the forest department of the state of Uttarakhand. Uh, and they were the ones who then started involving other sectors like drinking water, agriculture, horticulture, education, energy, to sort of come together and uh, work on developing this, uh, uh, you know, integrated uh, development plan 
and in fact also then uh, chipped in funds you know nearly 40% of the funds came from their side to uh, undertake the interventions on the ground um as also a very important part of this was that we work so here for the first time what we got the forest department and the other government departments to do was to come together and for once engage with the communities on one on one basis really talk to them you know to understand what their needs were what their expectations were as many of you might know uttarakhand is a state which uh, struggles a lot with the issue of uh, migration you know out migration where healthy uh, working age male members leave leave the villages and it's essentially the women elderly and the children who get left behind and then all the workload of uh, running the uh, house as well as uh, you know looking after the livelihood concerns falls on the women so basically all the farming also is in the hands of women and the elderly so efforts were very actively made to include women who were at uh, usually you know at risk of being excluded in the local level decision making processes to really understand what is it that they uh, needs or expectations were from their uh, side and also aspirations were from their side uh intervention gallery was uh, you know a very varied it worked right from again we were at a kind of an excess of world you know um water energy food and livelihood you know so we were looking at many different things uh, uh, at the same time uh agriculture side we were looking at uh, you know not only uh, in introducing poly houses for them to cultivate now off season crops like capsicum and uh, tomatoes but also looking at uh, mushroom cultivation bee keeping and so on at the same time on the plantation side natural regeneration of the forest was taken up uh, because uh, forest was getting uh, affected because as i said the community has, uh, depended a lot on the forest resources for their fodder as well as you know uh, fuel wood requirements uh, solar cookers were introduced for midday meals uh, for the children in the uh, nearby school uh, solar lights were introduced and the idea for this was again to uh work towards uh you know reducing and man animal conflict in this area water harvesting tanks uh check dams in the streams were made to in, to not only uh, make it easy for the women who were spending nearly 6 hours selecting drinking water or water for domestic purposes to cut down that drudgery of the women but at the same time ensure that some water becomes available for the irrigation purposes so multiple uh, you know activities were undertaken which were all were identified in uh, in the participation with the uh, with the communities on the ground and uh, the uh, schemes of the government were tapped to bring in subsidies so uh, a lot of benefits happened you know in terms of forest regeneration in uh, you know, reducing the fuel wood consumption uh, you know nearly by 50% and so on so a lot of benefits started of course emerging even in the short time that we were present there but really what i would really like to talk about are the challenges that we faced you know. so while this was a small pilot coordination between different departments to converge their efforts took nearly two and a half years really working for a population of 500 people uh, you know working towards their integrated development and investing two and a half years to do that work uh, seems a little um, um, disjointed in the sense of uh, impact versus the effort that was required and this was also to do with the fact of that every department because they were going to be chipping in from their team that they had to take uh, you know their own bureaucratic processes of approvals of the uh you know beneficiaries and things like that what was really fully in this was the, um how the forest department actually came on board in terms of uh taking the role of coordinating with all the departments and also um you know very actively engaging with the uh, with the community so it was always a community who was asked not only what they required what their aspirations were but also in terms of identifying the beneficiary so it was a community as a as a group who this who would actually uh, reason out why a particular family or a particular individual or a particular group of individuals needed more support than the other so it was the government coming in and identifying these uh, beneficiaries okay one another challenge that we see is the project sustainability and upscaling of the model once uh, while the project in itself has started giving a lot of benefits and a lot of gram panchayats around this particular gram panchayat of kheri kimora so very much interested in terms of uh, you know having a similar uh development plan being done for their own uh, gram panchayat areas uh what we found was uh, the even the sustainability of this particular intervention will not be there unless it can be done in a regional scale because even if the women produce the potatoes and capsicum you know uh, how, or 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 honey or uh, mushroom there is important need to actually link it to the market how do you take it to the market so unless there is a regional scale where uh, you know Uh, there is a certain quantum of producing uh, um, uh, 
collected or uh, and and then only that it can be taken to Masuri or a nearby town where uh, they can be sold. So that requires uh, government to actually take it from a uh, uh, from a regional perspective to look at it from uh, you know for the and then upscaling of the model is again an issue. Uh, we all know that most of the government departments work in rather in a, in a silo mode and are not really interested in coordinating their efforts with each other. So really getting them to come on board and most of them are having uh, very scheme oriented interventions and schemes get defined at the, uh, uh, you know, at the state capital level and not really at the localized level. So what they can do with that scheme is very much uh, uh, defined in the guidelines of that scheme. So they don't have a lot of flexibility in how they can use the funds. And therefore, uh, it creates, so that means invariably, uh, what you offer through a scheme is not in response to what is required on the ground. And that creates a challenge in terms of actually providing benefits to the people on the ground. Yeah, the, the, yeah can we move it a, a little quickly? Yeah. yeah. And uh, of course, long-term impact monitoring is uh, also very challenging because, uh, I mean, you know, and this is also a challenge we face as a donor because uh, in, invariably, you know, for us, it's very easy to support an intervention which is very focused in terms of its uh, uh, interventions and not uh, really look at a intervention which has like 20 different things happening. And then, you know, monitoring that and evaluating that becomes very challenging. So really to look at it. So challenges are at many places uh, for us. Uh, so I guess I'll just wrap it up here. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Sarip. Thank you. Yes, I think, again, a very interesting presentation alerting us once again to the human dimension. How do you actually overcome the silo mentality and make sure that the different sectors in society are working together for the common good? And this was an, another very interesting example of how to do that. So it's an issue to do with governance, which I think we'll probably come back to later on. Okay, Chengappa, can you make me presenter? Thank you. Okay, so I, we have come to an end, almost an hour late, uh, but apologies to everybody. But let's uh, not stop here. I know it was supposed to be a tea break, uh, but uh, perhaps get to grab your tea and uh, get uh, hooked onto the seat again. Uh, I, before that, I would like to thank all of you, all the speakers here, mm -hmm. Sir Heep, Sir Maman, Naima, Purnima, and Divya for your valuable contribution. And we hope and we expect that you will continue to work with us in developing these, uh, the, the, the roadmap and the document that we are trying to prepare. Uh, with that commitment from you, I will let you go. And uh, please stay, stay back and listen to the next session, but that is a very important session, how academia and uh, the ecosystem come into play uh, to advance the goals of smart villages. So with that, uh, we will invite our next uh, moderator, uh, Puneet Sharma. And uh, Puneet, please take charge. And uh, uh, I will just show the uh, speaker slide so that we can invite these speakers on board. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Thank you very much for uh, moderating two sessions continuously. Yeah. You can see that a uh, lot of stress is there with you continuously from 2 o'clock. You are uh, uh, with all the speakers, one after another. So, so I'll just... In we have our voice. Yeah, go ahead. So friends, we have heard mostly village stakeholders, voice of funding agencies. We have finished that, and then now we are we have come to voice of ecosystem. I request all the speakers of my panel. You know, already we are almost more than one hour and fifteen minutes late. We have been allotted total time. Yes, I request each one of you to restrict yourself with five minutes and very oh, very give your provision very very focused talk on vision what worked for you what did not work for you and the way forward i think if you will focus on this 
then we'll be quickly able to wrap up the things and then uh, because we are eagerly awaiting for a very very important session of that and we want to come out with a document for that particular session is required so we will quickly wrap up this but yes please focus your presentation on vision what worked what did not work and the way forward so first of all we are going to have uh, i will just introduce our panelists we are honored to have john hall from university of buffalo usa i request each panelist to switch on their video using their name then professor dn rao vice president and co-founder of centurion university odisha professor vidyadhar subudhi dean r and d iit goa mr ram pappu program director mission samriddhi digvijay choudhary founder and md sobas insight forum and our last panelist is bhagwati patnaik he is consultant at cii cttc bhuneshwar so with this brief introduction i would like to invite first professor john hall to provide his perspective insight on the voice of his stakeholders with respect to eco system okay uh i need to be able to share my screen ashok you need to pause the presentation yeah. ball dr ashok please make him present us okay yeah professor john can you now present her you can share your screen okay <clears throat> all right, can you guys see my screen okay? Can everyone hear me all right? Mhm. Okay, great. We can see you but we cannot see your presentation. Uh No, we are able to see it. You can't see it? I can't see it. Go ahead, John. Okay, all right. Thank you. Okay, so hello everyone. I'm, my name is John Hall. I'm at the University of Buffalo. And so today what I'm going to present to you is an overview of our of our partnership for sustainable rural development. So this is a collaborate collaborative effort between three United States universities and Sun Moksha and central and uh central to our work is sustainable rural development. And uh as you can see down here basically what our research collaboration ask is is how can limited resources be used to empower people living in off-grid villages in India? to continue improving their quality of life by addressing the inequities associated with the nexus of three drivers of sustainable development which are people planet and progress so uh to do this to uh we promote sustainable rural electrification in India and we're working with the Shak Das of Sun Moksha and on our side on the USA side we have from the University of Oklahoma We have Dr. Farooq Mistry and he's a professor in the Department of Aerospace and Mechanical Engineering. We have Janet K. Allen, she's a professor in the Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering from Florida Institute of Technology. We have Anand Nelapalli and he's an assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical and Civil Engineering. And then I'm from the University of Buffalo and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. And so <clears throat> the way that we work through this is is uh uh through our research and uh we have some students that have been involved with various projects to support the effort and so i'm just going to give an overview uh uh of these projects um so a lot of this started with uh, abhishek yadav and anyway uh, his thesis was a framework for developing proposals by social entrepreneurs for development in rural india And so his work recognized problems in rural development. There's limited resources that are economic, technological and social and network. There's also environmental issues like resource depletion, droughts and climate change. And these are working together uh not in a good way but in a bad way and they impact the socio-economic development uh you know that's taking place in these rural communities. So uh one of the things that's recognized, you know, through his work is that improvements can happen through uh social 
enterprises at a grassroots at a grassroots level, and uh, in doing so, we improve the quality of life. Uh, you know, in these settings, um, a big emphasis of this is the positive role, but also the challenges that social entrepreneurs have in underdeveloped countries. Uh, some of these problems are there's a lack of social entrepreneurs. Uh, there's just a lack of social entrepreneurship, uh, there's a lack of funds, and even when there are funds, when investors show up to the table to help, um, there's, a, there's, there's a lack of understanding what's needed to make useful value propositions that improve the quality of living. So uh, what's needed here is coordination is needed uh, between social entrepreneurs and investors and phil uh, philanthropists, and uh, in doing so, you know, you're able to emp empower millions of millions of people in uh, rural areas through these enterprises. And so uh, there's tools that are needed uh, to facilitate this effort. Um, we want to establish investor and, and uh, social entrepreneur part partnerships. And we also want the social entrepreneurs to be able to identify value propositions that are specific uh, to rural areas. Uh, and then another thing is, is just being able to quantify uh, you know, the, the, the qualitative uh, information uh, that, that characterizes these villages. So uh, Abhishek proposed tools uh, to compare and analyze different value propositions uh, that can be adapted to these social and economic conditions. And then over here at the left, what we have is uh, Vinicius Kamala, his research, which was done at the, uh, through his master's work at the University of Oklahoma. And uh, he looked at a computational framework to foster sustainable rural development in uh, Indian off-grid villages. And uh, one of the things he referred to this as is, is uh, a wicked problem. And uh, you should look that up on Wiki Wikipedia. But basically what it is is uh, these, these social issues are difficult to solve because of incomplete and uh, changing requirements. And so this work stressed the importance of the social entrepreneur to solve social problems and also just to be able to identify these problems in the first place. Uh, and so he proposed a computational framework, uh, you know, to help with these goals and also something that would be suitable for rural Indian villages. Um, and one of the things uh, that was part of this framework is something called the Dilemma Triangle. And so the Dilemma Triangle it helps identify, uh, you know, tensions related to these complex social issues. Uh, and, and these villages are often at the bottom of Maslow's period, pyramid. And so what we're dealing with is basic needs, uh, dilemmas between food, energy, water. And, uh, uh, and so an example is, is you need water for agriculture uh, to have food. Uh, in some villages, you may have water, but you don't have the electricity you need, uh, you know, maybe to pump that uh, or, or, or to provide irrigation, uh, you know, so that you can, you can have the agriculture needs met. Um, and so uh, basically his uh, um, Dilemma Triangle looked at uh, solutions in the form of technology assets, service-based solutions, or a combination of all of these. Uh, and then the second half of it was a simulation platform, and it evaluates the impact of these value propositions. Um, it allows, uh, you know, to test, you know, different ideas. Um, it allows, uh, you know, scenario exploration. And this gives social entrepreneurs a, a tool uh, to prepare budgets and also to attract investors. Um, uh, you know, uh, three scenarios were considered in this process, you know, like worst case, best case, sufficient case. And what this does is it allows a social entrepreneur to come up with a range of like what, what, what type of budget is needed. Uh, and then the other thing is, is system dynamics is used uh, and, and uh, you know, this connects to uh, a crowdfunding platform. This attracts investors, and it also allows those who invest, you know, to understand, you know, the type of funds that are needed and also the results of, uh, you know, of their funds that they provide. And down at the bottom left, we see the work of Andrew Nair. And uh, what Andrew did was, is, uh, you know, she recognizes that there's certain you know, technology out there, you know, we have the smart aquanet, we have the smart nano grid, uh, but she also uh, looked at, you know, not just, uh, you know, food, energy, and water, but she took another step towards sanitation. And so she looked at and used the dilemma triangle to solve issues related to that. And so um, basically she had a, 
you know, procedure and lets you identify smart solutions. And uh, she used an example where she made evaluations between wetlands, bioenergy, solar, photovoltaic, uh, thermohydrolysis, and, and uh, micro, microbial fuel cells. Uh, and, uh, and basically the outcome of this was, you know, the microbial fuel cell was a good technology. And then uh, what you have over on the bottom right is, uh, you know, my student, uh, Haley Souk, and what Haley has done is she has looked at, Haley's looked at uh, power management or rural microgrid. Uh, you know, there's issues with these, uh, you know, because you have limited power. And she used the compromise decision support problem to allocate limited energy in these situations. So uh, we're basically trying to understand the relationship between energy and quality of life. Those both impact one another. And I currently have a new student who's coming in, and he's looking at a method to network microgrids and support outages and resilience. So then basically all this, you know, it comes right back up to the work that Abhishek laid out. Uh, there's cloud access for the use of the dilemma triangle, and then also uh, techniques to manage the essential functions of the microgrid online. Um, and so basically these are our areas of expertise. Um, I think I'm running short on time, so I'm not going to go into these. Uh, I want these just to be in the slide deck so that you can see these. Um, but basically, we're looking at the intelligent decision-based realization of complex uh, systems. And by a complex system, we're looking at cyber, physical, social systems. And, uh, you know, these are often hard to uh, study because we don't have complete information. And so there's simulation tools, you know, to uh, uh, to do that as well that we're developing. And so basically the slides also provide an overview of uh, what's going on at the three respective universities that are involved with this. <clears throat> and then this is uh, my second to last slide. But basically what we need here is, is, you know, we're universities here in the United States and we need help with uh, collaboration in India, uh, you know, so that we can understand the technique, the, uh, the socio-technical relationship in rural India. You know, what is it that defines the quality of life? How is energy and quality of life related? So we, you know, we want to develop simulation tools to help social entrepreneurs and to help, you know, with the development uh, uh, in these communities. Then we also are looking for other collaborators uh, just, you know, throughout the world to, uh, uh, you know, develop these tools to uh, various global contexts. Um, we do have opportunities for collaboration, uh, you know, also through education, faculty development. There's online training seminars uh, you know, that can be provided, student development. You know, we'd like to work with you to supervise PhD students. Uh, you know, if you have students that are interested in summer internships, that's something that we would like to work with you as well on. And uh, we also have online courses, uh, you know, at our respective universities that, you know, students and uh, faculty can participate in. So here's our information uh, and uh, look forward to hearing from anyone who's interested and thank you for the time. Yeah, thank you, Professor John. Thank you very much for your very, very exhaustive presentation. It was a very nice presentation and you have shown us a path that how academia as well as uh, NGOs and the startups, they can work together and play a really meaningful role. And you are also looking for collaboration. I think uh, uh, most of us are trying to collaborate with each other for the of humanity. Now, with this, I will quickly go to Vidyadhar Subudhi. Uh, Dr. Vidyadhar yeah. Subudhi, please take over. Oh, yeah. Good afternoon to everyone. And uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak about. Uh, I don't have slides, I will only see five minutes or maybe less than that. Uh, so, uh, I am very thankful to Professor Haruk uh, Mitri and uh, Dr. Das, uh, who uh, actually uh, invited me to participate in this uh, conference. Uh, prior to that, uh, we had a little discussion. And what emerges that uh, IIT Goa is a new IIT. And uh, among us, the new IIT, IIT Goa is placed in, uh, you know, Goa is a place where a lot of things are uh, to be done. 
and uh, until today we are running our uh, institute in a uh, temporary campus in uh, goa engineering college campus and uh, we are planning to shift the uh, permanent campus as soon as it is ready and uh, the government of goa has allotted a land to us in a very remote area that is a village area rural area and the concept of iit is not known to them what is an iit and how it will improve the, uh, their uh, work supply and all that and there is a lot of education coming from the rural area that at least uh, these people are of a wrong impression as it is uh, when it iit comes here so our ecology uh, uh, you know environment will be lost so we are in the process of uh, you know trying to uh, get the right uh, information to them because we can say it creates a lot of uh, wrong things to happen so uh, having uh, that in mind and the second aspect uh, what we look forward uh, is that iit goa has a mission that uh, it looks forward the sustainable development of uh, not only goa but for the human society uh, in particular uh, you know uh, it looks for so while i say the sustainable development as the engineers or an uh, engineering institute of uh, you know national importance we have some responsibility to uh, Shoulder, and uh, we at IIT Goa are very much involved in a uh, couple of uh, renewable energy research uh, issues, and uh, uh, we basically work on uh, photovoltaic systems, photovoltaic systems, and work on wind energy conversion system. And in Goa, particularly, the average uh, wind, uh, you know, uh, velocity is around 10 km per hour, and also it is also a place where the solar irradiation. Uh, is uh, around uh, 2000 uh, kilo uh, watts hour for meter square so both the wind and uh, the sun uh, both are uh, plentifully these both uh, renewable uh, sources are plentifully available here so what is the proposition that uh, we be helping the rural uh, so, uh, people uh, rural areas by adopting this rural area to uh, to have the distributed generations uh, where uh, instead of uh, just depending upon the conventional power system we can have, have our dispersed power system we can design a microgrid there for them and we take a project and which will integrate both the photovoltaic and uh, the uh, wind energy uh, uh, sources or distributed generation sources together to come up with a microgrid and uh, that is one of the <laughs> and the second agenda what we look for is that uh, as uh, one of my predecessors uh, has already said that there are a lot of roles of control uh, intelligent control for this uh, you know uh, the uh, sustainable uh, development and one of the key areas we look forward that uh, is basically use of uh, wireless sensor based control monitor the uh, the uh, the irrigation purpose for the rural area where we can contribute to uh, uh, take the help of automation for improving the agriculture and we also look forward to use almost uh, all the possible ways how the iot can be useful for uh, the uh, plantation because the kaju plantation uh, and also the agriculture is very much uh, you know uh, active here in uh, rural areas in the goa uh, community and along with that we also look forward that the fishery uh, fishery is a big, big aspect so our technology so as a uh, institute as an institute of national importance uh, we will uh, try to collaborate with uh, you know uh, the sarmukhya and uh, other uh, uh, groups where, where we will get uh, the, uh, the kind of uh, support and collaboration in uh, reaching out these rural areas uh, to uh, develop our technology for the welfare of this rural society and uh, therefore the community will have uh, they will be improved and as in the whole goa will see the change uh, the change in its society uh, in uh, terms of the uh, technological advances for the sustainable development of goa in particular the rural areas so this is what uh, is our uh, plan in the uh, coming uh, years to uh, focus on and i look forward to the collaboration with uh, sun mukho and other uh, you know leading uh, organizations uh, in order to achieve our uh, vision plan as i mentioned thank you thank you thank you very much dr uh, vidyadhar subodhi you have uh,
summarized it very well and what i like that you have not used the slides so we could save some time thank you very much and before going to the next speaker i would, would like to appreciate the initiative taken by iit goa that they have studied the local conditions that there is a wind speed and also they are having solar radiation such that they can use the hybrid system using uh, solar panels as well as wind energy so this is the way everybody should work we have to go out to that local we have to find out the local conditions and accordingly we should propose so this is the way forward for everybody who is trying to implement technology in a certain area the technologies which may be very very useful and successful in us may not be able to work in india so we have to go for local solutions that is the uh, conclusion we can draw from his uh, talk now quickly we will go over to digbijay choudhury i request uh, dr das to make him a presenter yes good afternoon everyone happy to be here I'm just saving a few seconds by starting off even before the video. Shake up, you are the host. You can make present. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And I am going to run through a presentation very quickly. First so, of all, thank you for finally using our, I know, our background. <laughs> <laughs> we have to be everywhere. So the so. Uh, uh, comes from the word social business and it's inspired by uh, Mahatma Gandhi ji who said earth provides enough for every man's needs but not every man's greed my next slide is taking from what mr faruk sri said earlier today what is social what is business entrepreneurs he defined it very well so giving credit to him i jump to the slide what sobers does it looks at social business more from the angle of a profit oriented social start up and not just a break even kind of a social entrepreneurship because the main intent is that we need to also make uh, the social entrepreneurship more aspirational that people should look forward to it and not something that they have to impose or go and that only have a profit and the people there in the rural areas who are social entrepreneurs do well for themselves and become role models for others the next slide is so what does sobers do we provide uh, i'll again take a from what sir brian heap said integration and coordination is the key and what sobers does is provide a holistic multi stakeholder and a collaborative ecosystem for social startups which takes what a social incubator does across various sectors because as we have already discussed the problems are interlinked and layer tech with access to human capital social capital and market connect which are the essential parts for a social startup i won't go into the detail but the platform in essence would act like an amazon of social enterprise which is basically connect the dots many a times there are work happening in silos but the connectivity is not there whether it is to the volunteers whether it is to skill training whether it is to the government and institutions and ngos academic institutions so the entire job of sobers platform or vision is to connect the dots for the startups by creating win win partnerships between the stakeholders we don't need to uh, invent every solution a lot of the existing problems can be solved by just bringing the people together and creating a win win and smartly orchestrating an exponential leverage of existing technologies to begin with and also then to lead it into incubation so uh, our uh, over the last one and a half years we have accelerated more than 23 startups across these various sectors and across uh, uh, geographies various states so that that worked very well what did not work was when we wanted to create or incubate new social startups we found we could not find the people because most of the entrepreneurs in the rural areas or the qualified people there's a brain drain as we know happening to tier 2 and tier 1 cities and abroad so that's the way it flows so it was very difficult to find new entrepreneurs on the ground and hence all of these pieces of the sobers ecosystem we are uh, integrating them at one place which will be a role model where we can both grow new social startups and give a 
a playing field or a test bench for existing startups to demonstrate their, uh, their solutions at scale. And that is what we are calling Arise. It's a smart villages incubator. Arise means stands for Accelerating Rural Innovation and Social Enterprise for India. And it will focus on three main areas. The art of social business is awareness. It begins with that, with a social entrepreneur, rural entrepreneur having more exposure and a vision of what could be. So that is critical to increasing both their passion and their confidence, that exposure, and also seeing success stories which inspire them. And building a resilience, because entrepreneurship, we all know, is a tough journey. And then the skills and other enablers of funds, capital, uh, co-working space, logistics, all of those parts of an incubator make sense. If you have the awareness and resilience, then the tools can actually yield results is the, um, the approach we are taking. And this is manifesting uh, in our first uh, Arise incubator. We start at a place called Pandarpur. It's in a rural area of Solapur district. You can see that on the map. And uh, uh, we have pulled together different players uh, which is a local institution which has a good track record of social innovation, research, uh, as well as a good social connect, so that we are able to reach the ground and have a social capital that we can tap. So that is the Swery College. Then IIT Alumni Foundation, Wheels Foundation has come on board as a knowledge and funding partner. So that gives us a uh, foot into the IIT network, both for knowledge, technologies, mentoring, and eventually possibly funding also. Uh, uh, from the broader network. And over the next five years, Sobas via Arise Pandarpur will discover over 1,000 rural entrepreneurs, support 60 plus ideas, take them into the incubator, out of which we graduate 30 plus sustainable, scalable, replicable so rural social startups. And at least one third of them will be below poverty line of women led businesses. In doing so, the location has been selected so that it's a border uh, area uh, district of Maharashtra. So as the um, impact increases, the circle of influence will cover over 5,000 villages in Maharashtra and the bordering Karnataka and Telangana. And then there are two other centers uh, coming in the north and east of Maharashtra. I skip that part to just the time. And we have a hub and for centers in non because you know it's actually it will actually the non which connects to the metro and um, all kinds of permutations and combinations. I will jump this. And the last is apart from the ecosystem where we are pulling the uh, innovator, we are also driving two large push ideas, which will tie together a lot of the solutions in our belief. One is to create a high trust brand, uh, organic brand, under which aggregation of organic farmers can happen, you know, that, that uh, large brand allows for a scale that will allow a lot of agri-planner training, model farms, technologies, a scale to bring, make that happen. And uh, a very interesting aspirational community where a lot of professionals in cities now want to move to a rural area but need good infrastructure. But they want to have fresh food, farm to folk, things like that. So we are creating a urban eco-villages. And the first one will be coming uh, near Mahabalipuram, uh, 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 near Pond between Mahabalipuram and Pondicherry, about 93 acres. It's a sustainability-focused, net-zero uh, rural real estate community for professionals. It will also act like a hub for skill development and a social entrepreneurship in the surroundings. And part of the commercial income from that property will subsidize all the impact-related activities. And lastly, I would like to end with something uh, which Vargis Kurian, uh, one of the most amazing social entrepreneurs of a country said, India's place in the sun would come from the partnership between the wisdom of its rural people and the skill of its professionals. So that is what Sobas believes. It is not about someone going and giving something, but it is more about empowering and also taking the rural wisdom and bringing that as sustainability even into the urban area. So it has to be bi-directional, and that's what our ecosystem in Pandarpur as a starting point hopes to carry out. And I thank you. You can uh, email me or drop me um, even a WhatsApp or a phone message. It would be uh, happy to connect. Thank you for having me here. Look forward to some wonderful work together. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Digbaya Chaudhary ji, for doing really wonderful things at Sobas.
yes i'm done what i yes. liked about your presentation is cutting the dots and second important thing do not invest energy and time on reinventing the wheel because those things are already in public domain let us utilize that knowledge in building a solution which is creating a problem for a for problem which is creating problem for the society so the most important thing everybody is telling that collaboration is the key so thank you very much and i request all the startups especially in the social entrepreneurship and another important point is what you have brought out is bring into the social entrepreneurship because when the mindset of having a, a social entrepreneurship uh, is thing that is break even phenomenon lot more younger generations will be inclined to point out the solutions from the for the villages and your art program that is awareness resilience and tools and aim of creating 1000 plus rural innovators are really commendable thank you very much for joining us and informing us about soba thank you now to go to the next speaker i would like my mr om babu so please uh, join us and uh, ram babu is there thank you puneet am i audible yeah. ram pappu ram pappu yeah sorry sorry yeah. that is my mistake uh, i think dan is also waiting so yeah after ram let dan dan go yes yes sure okay uh, puneet is my slide visible yeah it's visible now okay, thanks uh, dr ashok uh, puneet for this opportunity i'll try to be extremely brief uh, really appreciate wonderful presentations uh, from all the speakers and uh, probably i'll not be saying anything new uh, it's a kind of a amalgamation of everything that's all coming together it's a beautiful opportunity so our focus is empowering gram panchayat clusters in india towards holistic and sustainable development this is our core focus okay and in our last four years we have realized that uh holistic uh, development has to be sustainable and more important holistic and i'll uh, explain to you what i mean by that but we've also realized one thing that unless and until our gram panchayats which is a third government in india we have the federal government we have the state government and then you have the panchayat panchayati raj institutions unless the panchayati raj institutions are empowered in true letter and spirit which means funds functions and functionaries they have to be empowered and this is what our core focus is uh we use design thinking to bring about sustainable change and very quickly when i'm saying design thinking can you convert the mystery of rural development or holistic development from a mystery to a heuristic can we make it an algorithm so i know context will change from state to state from cluster to cluster but if you have a frame for development then replication and scale can also happen okay so here is our i'll be extremely uh, brief this is a community development framework that has come together and this is not uh, a mission samrit this is mission samrit facilitated this there were bureaucrats there were sarpanchas there were grassroots ngos there were academia who all came together in a design thinking workshop series of workshops this is what has come about personal development social development economic development ecological development are the four first four blocks personal social economic d1 d2 d3 d4 D5, D6, D7. I call as institutional development of our gram panchayats, which means planning. That means even gram panchayats needs to have vision, mission, understand needs, schemes, funding, gram panchayat development plans, planning process, governance and execution. D6 and D7. I heard many speakers say this today that, uh, I, I, in fact, this was very much stressed by Nagendra ji that uh, panchayati raj institution has to be empowered and they have to be a very critical player in this whole development process. right and now uh, from the corporates and from ngos there are a lot of management principles like you know uh, using project management principles but how about using the same concepts at the gram panchayat level can we understand the, uh, uh, you know work with them to make a scope time cost management review good governance and finally the stakeholder management now this is a uh, not a theoretical framework this framework is today backed by now if you really look at it puneet in each area in personal development there are sub elements 
So in personal development, uh, our major focus is mindset transformation. Unless and until people have an aspirational, uh, you know, mindset and a growth mindset, and if we can see it, if we can help them visualize their own uh, model village, that is a start. <laughs> and we have an intervention. <laughs> So uh, that is a fundamental thing, and I heard even uh, uh, Uttara, and I even ha heard later even uh, you know the lady Pudima ji also speaking about it. Mindset transformation is very very fundamental. This is our focus. So this is the sub elements that are there, and in social development we are looking at education, health, nutrition, village infrastructure, social justice, women. Now each and every one of the sub elements is backed up by a proper. Standard operating procedures which we have with various partners. So these are all these partners who are working to solve some of these problems in this in this in this framework. So as you rightly said a few minutes ago, there is no need to invent anything new. There is nothing in India which has not been solved by somebody or the other. The question is of scale. So if we can celebrate, if we can connect, and if we can catalyze, connecting the dots, you have various partners. So if we can work with Sobus. If I can work with all the other, uh, if I can work with Mahindra Rice and bring them into the same work and then take it. So this is the framework that we have. Now, how do you take this framework to the clusters? What we are now doing is, for us, a Gram Panchayat cluster is a set of five Gram Panchayats, probably about 10 or 15 villages, 20 to 25,000 population, contiguous per watershed, preferably in the same administrative block. We will have a young person there, a cluster coordinator or a young fellow who is from the region, aspirational, wants to work with the people there, who is trained by the Government of India and by Mission Samrani. We are working with the Government of India in this initiative for developing role model clusters. Trained on the 73rd Amendment, on the 29 subjects which come under the Panchayati Raj. So he or she is a very strong catalyst for bringing in this model of development when working with the local community, working with the local community, learning from the local community in all humility, learning from them, sharing with them, and facilitating this development. So this is we are working in six states, 25 clusters, actually more than about 100 panchayats. So this is what we are doing today. What and this is working. I have various stories of change in each of these areas, but I will not go through them in a positive time. However, for us, the mindset transformation, how we do it, I'll just spend a minute there. Mindset transformation happens when in a cluster of gram panchayats, if I can take 50 people from 10 villages, 5-5 five, five from each village, an SAG leader, a Sarpanch, a youth leader, and if you take them to role model villages, when they go to role model villages, they see, seeing is believing. When you see Hibre Bazar village or Anna Hazare's village, you will learn a lot. You will experience what is happening there. You will write notes in a diary. You will visualize, okay, how will my own village happen? That, that facilitates it. I'll just show you this picture. Here, Sarpanch is from Jammu are coming and visiting Hibre Bazar village and taking a tour, right? And they're actually going through and learning about watershed management, which we spoke about, right? And they're actually going through a circle time, spending time with the serpent, Popatrao Pawar in the night, understanding this change that happened, the constraints that he went through. And then they go back inspired. This is the first step, right? And then they go through a designing workshop later, okay? And this is what has happened. Again, another bunch of serpents all the way from Jammu came to Kerala to see model villages in Kerala. Uh, by doing this, this experiential uh, transformation happened. This is a young chap called Akis in uh, Rajauri, in near the line of control in Jammu. Now, over the last two years, he's kind of been transformed, and uh, the results are showing. Child-friendly Gram Panchayat Award by the Ministry of uh, Rural Development in Panchayati Raj, right? So this is how the mindset transformation is so important in changing the mindset. I'm just going to stop with that. What is not working? Because this intervention was so beautifully designed where people had to travel and uh, experience role modeling. Uh, COVID came, program came to a standstill. Now I'm re-engineering it to do a digital virtual yatra. Digital virtual yatra and taking it forward. We are engineering it, it will happen. Now this program, which we are partnering with the government of India, we are, we are in 10 clusters. Other corporates are also adopting this uh, model. Government of India got energized and said, in the first phase, they're doing 120 clusters. In the second phase, they want to take it to additional 250 clusters. So now this whole Samridhi Yatra, Unmukh workshop, this framework which we have developed with the government, hopefully now we are showing there is uh, why to do holistic development is clear, what to do is clear. The challenge has always been how to do it, how to do it. So you need to have an SOP, a framework to do it, bringing these partners and trying to do it. 
This is what we're trying to do. I'll stop it there. Thank you again very much, Dr. Ashok and Puneet, for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ram, for the wonderful Thanks a lot, Ram. Training, as well as summarizing that mindset transformation is important. I think through this IEEE BSCC platform, we are also trying to do the same thing from the entire community of electrical and electronics engineers that their mind should be changed and they should not be looking towards only IT or uh, other hardware companies, but they should be also trying to put themselves in the shoes of uh, local development as well as social entrepreneurs. Your idea of aspirational youth working with local community and most importantly, in the beginning, uh, during Panchayat Secretary uh, presentation also I told, it is not the initiative. It is the implementation where India is lagging. So how to do it? That is the, so if we are somehow able to find out that solution and implementation plan, definitely we will be successful because there is no dearth of intelligent people. There is no dearth of intellect as well as initiatives in India. And people are willing to do it. The only problem what we are facing is implementation and how to do it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, immediately after this, I will go to Professor D. N. Rao. Professor D. N. Rao, welcome. Yeah, thank you. And over to you. Yeah, can I share my screen? Uh, uh, if I if allow me. Yes. You are a presenter. Thank you. Um, yeah, can I see this? Yes, D. N. Rao. Yeah. Yeah, and again, uh, quickly, I have about 30 years. Go into presentation mode. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, I have about 30 years of experience in this. Uh, from IIM Calcutta, I moved into work in rural development, and I am actually kind of trying to uh, sum up in the next five minutes uh, what works, what did not work, and what am I presently thinking in the smart and sustainable village model. Vision, yes, all of us started with Gandhian vision. You know, anybody who's in development sector would start with Gandhi. Somehow I realized that uh, I, I somehow lost faith that it can be implemented. It's a great thing, but can it be implemented in, in, in the 21st century? The industrial vision we all know is unsustainable. You know, we have all read to Makar, you know, all his uh, you know, work and you know, um, how uh, this all economy as if people did not matter, uh, society wise, systems wise, it's unsustainable. Presently, I'm now thinking that I'm actually um, uh, thinking that with IIoT and all this, you know, um, smart technology is coming up. The scientific optimization of input-output consumption cycle, which is the most important thing in development, I think is possible. And uh, that's what we're looking at, how we can use low input with optimum output, sustainable consumption, and the use of smart technology. And we're looking at these models. And one key important thing I've always been bothered about is scale. You know, you know India is a country of... Uh, villages and a large number of people, so whatever we need to do can be scaled. Always our role has been uh, institutional. Uh, what do you mean by institutional? I always give the example of uh, Sri Krishna and Mahabharat. Uh, what he did in Sri Mahabharat, nobody knows. I, exactly nobody can say what Sri Krishna did. He actually did nothing. But you cannot think of Mahabharat without Sri Krishna. So the role of institution is also like that. It's very difficult for you to say what an institution actually does. But without it, we really can't think what will happen. So institutional role focuses on catalyzing. That, that's the key word is catalyzing. Uh, the people, technology, resources, markets, and governments. And I've been always through, I mean, believing in institutional role. And uh, that's where we're trying to catalyze the people, technology, resources, markets, and governments. How do you kind of bring all of them together? And I think my previous speakers also spoke about that integration. That's, that's important. I think. And what I, what I mean by smart approach, it means the technology that uses the most optimum algorithm to match demand pattern with production resource utilization to obtain overall scientific or systemic efficiency, largely given by data, data and models, right? Okay. So we're looking at systemic efficiency at the level of society, not just at the level of production or distribution, but overall as a society, systemic efficiency. I'm stuck. Uh, I'm yeah, where we stand today, uh, in the last 15 years, uh, in my new avatar as Centurion promoter, yes, we have scaled certain interventions, we have five campuses, we have done a lot of development, over 200,000 people we have reached, over 32 industries we have reached, we have uh, employed more than 3,000 people, uh, including, uh, we have opened about 16 million bank accounts. At one time, 
We have reached 28,000 villages in 13 states in India. That's a scale we could obtain over a period of six to seven years. So yes, we have been able to scale in the last 10 to 15 years, almost to 28,000 villages in 13, 13 states. Right from Manipur to Manipal, we were able to scale our interventions. What worked for us? Uh, skill development worked of local communities to harness market opportunities for employment, largely migration driven. Okay, uh, it's not local employment, it's migration driven leading to inward remittances. Uh, what happened to Kerala with Dubai is happening to Odisha with local you know, remittances and local economic conditions. What is also uh, worked is optimum optimization of resource utilization through user group formation and management. We have worked with many self-help groups in the past when I was in extra and you know, group con user groups in the villages, empowering them and giving them resources, whether it is financial, water resource management groups, watershed groups, that seem to work. Use of aggregation platforms, which you are now using in agriculture, for example, Kalgudi, for example, which will help bring producers, suppliers, and marketers onto one world. This seems to work. The oilization or uberization seems to be kind of taking roots in rural areas, and that seems to be working. Local enterprise promotion in primary agriculture processing and rural transport seems to work. Local enterprise promotion in other areas do not seem to be that much you know, successful. Cluster approach seems to work in some areas in enterprise promotion. Scaling up a single point or agenda programs are initiatives. So for example, you do financial inclusion, large scale, yes, it works. You do uh, self-help groups and microfinance, large scale, it works. You do power sector reforms, large scale, it works. We could even take to 20,000, 50,000. Not only us, others have taken. Serendipity seems to work. Actually means something very planned. You do a lot of planning and go back. It doesn't work. Whilst you see you go to the field and do start doing something, it actually grew. In fact, all our interventions started very, very, uh, you know, uh, accidentally, and that they actually grew into a very, very big intervention. What did not work? Integrating local economic needs with local enterprise needs. The Gandhian approach of self, you know, uh, enterprises, local enterprises solving local needs. It did not seem to work. Too much integrated interventions did not take off. We could not scale. Yeah, I have also seen Anna Hajar's model. I was very keen to bring it to Odisha. Adashitov scheme, 400 villages, 500 villages. But you want to do 5,000 villages? Some of it didn't seem to work. Promoting vehicles for implementation of multiple agenda at the same time. The same self-help group, SSG women. Can I load health program onto her? Can I load education onto her? Can I bring a bit more complex into the program? It didn't seem to work. It worked when they were delivering self-help or they were delivering you know, credit. But it didn't work. If you say you will also do Anganwadi or some other thing, some other program, some other problem they solve, it did not work. Too much design interventions. You know, I've seen some of us, you know, in the previous presentations putting in too many dots there, connecting dots and all. That seemed to work on the drawing board, but when we actually took it to field, they did not take off. You know? So too, a well-designed vehicle perhaps doesn't work in rural roads. Okay. So these are some of the things. That is, integrated interventions, large scale, did not seem to work. They seem to work wonders in pilots. Small scale, but when I'm trying to scale it up, it did not work. What am I presently thinking? And that's where I actually looked at this whole IT smart optimization to design integrated, locally optimized, globally scalable, sustainable economic models. I'm, I'm, I'm somehow now feeling with the technology, IT backbone, aggregation, Gandhian model perhaps now is feasible. Right? Uh, we have not done it yet, but I'm very excited with what Dr. Ashok has done and uh, in the village that he has done in uh, Odisha. There is no reason by using IT as a platform. I am talking about this local, local sustainable smart. He calls it, uh, a, you know, local uh, economic zones. I don't see why it should not work with IT backbone, uh, you know, aggregation using a platform, new technologies, data-driven approaches, IoT devices. You bring in this technology backbone. I think the Gandhian model perhaps can be revisited. I'm very excited now. I mean, I'm 53 now, and it's 2020. But I think given this, uh, I would like to take a shot at it and see if it can be scaled. You know, can integration be scaled using technology? This is my current thinking. Thank you. You are very young, DN. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, a long way to go. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Professor Ian Dao. Thank you very much for providing your insight on scientific optimization of input-output consumption cycle. So very nice conceptualization of uh, this question where you have talked about optimization and the most important thing what you have told I think, is 
beginning half done rather than sitting on the drawing board and scratching let us go to the field and start working you will be successful in most of the time then another important thing what i can derive from your presentation is keep it simple rather than complicating the thing make it simple definitely in 99% time you are going to be a successful locally optimized global solutions are need of the hour but it's still like there is no need of uh, global scalability if we are able to solve the local problems again and again what is coming out that we have to really think about local solutions and from one country to different country solutions are going to be slightly different concept will be same so let us focus only on local solutions rather than scaling up at global level that is the problem where most of us are facing we indians they really want to be globally known immediately i think uh, what we would like to have local solutions for local india and more and more people should be deriving that thank you very much now we will be going our next speaker mr bhagwati patnaik who is consultant at CIIE and CPS for two years. Yeah, great. Here comes the second speaker with our with our background. Yes. Good evening, sir. Thank you. Go ahead, Bhagwati. And you want to share morning. something? Yeah, I'll say my PPT, but there's a noise coming from the room. I request all of you to please mute yourself. I think, uh, yeah, it's clear now. Bhagwati, let's try to make it brief. Sorry. Yes, please. Thank please. you for your support. I have come to the last slide. Yeah, um, good evening, everyone. Um, there are a lot of uh, known faces, familiar faces, and the rest are familiar mindsets. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, I have worked uh, for a time with uh, Dr. Das, even Pado, John, and uh, Dr. Sugudi also. Namitava from Salamandi, a lot of people in the same similar background, and uh, in, in climate change uh, graphs, in smart villages, smart campus, stakeholder mobilization for the development and uh, smart kind of things, and uh, sustainable community development kind of things. So, uh, just recently changed my you know, profile to something else. I start working with the uh, enterprise development at uh, rural, also at urban level. Like uh, there's a startup incubation center this is where I'm working with uh, the tech startups in the TBI as well as the few government of India MSME schemes schemes where we are um, allowing the clusters to be developed with modern technology um, to produce export uh, quality of products and simultaneously assuring a permanent uh, employment for the rural people so that uh, the migration as well as the poverty can be you know, very crystal. The objective of this scheme is to empower the villages to avail them permanent livelihood employment, then entrepreneurship. Um, this facilitates uh, develop community enterprises, then individual enterprises. To upskill villages to the current market needs, uh, upskilling has been a very huge gap in village development. Uh, upscaling through soft and hard interventions, doing appropriate technology intervention to the various types of clusters to meet the domestic demand and also open for exports. The first and the uh, the huge project that is running now across uh, India is uh, SPURTI, which uh, stands for Scheme for Fund um, Scheme of Fund for Regeneration of Traditional Industries. This is meant for the, you know, the clusters of villages where we have a lot of um, traditional industry uh, kind of things, clusters we develop from fire to paddy to various fruits uh, clusters are there, vegetable clusters are there, dark cereal, pulse clusters are there, you know, the handicraft clusters are there. 
So all that the going unorganized or a little bit of the, the semi organized status in uh, the clusters, the scheme want to enclose all that into one platform and taking it to the very uh, recent uh, level of operations where they can meet the local national as well as the export kind of demands uh, from India. And it has been, it has been uh, more emphasized uh, during this time of COVID, which uh, there was a target of something 500 clusters, but now it has been taken to something 1,000. And in 2022, it will be another 1,000, so another 2,000 clusters will be there in India. Uh, currently, there are uh, 598 clusters being uh, you know, deployed officially, and around the 300 clusters have started working. Um, you know, construction kind of thing. There are 100 clusters have already started productions in their uh, you know, respective uh, you know, common facilitation centers. Uh, so that's about uh, these uh, two things. Uh, and there are, there are two, two kind of uh, you know, models it is coming up with. One is regular uh, cluster, which uh, takes up around 500 additions, which uh, uh, a project can be designed up to 2.5 crores. Uh, and a major cluster where the number of additions or the beneficiaries could be, uh, have to be more than 500, and uh, where the project can be, uh, cost can be going up to 5 crores. And uh, for, for, uh, for small states like CD states and uh, Northeast region, where the Population is very less. The the habitats are very scattered. So in that case, it can go up to 50 also. That the lowest number of the additions that can come in a cluster, and uh, they can be funded up to 250, uh, 2.5 crores because the you know the geography is very odd and the uh, the, the same similar kind of project takes more uh, cost to be deployed. Mm -hmm. Only in, in Northeast, we think about if you look at um, like it's Assam and Manipur, who has around 20 odd clusters each, but rest of the states uh, are not having a single cluster even. Uh, I, I would uh, say, Dr. Subhuti, that Goa has no cluster from Skurti. It's a very holistic and very good project. Uh, um, like uh, IIT Goa can think of applying for a cluster development for the front of Skurti. Uh, I can connect you to the right uh, node agency, and you can be. Um, uh, like implementing as well as the technical agency for this. Okay. Uh, next would be these are the various industries uh, which run in villages and uh, uh, school, uh, you know, takes in all these mineral based industries, forest based industries, agro based food processing industries, polymer chemical based industries like materials, uh, um, rural engineering and biotech industries. Um, here, you renewable energy also is there. Uh, handmade paper fiber industry, service and textiles, fire and cathy kind of things. These are there. So, there are two kind of uh, interventions this project includes. One is soft intervention with the, uh, with the uh, beneficiaries, the additions have been with uh, the required skills, with, uh, kind of uh, digital intervention kind of things. And hard intervention is the uh, physical construction of the things, machineries, cinemas, uh, communications, and all that could be built inside the uh, in a cluster with the village, the people, the cluster will own this for a couple of decades and make it the permanent uh, source of employment, source of uh, economy for them. Right. The next one I will be talking about is Aspire. Uh, so we, uh, I'm currently working as a management agency for uh, 25 to 26 clusters. Uh, we started with uh, single groups, and uh, now I'm working on 25 DPS, 26 DPS to be uh, presented this month. So around 20 clusters will be voted uh, by next month end, uh, which will be working in Delhi, Jharkhand, and uh, Andhra, Chhattisgarh, and Delhi. <laughs> Uh, the, next, uh, the next one what we are working with is Aspire, is an MSME scheme again, uh, uh, which can fit into the kind of discussion that has been going uh, from the morning. Is uh, it's it's kind of it's, uh, it has two models. It has two models. Yes, yes, thank you, sir. It has two models. One is uh, LBI, one is DBI. Uh, it's kind of a hub, a hub and spoke kind of thing you can uh, fit in into this, uh, this under this scheme. LVNs are the, the livelihood business incubators, which are the lower technology centers, 
uh, where the uh, technology or the machinery kind of things to be uh, developed, um, which are rural fit kind of things so that people can be trained and uh, they can use it for, for the you know growth of their efficiency in country. And TBIs can be taken uh, to the next level. These technologies can be taken to the next level to TBIs. So for a particular um, you know, cluster which can do good, the nearby academics, the nearby uh, central central of excellence kind of things, uh, institutes can take it. Those concepts and put under this scheme to um, to, to uh, kind of uh, planning or uh, research as well as training center for the low end technologies as a TBI they can get it for a high, higher end technologies uh, for the clusters. But this can fund up to uh, you know a couple of two crores, two crores of two. Yeah. And then there is a target of 150 such uh, centers and the current is around 75 80 centers. So another 175 80 centers can come up uh, around India uh, with this problem scope uh, for the local like rural and the the, the, the next uh, level of working can happen in the urban. So this can also be planned for the villages which we are discussing since now. Uh, there's one more is uh, micro small enterprises cluster development MSCEP. Uh, this is a cluster development uh, project which has a long uh, existence and uh, but it's less uh, the first less of this one uh, has been working very faster. So this, under this, you can also plan for infrastructure development for various clusters up to 10 crores, where the, it can go for a 60, 40, you know, you can go with the PPP model, the 40 can be um, arranged from the outside, and uh, the 60 can be given back in the year. And for special categories, still, it, it, it goes up to 80, 80% 80 of the, like, 8 crores can come from the and crores can be arranged locally. Uh, Great. Basically, yeah. basically, Mudra has also been here, you uh, know, kind of converging into the Scopi projects. It's like in Scopi, uh, there is ten percent to be uh, arranged by the, you know, the implementing agency who are the rural people. So um, the guys who are working good, but they don't have the support of finance, then we ask them to come up with a cluster, a kind of a group of partition can apply with the Scopi project to the bank. And they take around 10 lakhs uh, per head, and the seven to eight people can leave the uh, SPP where they can make uh, 40, 50 lakhs of uh, uh, loan can be taken with 7% interest, and uh, and the rest 90% can be funded to school fee, and they start the cluster uh, with a very good uh, return. They can repay the tax, uh, repay the loans in no time. So Mudra has been actively put into Scoti as a kind of a convergence, and uh, it's coming up very easily so for any like uh, implementing agency can pick up the projects. The NGO kind of people who have been putting together this year, they can take up the projects to uh, funding arrangement for this Mudra. So these three and there are many other things um, also existing uh, funds. Which can be discussed, and uh, because because we are at a, uh, there are various states where there is no scope projects, and there are very good clusters. Um, those can be chalked out and uh, can be uh, specifically planned for the convergence of the various funds, um, and to define uh, this holistic aspect what we are discussing for a complete uh, smart village. So we we should just address the village energy needs, or the enterprising needs, or the social needs. At a different organization, at different, uh, I mean, at a different, uh, um, you know, implement label. Rather, we can come together and look at what are the different aspects of development and design from the very beginning step that what font can be put into what uh, you know sector and holistically the village can be designed and that we can have a complete. Uh, Outcome. Yeah, and that is what we yeah, and that is what we expect uh, from you to contribute to this document and uh, to this report. Thank, Thank you. And connect my partners in other states also so that uh, we can have it all over India. So Absolutely. Yeah, that can be done. Uh, Ashok, can I just ask a very quick question to Bhagwati? Very quick question. Please. I missed the earlier part uh, in the introduction part. I just want to know one thing: the CTTC concept. Is it there in every state? Uh, I see this part of the Ministry of uh, uh, Small and Micro 
MS, it is a part yeah. of the MS Ministry. Is there every is in every state? Is there a CTDC? Yeah, yeah. It's it's a, it's, it's a collaborative project for, uh, from different uh, foreign funding. Uh, there are Denmark okay. funding. There are uh, you know Germany funding. So there are technology centers under MSME who are there to facilitate the MSMEs uh, existing around for developing their uh, machineries and developing different technologies which can be implemented at the uh, MSME levels. So other than that, also we are having higher level uh, technology in, uh, in our intervention and uh, collaboration with uh, ISRO, uh, HAL kind of people for the. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Probably I'll connect with you offline because this yeah, is just a lot I wanted to be connected and thanks Ashok for bringing these kind of partnerships into this forum, right? I wanted this connect to take to my cluster development uh, program. Thank you, uh, Bhagwati. Yeah. I'll talk to you off. Thank you so much. So Thank we are not going to leave you around. So <laughs> we are all going to work together. Uh, and, no, no, this is really good. Yeah, and I wish this guy, I mean, Bhagwati could have also been in the earlier session because you're talking about two crores, two and a half crores, five crores, clusters of artists. I, I was yeah. thinking that I should move him to the finance, but you know, uh, <laughs> my finance session was too long now. So, but nevertheless, I think very good yeah. inputs we got. Yeah, it's, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bhagwati, for uh, making a wonderful presentation on the funding scheme, especially you brought out the concept of his Purti as well as up to 15 crore funding, which is really huge funding for any NGO or a startup. So thank you very much. And with this, we have uh, completed our this session. And I know... Uh, can you make for the presenter, uh, Chengappa? Yes, one second. So I know we are running late, so I will not take much time because we don't have even time for tea break as well. We are already even we are consuming the entire tea break and 30 minutes late. So over to Dr. Das again. Thank you very much for joining all the panelists as well as uh, speakers and delegates. So yes, thank thank you very much uh, for all of to all of you again uh, a virtual thank you a virtual plaque for being part of it and uh, we should uh, thank you very much. So shall we take a break or just move into the next one? <laughs> You might as well move into the next session, Ashok. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Move into the next one. Yes. Yeah. All right. So, uh, we, let's he can, move into the next one. He can give you a plaque for non-stop uh, uh, anchoring. We can then give you a plaque for non-stop anchoring. That is an anchor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. But uh, let me just uh, introduce uh, the next speaker. Uh, Ashok, sir, you are on mute. I have to sit up. Uh, sorry about that. All right. Yeah, so Dr. Sharat is uh, the chairman of DC Power. Um, he's a well known figure in terms of, um, you know, when we talk about rural sustainable or sustainable rural development. He has almost spent uh, more than 20 years uh, in this sector. He has been, you know, he has, you know, led many concepts, many initiatives in this sector. Um, he's, of course, one of my mentors, and he's the one who is responsible for taking me to the villages. So I blame on him whenever I face some challenge that you got me into it. But uh, Dr. Sharon will share his thoughts. He's, he has been, uh, you know, uh, he, he uh, ran this power force 
20 years. He's still the chairman. Uh, he has started many programs with Rockefeller Foundations. He was uh, he has a stellar career at BHL before this. So, you know, it's very hard to, you know, tell about him in such a short time. But uh, what he has to say, what he has to share today makes sense that how do we go, uh, how do we move forward into this sustainable smart villages? Um, uh, and how, what are the various approaches? There are two, three approaches that we have taken. There is a bottom-up approach, there is a top-down approach, there is a middle-up approach. So Dr. Sharon will touch upon some of these things and tell us that how we need to move forward, how this report needs to shape up so that we can you know, uh, take this agenda forward. So please welcome Dr. Sharon. Thank you, Ashok. Uh, do you think you could move the one slide that I have sent you just yes, today? Yes, I will do that, sir. Thank you so much. And then I will not use a slide. I'm just going to talk. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good. I'm just trying to get your slide up. Thank you. I think I can start a book for the slide. Yes. Yeah. So hope it is visible. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, friends and colleagues, uh, I don't have to repeat it, but we Indians have been struggling to find ways to remove poverty for the past 73 years. The first community development program was started by government of India in 1956. And umpteen policies and programs have followed it. We have always hoped that they would improve the living conditions of villagers. But most tragically for millions, the COVID-19 pandemic has dramatically exposed the colossal failure of our efforts to remove poverty from our villages. Much of what I have heard today, however, again gives me hope that much of this may help us to improve the situation. But, my, but I must also say that the echoes of my of similar many aspirational plans, they really frighten me. And they are still here very much on our platforms. All of us have our own assessment of why this is so. And many of us are trying our best to change the situation. I have at the fag end of my life, with 63 years of professional experience and 30 years of village development practice, I have decided that it's high time for me to focus on a single item agenda and demonstrate village up planning and village up top-down convergence process undertaken by villagers with help, of course, from outside, has a much better chance of accelerating change than any other current solution for planning and implementation. It is not possible to go into details of technologies and their applications now, but I hope very much that the that we will set up a mechanism for interaction with those who are interested to explore the technologies and its potential. And because I have seen today and heard today from many of you that the lack of a planned roadmap at the village level, the plan of training and skills, and the, plan, the lack of local optimization and participation of the villagers in village development pro programs is a lacuna that needs to be solved. In a nutshell, the village of planning tool is an analytical, predictive, and dynamic simulation and modeling tool which predicts the impact of policies and combination of local parameters via explicit 
cause and effect representations over many years. Our plan is quite advanced to develop and test this, this tool and the convergence process for planning at village, village clusters, district and district levels, and then converge the district plans at the state level. It has become possible to switch my focus now from technology and projects, because now we have available suitable, tested, reliable, and affordable technologies, smart or not, smart or dumb, high-tech or low-tech, which can, we can obtain in our own country or from abroad for meeting our college current village needs. We also have years of experience of deploying them in village projects, in plants set up and managed by villagers once they are trained. But bringing together technologies and money, which our country has in plenty for large-scale replication of proven integrated solutions has not been possible so far. So today, I want to talk to you about our concept, uh, about how do we go about developing, testing, and demonstrating the village up planning process and the village up and top down convergence process in a few districts in a country. First of all, I'm too old to manage such a development and testing program myself. And unless a village up team of motivated and competent younger people emerges to take the responsibility, this talk may very well see the end of my initiative. The good thing about this initiative is that it's a, that a motivated and active person or group who is already involved in village development as a village developer or a technologist or an entrepreneur or a manufacturer or a financier or a farmer or a trader or a trainer or an academician or a ma market prospector. No one need worry that they the, about giving up what he or she is already doing if he or she joins this project. Most of the elements of integration, such as resources, technologies, especially locally tested ones, efficiencies, costs, and local and social and economic conditions are very local and they will be the basic inputs for village up planning process. Every applicable technology or system or plant or product or a concept has a chance in an organized and optimized integrated village development project provided it helps achieve the ultimate goal of reducing village poverty better than other alternatives under local conditions. Which will mean that a large number of modules have to be developed to suit the conditions of villages in all regions of the country. We expect to get simulation and modeling expertise from experts, we have many of them in, at IITs and universities, and support from an experienced and successful dynamic simulation and planning team in the US who have used these techniques very successfully. The Village Up team will have to develop a proposal to raise funds to develop the package and calibrate and test it in one village panchayat with an op operational integrated project already running. Ideally, this should be followed by pilot projects in a few panchayats in different regions of the country, especially where suitable village development programs are already running are all being planned. We must remember that only solid results can lead to fruitful discussions with government agencies to finalize the village up top-down convergence process and convince them to modify current planning processes and practices and village up development programs. You may very well ask me about the benefits of such a radical switch over to new policy making process. Of course, the most important one is that the village planning process will greatly empower villagers and the panchayats, and the convergence process will vastly accelerate their social and economic progress. Because 
all the projects that you want to take up will move with in a different framework of implementation. It will also bring success to planners and decision makers who can cho choose those combinations of schemes and plans which promise the most realistic potential for meeting villagers' needs and achieving national, social, economic, and environmental targets most economically, even within the framework of their own political strategies and agendas. Next profit would be the village next benefit would be the villager planning tool will be equally advantageous to prospective investors. You have heard about the problem of bringing investors on a larger scale to villages. It will show them quite realistically the conditions under which specific local businesses and enterprises can be profitable in villages or clusters, allowing them to generate options to examine likely risks and look for ways to minimize, minimize them in very short time frame work, time frame of uh, undertaking the planning process. Then there is, you have heard today many times, there is the age old problem of in time progress review, monitoring and course correction of government programs in the villages. These essential elements of successful project management are just not being followed effectively from any of the village projects which are running today at the ground level. The village package can be adapted relatively simply to do so in a systematic and affordable manner. The field data will in any case be available digitally and they will be regularly compared to the existing results or the predicted results delivered by the uh, finalized plan for the villages. Managers can run these calculations again and again at regular intervals over long periods, analyze the reasons for deviations, and options can be generated to select the most effective way to correct undesirable trends. Corrective actions can be taken locally and at higher levels without wasted time and money. Such a review, monitoring, and course correction system can be used with great benefit by government policymakers, district magistrates, and block development officers, and panchayats and other development agencies. As the developer and operator of the first microgrid in the country, I can also say that such a planning can also help operators and owners of power plants and microgrids and investors and managers of businesses and economic enterprises to optimize their strategies for specific districts in the country. You may now, of course, wonder why I am so sanguine about the success of the village of program, which is something very new for India and may sound fairly complex at our first glance. This is firstly because some of us with knowledge and experience of current not too successful planning processes in the country and of the many schemes and programs which are running in the villages, we have been examining them and comparing them to the track record of dynamic simulation planning technologies for complex systems for a while. We have interacted with technology and project developers and users and have devolved the framework for a usable and affordable village up planning tool and a village up top down convergence process for India in that segment, the village up planning process can deliver a village centered, optimized and risk assessed package for the maximum impact at affordable costs. Village projects which are today built under politically aspirational, top-down, departmentalized, fragmented, and bureaucratic-driven programs 
uh, do not meet the requirements of the acceleration that's needed not only because of poverty situation in the country, but also because of the time limit or time limitation that have been forced on us by the climate change and the global temperature rise situations. The other advantage of such a planning process, of course, is that this can very easily and locally do the assessment for the adaptations which have to be uh, introduced in coming years, which are adaptations which are necessary in already are more realistic. The other reason for my activity is that I live in a country where village up, drop down conversions is a part of the daily life of policymakers, planners, and implementers, and I can see how they work on my day-to-day -day life. No one can know that Switzerland can manage such basic, manage, basic democracy and village up systems because it's a small country. Under today's conditions of our IT technologies and data conditions and our competence in IT and other technological and social and management practices, I have absolutely no doubt that it's to optimize the convergence of local plans, manage data, monitor and review progress in every district. And of course, here there is an excellent opportunity for our very enterprise-driven uh, IT and systems people. But ultimately, I am sanguine because I know from my own direct experience in villages in India and of inter interacting with the industrial and organized sectors and the corporate sectors and the experience of many of you that we certainly can manage such a process if we really want to do so. It is possible and affordable to train villagers. You are doing it all the time, many of you, and work with them actively to use modern technologies and processes more effectively to accelerate the development process. Many of you also know very well that such trained and empowered villagers are as capable as any other Indian to run and manage projects and plants in villages. Our country must give them a chance. Thank you very much Thanks. for giving me the opportunity. Thank you very much for giving, making this appeal to all of you. And thank you very much for the time that you have spent with me. Thank you. Yeah, apologies for the delays, Dr. Sharan, but I think I also appreciate you staying throughout the workshop, throughout this presentation, and two more hours to go. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I would I would really like to, you know, say it in our usual way, our thank you. Thank thanks, so thanks a lot. Uh, I would now invite our next speaker. Okay. Uh, fine. I just, this is a challenge. Okay. Uh, Sushil, Mr. Sushil Kumar, I hope you are there. So, uh, yeah. uh, uh, Namaskar, good evening. Namaskar, sir. Uh, just let me say a few words. So, uh, Mr. Kumar is the Deputy uh, Director General for the Telecom Engineering, uh, Telecommunication Engineering Center, TC, Government of India. And uh, the, uh, he has been 
in the he has been working on developing a roadmap on the technology side for the smart villages and uh, for the last two years that work is in progress um, i came into his contact about two years ago one and a half years ago and we have been trying to put together a roadmap for the policy for the standards so he comes from the standard side and he is also looking at the you know entire technology component of developing the smart villages uh, so he's a uh, uh, he's a master's from you know University of Roorkee, and uh, he has been he has served the you know government for almost 22 years, and he has been throughout in the telecommunication sector. So I'll uh, he's here today to tell us a bit about this report that is going to come out this month. Uh, hopefully, we are in the final phases of the report. And uh, he will explain us what is all in that report and uh, what do we expect. What are we? What should we expect to uh, to see next? Thank you, thank you, Sushil. And the floor is yours. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes. Uh, Your video is on. Uh, can you give me the? Uh, I've made a small presentation. Sure. I have come from the office just sure. now. Sure. Kengappa, can you move? Uh, can yeah. you give Mr. Kumar? Kengappa, or shall I claim the host? Okay. Thank good. You. Thank you. So, uh, are you getting my uh, screen? No, it has not shared yet. Okay. Just uh, share. You have to either share one application or share the whole screen. Yep. Now it's coming up. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this. Uh, mm. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Dasji, for uh, inviting me in this conference, and uh, I'm. Uh, uh, really uh, delighted. I could not attend the conference in the daytime because we have to attend the office and uh, uh, there is a, uh, several other meetings uh, going on in the office uh, and uh, I just came back from the office and I uh, 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 I joined this conference. Uh, I listened to previous speaker. Uh, 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 thank you very much for inviting me and uh, uh, this is really a wonderful conference on the smart villages uh, and uh, how we can improve the quality of life of uh, our uh, 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 of the rural community and uh, this is one of the slide i've taken from the document uh, which uh, we are preparing on a smart village and agriculture or we can say uh, the requirements for deploying smart services in the rural areas uh, if we see the uh, this is uh, we have taken from the itu uh, uh, document and uh, this is also the part of the document which we are preparing. This is uh, initially uh, we were having the telephone, then the computers and wearables. Uh, this uh, uh, no doubt uh, in India these things are very less in the uh, uh, rural areas as, as well as in the urban areas. We are not having the wearable devices, but these are coming uh, now. Then the broadcasting satellite, uh, this uh, then mobile mobile phones. Uh, uh, we are having uh, the tele density around uh, 143 percent in the urban areas, around 58 percent in the rural areas. But now the tele density in the rural areas is uh, increasing. Uh, this uh, then the internet and uh, the broadband, uh, the sensor networks, which will be, which is uh, very very important for the deployment of the smart services in the rural areas. And for this, we need the uh, telecom network, the ICT network, uh, IoT and ICT network will be helpful. For deploying smart services in the rural areas, uh, we need uh, to improve the. Uh, uh, we are creating uh, smart cities, um, but we have to create the smart villages also. And how we can extend the uh, uh, services using the technology? Uh, uh, let us see uh, then uh, uh, which services we can uh, extend in the rural areas uh, by using technology. Like uh, in the health domain, we can. Uh, extend remote consultation, telemedicine, remote monitoring, the health of, of a patient after surgery, or 
uh, this uh, then remote diagnostic medication reminders telemedicine wearable health devices wearable health devices will play a big role uh, not only in the rural area area even in the urban areas also because we don't have uh, the hospitals uh, sufficient number of hospitals and doctors uh, so these uh, smart devices will play a big role uh, in improving the uh, health services and even in the covid time you might have I heard the name of the smart thermometer, which uh, was developed by an Indian in uh, USA, and uh, it is uh, having the uh, Bluetooth connectivity in it. And uh, uh, this uh, temperature is communicated uh, through um, uh, through smartphones to uh, the um, uh, this server. And uh, suppose the people are having the smart thermometer, and uh, 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 anganwadi workers or anybody in the rural area, and uh, check, then uh, it will be very easy to detect whether the uh, pandemic has spread in some villages or some in some community. It will be easier, and uh, such type of thermometers can also be placed in the uh, this um, uh, at the airports or the crowded places. Uh, so technology will be very very important. Uh, similarly, we can have not only the smart thermometer, even the ECG machine uh, is coming uh, with the Bluetooth technology, the portable ECG machine. It has been developed by uh, the startups in Bangalore uh, and uh, even um, uh, Bark also. That, uh, uh, and uh, uh, using this uh, ECG machine, uh, the uh, uh, ECG data will uh, can come to the smartphones on BLE technology, and from the smartphone, it can be transmitted anywhere. So it means uh, until unless we need the, um, uh, the surgery, uh, the patient has to move for surgery. Uh, there is no need uh, to see the doctor. Uh, the uh, vital parameters can be transmitted. Even the person can know the vital parameters like the uh, blood pressure or the sugar and uh, can change the lifestyle. So these things are will be very, very helpful in the rural areas, uh, uh, even in the urban areas also. And then we can have tele-education and e-attendance. Biometric is already uh, prevailing in the uh, so many schools it, it, it was implemented. But tele-education uh, using the uh, uh, this uh, uh, communication technology, uh, we can uh, provide this. Uh, in the power sector, uh, uh, Mr. Das has already developed the smart microgrid connecting the uh, solar as well as the solar energy and the biomass energy, the smart microgrid. Uh, will be quite helpful and uh, smart metering smart grid projects they are already in progress uh, then uh, um, so many uh, this uh, water line or the gas pipeline they, they can be monitored in the agriculture sector uh, because in the rural areas we will be having the human being we are having uh, um, uh, animals and uh, we are having the agriculture so three things we have taken in the smart village and agriculture document and how to uh, how we can improve using the sensor and communication technology. Uh, then in the agriculture, smart irrigation, livestock monitoring, weather monitoring and forecasting, sensor-based precision agriculture, remote crop monitoring, uh, remote monitoring of soil quality. Uh, this uh, uh, sensor-based uh, soil testing devices have been developed uh, by a number of startups in the country as well as across the globe. And uh, uh, the uh, primary, secondary and tertiary nutrients of the uh, soil as well as pH. Uh, value can be found out and it can be transmitted uh, uh, to the smart uh, smartphone or it can be transmitted to the cloud even uh, this uh, uh, database can, uh, should be integrated with the kisan call center 1551 in future uh, and uh, that will uh, help the villagers a lot uh, this then animal husbandry animal husbandry is a big uh, domain uh, uh, in the rural areas and uh, animal tracking, remotely monitoring the health of the animal using variable health devices, uh, that is very, very important. And we have uh, uh, taken a number of use cases uh, related with the agriculture, power, education, health uh, in our document. Then e-governance, uh, citizen-centric services like birth and death certificate, electronic attendance, environment offices, connecting police station, banks, post offices. Uh, even uh, surveillance uh, in the villages uh, or uh, connected vehicle uh, scenario that is also required. It all depends upon the requirement of the uh, city or the uh, uh, villages. Then food processing uh, is again a very big item. Then fisheries, fisheries uh, uh, can be developed and the uh, sensors uh, and communication technology can be uh, used to monitor the uh, ponds uh, for developing the fisheries. Uh, this is uh, uh, the, these things we have taken uh, in the uh, document. The, uh, 
uh, this uh, uh, and uh, uh, now um, as we are having around 68% uh, population living in the rural area it is, these applications are very very important and uh, they, uh, even uh, um, uh, we are having one work item uh, in progress uh, in the itu international telecom union uh, um, uh, and uh, this work item will be uh, used uh, uh, globally, and uh, the contributions are provided, uh, being provided by the global community uh, to prepare the standards uh, on this, uh, how to imp uh, how we can deploy the smart services in the uh, uh, rural areas, and that will be quite helpful uh, for uh, the rural community. Uh, this is one of the pictorial view of uh, this uh, machine to machine communication, like the uh, device and uh, the communication network and the server, and uh, uh, this. Uh, uh, Parameters like uh, sensor, meter, or the location, or uh, heat level of motion, vital signs, it, it should be transmitted without any human intervention. If, uh, 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 like uh, uh, in the rural areas, the Anganwadi workers uh, 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 uses uh, such type of devices, monitor the BP, then the BP should be tra automatically transmitted from the device uh, to the uh, laptop or, or the smartphone. Uh, of the Anganwadi workers, and uh, it can be further transmitted in the uh, cloud. Uh, and where the doctors can, uh, doctors sitting in the uh, urban areas, they can monitor, they can advise uh, the uh, patients. So, uh, what type of uh, network we will be uh, required for this? That we will see. And uh, uh, the um, as uh, you are already uh, aware, that uh, government of India has already uh, this approved. Uh, national optical fiber network uh, the work is in progress from 2012 onwards uh, to cover uh, the uh, 2.5 lakhs village panchayats and around 1.5 lakhs village panchayats the connectivity has already been provided now it is required to be maintained there uh, the connectivity uh, uh, wherever uh, in most of the villages more than 1 lakh villages it is already uh, working uh, very well and uh, uh, these services can be extended there, like uh, uh, tele-education, tele-medicine, and uh, uh, CSC, the organization um, uh, 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 under METI, they are uh, supposed to extend these uh, type of services uh, in collaboration with the uh, concerned uh, ministry. Even uh, uh, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, uh, 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 the, their standardization body NABH is developing digital health standards, and uh, once uh, they, uh, these standards come into picture, uh, they are approved. Uh, they will be uh, it will be quite uh, helpful uh, for the uh, uh, wearable devices. Uh, as I know, because I, I am the member of, in that committee also for uh, the digital health standards. And uh, now this, uh, uh, you see, uh, this is the picture related with the IoT. If we are having large number of devices, large number of sensors, and a huge amount of data is coming, then uh, the data analytics can be used to predict uh, 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 predict uh, some sort of like uh, uh, pandemic or some uh, intelligence can be created from the uh, data, and that intelligence can be used for various planning and operational activities. So uh, this is, uh, uh, if we see uh, the number of devices, uh, how IoT will be uh, developing exponentially. Uh, this is, uh, it is expected around 24.6 billion connected devices uh, to be uh, uh, globally by 2025. And uh, in India, we have to develop the ecosystem for 5 billion connected devices by 2022, as per the National Digital Communication Policy, which. Uh, uh, was released by Department of Telecom uh, in 2018. And these connected devices will be in various verticals, such as automotive, uh, power sector, this uh, smart meeting and smart grid, healthcare, safety and surveillance, smart homes, water management, waste management, agriculture. So the, all these verticals, uh, once uh, the smart infrastructure is uh, developed in all these verticals, then these verticals will create as a pillar for the uh, smart cities and the smart villages. Uh, then uh, uh, this is a national digital communication policy. It is having some of the important items uh, 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 like uh, for the uh, rural areas. And, uh, and uh, it mentions uh, to provide one GBPS connectivity, which is already being provided wherever the optical fiber cable is being laid, and then 10 GBPS uh, thereafter. 
uh, the ensure connectivity to all the uncovered villages uh, uh, that is being uh, uh, taken care. Then the GramNet and Gen Wi-Fi, these are two uh, important items like GramNet connecting all key rural development institutions with 10 Mbps upgradable to uh, 100 Mbps and Gen Wi-Fi establishing uh, Wi-Fi hotspots in the rural areas. Uh, like uh, the optical fiber cable has gone to the village panchayat and from the village panchayat we can uh, install the Wi-Fi hotspots uh, uh, covering two, three nearby villages uh, so that uh, the internet facility is available there. And uh, we can extend the optical fiber cable from that point to other uh, like nearby schools or the hospitals uh, for providing the uh, uh, services. Uh, in the school like tele-education and uh, in the hospitals, even banks and other uh, community uh, uh, can take uh, this optical fiber cable or the internet facility to connect uh, their offices. Uh, like uh, this is one of the pictorial view uh, how the optical fiber cable and uh, this network will be expanded in the rural areas and providing voice, video and data services and further connecting uh, uh, the various services like uh, e-governance, e-education, banking, telemedicine, uh, all these things can be provided. Uh, technology uh, will be implemented as, uh, uh, as soon as uh, this uh, connectivity is being provided and connectivity is being uh, provided by Department of Telecom in a big way uh, for this. And our Honorable uh, Prime Minister and Honorable uh, um, Communication Minister, uh, they are taking care uh, of for providing the optical fiber connectivity in the rural areas. And uh, uh, this is basically the backbone for providing all the all uh, smart services uh, in the rural areas. And uh, uh, like uh, uh, on the standards uh, um, section, we are working with the IPU, uh, uh, ISO, IEC, JTC1, SC41 through BIS and uh, 1M2M because all these data will come to some platform. And uh, all these devices will be connected with some platform, like in the smart city, suppose the smart city uh, is having a platform. So the devices which will be deployed in the rural areas, they will be connected either uh, to the smart city platform of uh, that village or uh, uh, if that city is uh, of that city or if that city is not having this uh, platform to the nearby city. So uh, the standards have been released uh, 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 by various standardization bodies, and we have worked on that. Uh, this uh, uh, we have released around 12 technical reports in the last uh, five years, and these technical reports are on various verticals, like in power sector, how uh, the IoT will uh, make the power uh, power sector uh, uh, IoT will work as an enabler to the power sector to make it smart. Similarly, in the intelligent transport system, remote health management, uh, safety and surveillance. Then gateway and architecture, it is related with the platform. Then 13-digit uh, numbering scheme that came from the M2M numbering resource requirement and options. Then uh, embedded SIM. Embedded SIM is very important, which has been mandated as a standard in, by the Ministry of Road, Transport and Highways for the uh, for all commercial passenger vehicles to uh, have tracking device with embedded SIM so that at uh, to provide uh, the safety and security to the passengers uh, of the uh, uh, vehicles. So, so there is yeah. three more minutes. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. we can expedite. Yeah, so only few slides uh, are there. Uh, then uh, embedded sim, uh, we have spoken. Then uh, this is the Bureau of Indi Indian Standards have adopted all these standards. And uh, then further uh, common service layer, that is very important, one M2M standards we have adopted. Now, all these things are very, very important for the development of the, uh, not only for the smart cities, but for the uh, uh, smart villages also, because we have to connect the, those devices at some places. Uh, so these we have taken uh, in that document, and uh, uh, it has created infrastructure like 1 million smart meters based on IPv6. IPv6 was also mandated by uh, based on our document, and uh, it has created the, uh, infra uh, this uh, uh, infrastructure like six uh, service providers, uh, they came into picture. There are more than 200 device manufacturers for the vehicle tracking devices. And uh, uh, these uh, international documents have been uh, approved by our work like vehicle emergency call system for automotive road safety, which will be important, not only for the uh, uh, cities, but for the rural areas also. Then uh, the tracking, uh, 
vehicle tracking, safety, conformance, registration, and transfer using the embedded SIM and digital identity, uh, remote monitoring the health of a patient. So this work, this we have done for ITU, and it has become an international standard. Now, this is the architecture which, uh, uh, which is mentioned in the document, uh, uh, in the use case, which I've mentioned uh, uh, in the previous slide. Uh, this is the architecture. It has been approved by ITU, and it, uh, it can be used uh, in the rural areas for provide, providing the health services. This is uh, 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 really very, very important. And uh, uh, then uh, uh, this is one of the tips I've taken from the government uh, related with the uh, tele-education. And uh, we hope that uh, once the connectivity is extended uh, uh, in all the villages of the country, uh, all village panchayats, then all the schools uh, will become like this. Uh, only we have to provide these smart boards, and we have to spend money on that. And uh, uh, moreover, it is very important, that, like the laptop or the tablet or uh, the smartphones, uh, they should become cheaper and cheaper uh, with minimum required facilities so that it is affordable for the uh, rural community. Uh, then uh, further, uh, one uh, smart city document uh, has been approved in the ITU, and uh, the health document which we prepared was also uh, approved in ITU. And uh, we are working on a smart village and agriculture requirement for deploying smart service services in rural community. Uh, so the use cases related with the various services I have uh, mentioned, uh, they have been included in this document. and. Uh, uh, this uh, we are having large number of experts uh, available in this committee, uh, including Mr. Das and uh, the for uh, development of uh, for creating this document goes to the members. In fact, and in addition to this, we are working on finalizing IoT ICT standards for smart cities and one future communication technology and use cases in IoT domain. Uh, the, 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 this work is also in progress. As IoT, uh, no doubt, uh, it is a uh, uh, IoT can make the uh, infrastructure smart, but the security of the IoT domain is very, very important, and for that uh, we are also working uh, uh, on a work item security by design principles for the M2M device manufacturers, as security is the last of, uh, option for the device manufacturers. Only 13 to 14 percent of the device manufacturers, they feel the responsibility of um, uh, having the security or the uh, are disclosing vulnerability. Uh, this is a survey done by uh, the global agencies. And the National Trust Center uh, uh, work is also uh, in progress uh, because uh, some if some device is hacked or some device is creating vulnerability where it should be reported and which manufacturer has made this device. Uh, so all uh, such type of ecosystem is required to be developed. So for this, uh, we are also working, and the Smart Village and Agriculture, no doubt this report will come uh, in the October-November uh, 2020, and uh, we hope uh, the, this document will help in creating the smart infrastructure uh, in, in the rural areas and will further improve the quality of life. Thank you very much uh, for uh, uh, this opportunity and listening to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sunil. Uh, Sushil, uh, it was, you know, no, very comprehensive. You know, this is the first time I have uh, you know seen it in a summary format. Uh, rest assured, I'll go through the document and provide our comments and our use cases. Yeah, thank uh, you, Mr. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot. And uh, just uh, uh, as a talk, uh, can you make my make me presenter? Chengapa, can you make me presenter? Hello. Hi. Yeah. Hello. Chengapa, can you make me the presenter? So reclaiming Oh, okay. 
سلیم آجا یا تینک یو تینک یو hope that and we will also share our report with you so that uh, you know we can we can collaborate and you can comment on those reports as well so yeah thank you thank you yeah so now it's time to move to the final session and uh, i will uh, invite uh So this is the last session uh um the where we go over what we have heard so far so we have our synthesizers uh, ready to share thoughts share summarize the uh, uh, learnings from these three uh, very extensive and intense sessions and uh, uh professor farooq mistri will be moderating this session um, I, and uh, i invite farooq to take over from here uh, thank you all very much Uh, in this session, what we want to do is to summarize. In this session, what we want to do is to get the essence of what people have presented, uh, uh, and and see how we can take those points and use them in the report that we plan to put together. So, so I would like to, I want to first thank uh, up front, thank the uh, th uh, thank the uh, 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 people who are synthesizing. and i'd like to invite for a brief uh, uh, comment my co-moderator ram uh, papu to say a few words if he would like uh first of all i really uh, admire your energy dr uh, mistri i know it's very odd hours you've been away whole night so i think you're doing a commendable job thank you very much for setting the direction uh i think uh, in terms of uh, all the presentations today i see a lot of dots getting connected uh and i think if you're able to really uh, and i'm sure the synthesizers will actually uh, be bringing out this essence but i think as moderator and co-moderator uh, if you're able to connect a lot of these dots in and link it back to the initial uh, direction setting that you did uh, uh, i think some of those missing dots also probably will get and uh, connected today to uh, you know to give us uh, more direction i think for the report that we want to be coming up together i'll just stop with that great so if it's all right with my co-moderator i'd like to start with sharm uh, sharmista k but please keep it short because uh, you have your notes and you'll be sending them to ashok uh, uh, and and pulit and so we will be able to get them so right now it is in the context of the report what do you think from the sarpanch side is of relevance to the report so sharmista go ahead How about 3 minutes sharmista you need uh, presentation sharmista are you there right let's go to the next one sanjay uh, sanjay patki on uh, social entrepreneurs yeah uh, can you just enable my sharing uh, yes. yes thank you for doing it okay as we need thank you can you make sanjay the speaker please the presenter hello yeah, he is having the right yeah. thank you yeah. 
Sharmista, you will be next, so please be ready. Sure, now that I can unmute myself, I can uh, present. And you have my slides. Are you able to see my slides? Please yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I am presenting the essence of uh, session on customer voice, uh, addressing the uh, basically the social entrepreneurs uh, who are involved uh, in the uh, rural development work. We had two present two presentations on that, Mr. Amitabh Ghosh and Uttara Narayanan. The key themes that have emerged from both the presentation. And the first and foremost common uh, is the empowerment of women. Second is infrastructure with uh, thrust on digitalization. Uh, then water, basically water conservation and rainwater harvesting. The logistics, cold storage, fuel storage, transportation, market access. Electricity as a basic enabler because uh, many of the things which we said above uh, cold storage or uh, other uh, in areas of development, they all depend on stable electricity. Uh, education, capability building and doorstep. There was a very good uh, presentation uh, on that from uh, Burnham. <laughs> and the social concept of social capital. Just quickly elaborating on that because uh, just expanding on this theme, it was mentioned that empowerment of women, one of the factors is a lot of their time gets wasted in fetching the firewood or walking up to sell the vegetables. 30, it was mentioned that 30 kilometers they had to walk just to sell tomatoes and uh, lemons and things like that. Uh, financial literacy of, for women, basically women as a influencers of the family as well as the community, the concept of community anchor and change agent uh, has been proposed uh, and uh, entire woman as a focus of uh, um, change agent in the community, uh, I think it's a common theme from both the presentation. In terms of infrastructure, the more emphasis was um, on the basic infrastructure like roads, schools, health, etc. But in addition, the digital thrust to enable them avail many of the government schemes uh, is a very uh, important point. It was mentioned that only 35% women today have mobile phone, but in another five years, every woman perhaps will have uh, connectivity and phone. So digital thrust will be a key area. In terms of water resources, it was mentioned that uh, the income level is dropping. That is a concern. People are migrating from villages to cities. One of the ways to raise the income level is to generate more cash crops um, like vegetables and uh, other things. Uh, and uh, water is the one of the resources which uh, needs to be generated locally through water conservation, rain water harvesting, regeneration of lakes, etc. This all will help in income generation. In terms of logistic, market market access is a problem which we all understand for every rural area. Transportation, one of the concepts which was proposed in the presentation was local production as well as local consumption. So that the dependence on transportation will be less. Uh, dependence on the cold storage for perishable item will be less and uh, if uh, we have electricity, this can be um, stored uh, properly and even the quality of field storage because a lot of grains get wasted because of rodents and other nuisance. So uh, these are the, some of the logistic areas which were mentioned. 24-7 electricity availability is a concern. Electricity connections are there but quality as well as the availability uh, throughout the period is a concern basically and as we pointed out some of the infrastructure they are depending on electricity including their desire to have digital services for various government schemes, including, for example, uh, other related services, etc., and uh, ATMs uh, is one of the things which was mentioned in the presentation. Education and capacity building, it's all very well recognized, but the concept of micro-education at doorstep is a very powerful concept, especially for um, examples like financial literacy for women, 
Um, the concept of community anchor and the field to field consultation is also a very good concept which was presented. And the holistic approach in terms of economic, social, ecological, and psychological, uh, with, uh, this was the uh, basically this encompasses all that we said. And I think this should be the uh, over encompassing goal to have this holistic approach. Thank you. That concludes the synthesis. Thank you very much. I, uh, I must agree with you. The last slide, number five, is a, a provides a good roadmap uh, to uh, to get information into the report. Thank you very much indeed. So, Thank you. who is uh, the? I think Sharmista is ready. Sharmista is ready. Sengappa, uh, uh, can you hand over the speaker to me? No, she doesn't have. Present. I have the presentation. I have a presentation. Please make me the. You are now presenter, Dr. Das. Yeah, yeah, one minute. Is it shared? Not yet. Yeah. Okay. Coming up. Perfect. Go. Yeah. So uh, I hope you can all hear me. So basically, today's session that I synthesized was the Smart Village Voice of the Customers. Uh, next slide. Uh, the panelists were, of course, Ajay Singh Mukhya uh, from Jharkhand, Bhakti Sharma from MP, Dilip Tripathi from UP, and uh, the other two I have mentioned here, but I would not be uh, speaking about what they spoke. Next, please. What is encouraging among all the, the uh, Sarpanch is what they spoke. So uh, I have we've noticed that in all the three GPs, uh, education has become a focus area. Women and child welfare, as well as empowerment of women, has emerged as a key development factor in Barkhedi and uh, Petervar uh, GPs. Health indicators such as zero mortality rates and zero malnutrition plus improved participation of women. This we saw in Barkhedi Abdullah, and that's a very positive thing, I, I think. Infrastructure such as roads, proper closed drainage system, lights in the village have also been taken care of. So that is also a, an encouraging point. Reverse migration has been considered as critical by Hasuri Alsanpur, that is basically the Lip Tripathi, which is very, very critical. Uh, special mention I would like to make of certain uh, GPs. Hasuri Alsanpur, the Lip Tripathi's uh, GP has GIS mapping, has installed Wi Fi, has CCTV cameras, RO, Auto, and a PA system. Petrava, that is Ajay Singh's GP, also has CCTV cameras, and he has developed his GP despite government and bureaucracy roadblocks. So that's a special mention for him. Barkhedi Abdullah has got a smart TV installed to help students in the current pandemic scenario. Next. Next slide. Yeah, and some more special mentions are again about the Lip Tripathi's GP that has looked at alternate solutions for improving economy. Go to removing to grow vegetables instead of just staple crops, having a herbal park. He also has a digital library and has improved government schools, which has led to students moving away from private schools and into government schools. So these are all the encouraging points that uh, were brought up. Um, next slide, please. However, of course, there are some challenges that they all spoke about. One of the key uh, challenges uh, that came up in the discussion was the uh, bureaucracy and the intermediate panchayat or the Zilla panchayat, which can be an impediment to development, unfortunately. There's a poor implementation of government policies and schemes. That is another challenge that uh, many of them face. Poor connectivity, we, we saw that ourselves today, digital and otherwise, that still remains an issue. Uh, so one needs to work on that. Medical facility also continues to be limited, like what um, Bhakti Sharma and others spoke about. So the lack of single platform for supply chain, uh, and of course, uh, she also brought up uh, lack of proper housing society. Next slide, please. 
So the, what are the potential gaps that we as a group uh, could look at and maybe think that uh, they can be addressed? One is, of course, electricity, uh, not just uh, providing uh, light, but uh, enough electricity which can help them pump water, run a cold storage unit, uh, process food, etc. This is something that came up in the, in the entire discussion. Uh, quite a few of them spoke about uh, requiring access to cold storage, especially for perishables. This is something that is definitely, you know, uh, doable and can be addressed. Market linkages and market access is another thing uh, that can be, um, you know, looked at. Shortage of water, that is the requirement of rainwater harvesting, looking at how do we help them get all of that, uh, have, uh, you know, storage of water. So these are the various points that I think that we can definitely be addressed as uh, they are the potential gaps. And um, yeah, that I think basically, if you next move on to the next slide, that is, where I end, that's the essence of uh, the three gram panchayats, uh, sarpanches, what they spoke about. So, Mr. This was lovely. Uh, you told us what is encouraging, you told us uh, what the challenges are, and you told us what the gaps are. And I think all three of them would fit in extremely well in the report. So, uh, 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 so thank you very much indeed. Uh, it was it was a short, sweet, and very nice uh, summary of what of, uh, what what is an useful summary of what you've done. Uh, funding CSR. <laughs> Atul Bhatnagar. <laughs> Atul, can, uh, can you make him the presenter? Atul, you have your presentation or? Yeah, yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, so just to, I mean, I have done a bit of a mixture of all the um, all the sessions that were held, but just to briefly say about the CSR bit, Unima talked about data governance and SDG integrations. Uh, Naima talked about Nani Kali, girl child education. Uh, Gigi from Nabat talked about the multi-service cooperative societies and how NABAD is helping agri-enterprises. And Divya talked about the Uttarakhand migration and how inclusiveness is very important to be able to take that. Now, I have generally tried to make it a very short presentation and to two slides. So I hope that will sum it up. And uh, so, now where is it? Yeah, can you see it? Ashok, can you see the presentation now? Uh, yes, we can see it. Go ahead. Okay, so I uh, just to set the context with all the uh, all that was said. Uh, I mean, there was mention of sustainable development goals need to be localized, and that is where I start from. I mean, uh, it was said by Farooq himself, and then later on it was mentioned by Punima also. The second is, of course, all the kind of enterprise that is coming in. I have used the word microeconomic zone because. I'm trying to set the context to smart because everything is about smartness today. So we are talking about smart to, um, we, uh, if I were to just summarize all the things that the kind of uh, the village is doing right now, whether it's in terms of schools, ATMs, health centers, cooperative centers, it all forms what we would like to establish as a microeconomic zone. The agriculture led growth, I mean, watershed management, multi-cropping, fertilizers, each of the speakers did mention in some shape or form these activities, and I think that is what they are leading to an agriculture-led growth. Renewable energy, I mean, we have talked about how they need energy 24-7, how stable energy through microgrids for infrastructure support, improving standards of living, uh, that's where the R really comes in. And technology-supported governance, uh, it was talked about by one of the CSR ladies and then said, okay, look, we need how to be, uh, see the impact that needs technology-led governance. So this is what I thought was the context that was set by the uh, various speakers and what it would lead to, I mean, the roadmap as I see it, first is, I mean, uh, the latest uh, uh, presentations were on AI, and uh, while we are having this conference, there is a, a conference happening called RAISE, which is, um, you know, PM Modi has, uh, put up, which is where they're talking about responsible AI for social development, social empowerment, actually. And um, there, 
uh, the whole focus is how to reach to out to a very large mass of people, really, in the rural uh, area. And that's where um, RAIS, um, I think, is one of our roadmap, should be part of our roadmap, how, use, how we use artificial intelligence in a very um, creative and a useful way. C is like cluster development for economies of scale. T for training and capacity building through relevant skilling. This was mentioned again by some of the speakers. Innovation and entrepreneurship at the village level is something we need to improve on. And um, along with that goes S, which is suit the scheme of fund for regeneration of traditional industries, which Bhagwati you talked about. Look, we need to preserve that art and culture, which is slowly dying out because people have not been able to give uh, given a chance to become an entrepreneur in that. And there are ways by which you can now take it up and that the government schemes are going to help us. As far as action, O, optimization of government policies. Now, this is very critical. Versus grid versus a micro, smart microgrid. We do not seem to have the support of government policies in this, where there is too much focus on having grid electricity and very little focus on, uh, on smart microgrid. There is some focus on microgrids. But smart microgrid, no. So there are, I'm told, more than a thousand microgrids around the place um, in India. But how many are working? Nobody knows. And that's where the smartness comes in. Um, and Nari Shashakti Karan, women empowerment. Because um, what most of the speakers said, and what I could get as a gist, that women have to be or will be the best anchors of change in the village. Uh, men tend to move out, look for better opportunities, etc. For women, if they can, uh, if if they become the anchors of change, then there can be a very significant change that will happen at the village level. So I'm just trying to make it, um, you know, within two uh, words, um, smart actions, and that's what our roadmap should really look like. Thank you. Atul, this is absolutely fantastic. Uh, these are two beautiful concept maps that we could use in the report and structure the report so that we deal with SMART, which is the frontier of where we are going. And it ties in with what uh, Brian talked about this morning about uh, uh, technology being extremely important. Uh, sorry, Nagendra talked about this morning about uh, it, the solution being technology driven. And Brian touched upon that as well. And then the roadmap, that's the future. That's actions, where you come along and say these are the actions. So the two conceptual maps that you've shared with us, I think are fantastic. And uh, it would be lovely to visit <laughs> these two words. Thank you very much indeed. And I said he will be writing the report. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so he's there. Uh, you know, Sharmista is there. You know, Ram is there. So we are all here to, you know, create that roadmap and create that, uh, you know, how do we go forward? So next is uh, Ranjit. Uh, is Ranjit there? Ranjit Majumdar. Uh, yes, Chengappa, can you make me the presenter? I'll share his slides. Nope, sorry. Can you see his funding slides? I'm just trying to. Okay. Great. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, um, Welcome, uh, Ranjit. Everybody. Yeah. To everybody. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm conscious that everybody's short of time. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, and I'm and I'm going to go fast. Uh, what I'm planning to do is just talk about the current context of the international finance and investment community and some of the ways in which it's changing that might make it relevant to smart villages, and then to apply that to the things that I heard today and that I didn't hear today, which helped to create an environment for greater investment finances in the, in the smart villages project. I wanted to start quickly by just outlining some of the fundamentals of the way that investment thinking is changing. It's clear that investors of, of every kind uh, starting to contextualize their thinking more towards challenges in global society. 
um, and towards the SDGs, which is something which has been a, you know, a, a theme mentioned multiple times here. And obviously that fits into areas that are relevant to smart villages, whether it be inequality, um, rural development, um, women's empowerment. Uh, there is an emergence within uh, corporations and finance offices of a new concept called environmental and social and corporate governance. It's a reflection of companies and investment um, and finance institutions, not only to, in, in, to invest in more sustainable and, and environmental and social solutions, but also to be clear about their own impact on these, uh, um, on these areas within the, um, uh, within the confines of their business. I will say that most of these offices are marking their own homework um, rather than being independently assessed, but it nonetheless shows a, a notable shift in thinking over the last five years as does more and more um, reflections from shareholders, that they're shifting their paradigms uh, from one-year returns to looking at longer-term investment and, uh, and longer-term projects. I think we're also seeing quite clearly, and, and businesses and finance are, are clear about this, there is global youth movements in every part of the world that are challenging the very fundamentals of capitalism and are expecting a future society that, that elevates uh, profit over well-being. But the council is also, with regard to smart villages, be skeptical. The fundamentals of investment are still focused on institutional self-interest. Next slide, please, Ashok. And I think the key drivers for the community to be interested in international development solutions, particularly multiplier and transformational solutions, will be pressure from their clients, pressure from people whose money that they're funding, who want to see uh, their investment take on a different color from simply promoting profit and to look towards uh, well-being, social impact, and, and public good. Um, of course, financiers and investors realize that promoting themselves like that makes them look different. It offers them differentials, which allows them to acquire new customers. So Brian talked about the nature of the market opportunity with um, smart villages. And market shaping is another question. We're talking about potentially transitioning a huge amount of people uh, to a different level of prosperity. What opportunities does that offer to investment companies, to global corporations, to multinationals, to SMEs, to the informal market? And also the investment community wants to be involved in innovative ideas and thinking. And the multi-sectoral nature of smart villages, which was very clear from the presentations today, lends itself into some frontier thinking. What we also heard today is the importance of stakeholders in, in government in particular as being important to making sure that smart villages can uh, um, can uh, uh, can realize its potential. Uh, and moving on to the next slide, please. And I think that in hearing today, there were some very clear conclusions about what smart villages could do to realize the potential of these investment opportunities. First, I've said is to evidence the scale of the opportunity. Big picture thinking the scale of the opportunity looks huge, but I think that, I think that all stakeholders are gonna have to dig deep to try and evidence that and put data points and analysis that shows that we've really thought about this beyond uh, you know, a very clear opportunity actually to um, populate that opportunity with, with, with figures that have a clear foundation around it. What we've heard clearly is just the quality of thinking around smart villages and the evidence of best practice within smart villages. Uh, I have been absolutely astounded by the quality of, of thinking and practice that is already going on. It's clear that much of what is needed to take smart villages to the next level is already there. Um, one thing, things that one of the things that Ponima talked about was the emphasis of the multiplier effect of technology and its role in systems change. And I think we should not forget that actually it's very hard if itemized and atomized stakeholders are trying to are trying to drive things forward without some kind of focus on on uh, on, on systems change. But technology has that unique multiplier effect to power various different international development journeys. I think what we also heard today was a, a real admission of the knowledge and practice gaps in some of the ongoing challenges. I think we need to be honest about that and to know that this journey involves contextualizing many future learnings and understandings for how to make sure that smart villages are a, are a genuine part of development. Um, I think also in going back to the point about governments, it's going to be very interesting for the investment community if smart villages shows that it's aligning its big picture thinking with national and transnational development policies and strategies. I think that's gonna show the, 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 the level at which smart villages are thinking and playing. I think it's also critical where their opportunity does present themselves to smart villages to be able to develop um, and, uh, and synthesize ambitious engagement models. 
that offer clear modalities for scalability and for measuring success. The challenges of scalability and the increased interest of general finance around measuring success and measuring impact is a very clear theme that came through today from, from, multiple, um, from multiple different persons. And that, I think, is going to be essential to trying to build on the investment finance in this space. And I think finally to say that this is you know, multi-stakeholder initiative. Uh, you know, going back to something which you have emphasized a couple of times, it's very difficult for organizations, movements, regions, local governments, NGOs to do this on their own. Driving collective impact and driving systems change is something that could be extremely interesting, I think, for investment finance uh, in this space. And just to the final slide, if I may, Osho. I think one of the ways to think about it is to look at is to look at the platform for shared value. You know, I confess that I am skeptical that the investment the investment community is acting out of anything but self interest. But that is not an insurmountable obstacle. The key and the and the and the kind of co creation is to synthesize those interests with the ambitions of, of smart villages. I believe that there is a change of direction in the investment community, but I do not yet think that that is embedded. I think that the shift to a different kind of paradigm about the way that money is invested will partly depend on the promotion of big picture thinking like this in ways that can genuinely engage with key stakeholders. And finally, I think that we ought to be prepared to think about develop, development of real partnerships with non-traditional stakeholders, in the, such as with the investment community, to understand what those key drivers are and to make sure that they can be applied to fulfill the potential of transformational rural development. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ranit, uh, very much indeed. Uh, what I'm taking away from you is this notion of a shared value. I think that's very critical. And just like we thought about the villagers and saying, what is it that they want? We have to think in terms of the investment community and saying, what is it, what is it that drives them to make this happen? And the merging of the two, which you, you, you've touched upon in terms of, of uh, 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 aligning the, 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 the values for both the people on the ground and the people who are going to invest, I think is a very important point that you've made and will certainly be something that uh, in the report we have to take into account. Specifically from the, uh, 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 the phrase you used, which is really neat, was engagement model. What is this engagement model between the financier and uh, the social entrepreneur and the people on the ground? And how do we uh, deal with scalability and being able to measure impact because when you measure impact, you're able to think in terms of accountability, not just in terms of how the money was spent, but in terms of how uh, what progress has been made. So instead of rate of uh, a return on money, it's rate of in, uh, a return on progress being made within the community. So you you touched upon a number of uh, very important points that need to be put into the report. Thank you. So who's next? So uh, we are coming to Janet Allen. Uh, let me go first to Abhishek Yadav uh, uh, in terms of ecosystem enablers, and then to Janet Allen in ecosystem universities. Abhishek, so you have, you have a presentation? Or? Uh, yeah, I have a slide. Okay. So can we make Abhishek the presenter, please? Storing up one sec. Okay, can you guys see me? Yes, go ahead. Um, so I'm going to very briefly synthesize the ecosystem enablers. And uh, in this uh, section, I had three people talking. Uh, you want to switch off your video? You have a bandwidth issue? Uh, yeah, just switch off the video. Uh, Oh, 
uh, while it is loading up, so uh, we had three people speaking in the session. Uh, we had Digvijay uh, from Social Business, uh, we had Ram uh, from Mission Samriddhi, and we had Bhagwati. And he was talking uh, with respect to CIEE. Uh, the idea that came about from both Digvijay and Ram was that they had developed already a framework that would enable uh, community development uh, for Digvijay. It was more about profit, profit, uh, pros, uh, purpose, and I have then added progress as well. So, what his uh, the framework that they have developed so far uh, enables social entrepreneurs to look at profit and purpose, and if we can somehow connect the progress to it, that would actually fill in the whole set. Uh, whereas, if we look at Ram uh, Ram Papu, he has been looking at uh, community development framework for a long time, and he comes from the idea where he is looking at gram panchayat. He is uh, taking a top-down approach within the uh, gram panchayat level and he's saying, okay, now uh, here is the uh, uh, whole cluster of villages available and how can I enable them and empower them so that they can continue to uh, develop themselves. And uh, both of the uh, uh, missions, uh, both of these people were talking about a holistic approach wherein they wanted to bring in the idea of uh, bringing multiple stakeholders, combining them together and how that can help. Whereas when Bhagwati came in, he really was looking at these kind of uh, frameworks that he can use and then empower people. So that is where I saw a very good connection, wherein we have two frameworks that have been tested, they ha that have been on ground working and have implemented their solutions. And uh, Bhagwati looking for such solutions with, within its own uh, platform. So I see that as a connection uh, with, uh, between uh, Vijay Chaudhary and Ram Papu's framework and how we can then bring in uh, Bhagwati, combine that and enable uh, and empower these people uh, from uh, and develop these micro and small enterprises. Uh, the challenges that both of them had spoken about uh, specifically uh, was uh, uh, that I could gather was that uh, within social business uh, Vijay came about and said we can't find these people who, who want to work within the villages. And uh, Ram uh, specifically said that they are looking for people, uh, cluster coordinators, who want to make these enable uh, and enable the connection. So again, these two challenges are also connected. And what uh, uh, Bhagwati comes about and says that I have these people, but I don't have a tool or a way to teach them and empower them. So again, uh, we can use the learnings that have been developed. And what so what goes. Uh, at least from my behalf in terms of the report is because both of them have been developing solutions, have been able to scale their framework, I think we should, uh, of course we should take the framework that is in place, but we should also gather the learning that they have come across. And that would be a very good point because then we can look about uh, uh, from the perspective of the enablers, uh, what has been done right, what has been done wrong, and then add that and how can we scale up and uh, we should also enable connect the framework that have been developed through pura model so that it can complete the whole loop and one point that has to come about is that we should really be looking at people who are inspired and empower them rather than looking at people who are already uh, educated and already uh, working in that field because we might not find such people but we might find people who are inspired and want to stay in village and then we can slowly empower them so that is my two penny thing and uh, I think that would go in, uh, again, I would repeat that first is the framework that has already worked and how that has been scaled. The major part that I think goes is the learnings that they have come across over the period of years and have come up to the solution. I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Abhishek. So let me tell you how I see it fitting into the report. Uh, uh, you have identified two models that have been developed and that have been implemented. And uh, so in the report, one of the sections is where we look at models and write the pluses, minuses, and interesting things with them. And so uh, so we know uh, what the basic stuff is. We know what the challenges and difficulties with the models are and how these models need to be integrated with the holistic framework in terms of finance and other sorts of things, workforce and things along those lines. And then uh, the, the second part, which I think fits into very, very well with this, is 
what are what have been uh, what have been their takeaways? What learning have they got from it that we can then replicate or say, hey, look, don't do this. Make sure that this doesn't take place. So when we do the reality check on the model that comes in the report, we can say we, this model will not uh, have these hassles for this reason, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you very much. And, and now that brings us to Janet Allen, where we, we, we've now looked at the infrastructure. We started from the bottom. Now we've come to the top and say from the research perspective, from the academic side, uh, what is it that uh, 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 we need, or how can we move further from the academic uh -huh. side? What is the role of acad academia uh, to play in this in terms, in terms of uh, the workforce, et cetera, et cetera? Janet? So I have a presentation. Perhaps uh, I could share the screen. You are, you are the speaker now. Thank you. So uh, you can people, share. Yeah. I uh, have I share. I have think I've shared. Can you see no, it? No. Uh, yeah. Yes, it is coming. Okay. Now can you can see it now? Yes. Great. So I'm talking about the uh focus on what universities can contribute to this uh, effort. The people that were particularly involved in this uh, conversation were these here, and there were two other people involved in the same session, but Abhishek has covered their contributions well. So I won't mention much about what they've done. Um, and to fit into the uh, report, I've highlighted the first thing we'll talk about is technological in innovations. And Dr. Rao, or Professor Rao, uh, talked about the importance of uh, smart uh, optimization and the use of uh, IT as far as being something that you can uh, use to, to organize and help others share information. Also, Dr. Uh, Sukti, uh, at IIT Goa has mentioned that there are micro, microgrid systems that can be incorporated and are very important. And of course, Sun Moksha also has made a great advance in this area as far as being able to connect things with IT. So evaluating progress is important. So we noticed that um, the CTTC uh, has training uh, activities that have been going on for some time and that are successful. They encourage people to uh, become skilled workers and move out of the communities. Also, the, there's the uh, Ram Papu has a MS community development framework that was very effective, seems to be very effective and useful. You will notice that all of this seems to rely on assembling people and encouraging people to work together. And so this is something that Dr. Hall at the University of Buffalo talked about. We want people to work together. We want people in India, as well as in the United States and abroad to come together. And again, this is a place where IT can help us. So, so thank you. Thank you. So the, 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 the uh, uh, key point that I take from what you has put together is that, uh, that the need has been established for collaboration, not uh, at the academic level. So with IIT Goa, with the Centurion Group, uh, with uh, other universities, how can we collectively work together so that we are able to to uh, help with developing curricula, help with uh, developing technology, help with uh, giving, uh, providing an opportunity for students to uh, learn by reflecting on doing, by working in the villages, by going in the villages, things along those lines. So there is a role that academia can play in making this happen to educate the generation who would like to go and work in the villages, who would like to go and make things happen. 
And in essence, what we have is a living laboratory. The living laboratory are the villages and 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 the the uh, universities could be the grounds where technology is developed, deployed by students, by undergraduates, by graduate students to make things happen. And to do that, we can do it in a collaborative sense uh, where, uh, 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 with uh, uh, recognizing that we are based in different parts of the world and different parts of the country uh, to collectively get together to make things happen. So I now want to invite Ram Papu if he would like to summarize his uh, uh, takeaways, and then it's all back to Ashok. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I've audible, uh, Dr. Misri. Yeah, Ram, go ahead. Uh, if I'm looking at uh, uh, San Sanjay's presentation. Uh, the key element, obviously, was, again, uh, he did speak about water, logistics, market access, and all that. But I think the key, the key also is empowerment. Uh, that is, for me, a really a 1,000-gram item, the way I call it. It's not a 10-gram, it's not a 100-gram, it's a 1,000-gram item, women empowerment. Uh, that came out uh, came across very strongly. Mm. And uh, if I look at, uh, uh, you know, if I just have to, uh, you know, spell a little bit more on that. Uh, it came out in the other sessions also. Women as a critical change maker, uh, and a lot of enabling points around digital thrust, logistics, all this can actually be, uh, you know, done uh, through uh, empowering women. And I just want to take a second here to connect a dot here. Now, in India, with the state rural livelihood missions and the national rural livelihood missions, which work, which have very strong SAG organizations in every state, like Kurumbashri or Jeevika, uh, these organizations can act, are well positioned to, to take from here. If we have to work with women and uh, work with these SAGs, and empower the women in these SAGs to capitalize on the digital infrastructure and so on. That's, 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 that's something I that want to talk about. Uh, I love this idea about education at doorstep community. Again, coming back very strongly to the women empowerment. Uh, Sarpanches, I think, you know, to be honest with you folks, uh, we saw some very fairly advanced Sarpanches today. Uh, I wish we had a cross section of Sarpanches where uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the basic levels are still not good in terms of, you know, some of the basics of, uh, you know, uh, malnutrition and food and shelter. Uh, then you've got even a slightly different perspective. But again, uh, it looks like the schemes are in place. Uh, we know what to do, but uh, we certainly don't know how to do it. Implementation seems to be a major challenge. There is no last mile effective implementation of the government delivery schemes. Uh, so that's, that's something we need to work upon. Uh, I love the way Atul gave us two very smart connotations, right? Smart actions. So. <laughs> It actually makes the job simpler because when we all have to speak a common language, common vocabulary, it's very easy to easy to remember. Uh, when you know smart, we know what we are referring to, and when we know what action, what we are referring to. So that was a very connotation to go into the roadmap. Uh, uh, in terms of investment funding, he spoke about the pressures. He said, be skeptical, don't get, because ultimately people are still working on self-interest. The opportunity is to really convert self-interest to align with the interest of the villagers. Dr. Nisri also pointed this very clearly, that uh, the villagers want a certain amount of things to happen, and the investors also have expectations. How do you align both? How do you align both? Uh, there was some, uh, uh, there was a concept about market shaping. Now, in this context, I just want to make a point here that in which you can look at India, especially the bottom of the pyramid, BOP, uh, can be a very, very large market. Uh, and investors can, if, if that is aligned properly and leveraged properly, that can actually meet for them their investment returns, and it can be a very good opportunity. Uh, and here I would like to just give one example uh, related to uh, market shaping and related to the last point, which I really like to share value uh, at the cost of repeating myself. How do you align investors to ensure economic output from the villages? And therefore, why should the investment community invest, right? 
Uh, so here, I, uh, you know, I want to add this. Let's look at two successful models which have actually, uh, you know, aligned the village economic output or uh, income level, whether they've increased village income levels of artisans and others, uh, and brought in institutional angel investors and all that. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, there is this organization called LAL10, uh, for, uh, started by a bunch of IITians, uh, five years in the business now. They have developed artisan clusters, uh, more than 2,000 artisans in various parts of the country. Now, the institutional investors, which is uh, uh, people from Flipkart and others who have invested in this, uh, in this company called Lalton, simply because Lalton has bridged the gap between the artisan's products and international markets. So you see there are customers in the UK like Toast and uh, people like uh, Zara who are now directly buying products made by the artisans from uh, Lalton. So that is really, and Lalton is a social, uh, you know, they're talking about planet and profit and equitable and fair trade practices. So in, in, in the investors are liking it because it's a proven model and uh, in the, it's a win-win for everybody. So that's a good example. So the point is we look at, look for such more models which can then help us align the investors uh, with the village, uh, you know, to increase the economic uh, uh, situation of the villagers. Uh, yeah, and finally, I think uh, what Janet uh, and even what Abhishek uh, brought about the fact that we may have frameworks, we have models, uh, some successful models, but now in order to ensure that we also take in the learnings more, a little bit more carefully, what didn't work, uh, and therefore see how those can be overcome, and what more can come into these models. Like for me, it was a revelation when today, I mean, I learned about what Nabad does. Now, I, I mean, uh, I've been in this in the, in the in the space, but things like the credit borrowing fund, the credit guarantee fund, which Nabad is talking about, or what uh, CTC is talking about. Now these are like very secret. If only, if only our clusters, if our villagers know about these schemes and we empower them, uh, because ultimately, if you want to really bring scale to 650,000 villages, you have to work with the government. You have to leverage the schemes. And this is what I feel that this conference. Uh, when Janet finally summed it up by saying collaboration, it's collaboration with all the stakeholders, government, academia, uh, social businesses, ecosystem providers, and connecting all these dots, including, uh, you know, the financial uh, and the institutions. So if we can smartly converge all of them and we make these connects, I think this uh, approach of, you know, cluster approach, uh, working with villages, oh, I think uh, I'm, I'm pretty gung-ho about it. Thank you, Dr. Misri. <clears throat> Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so, if we, you know, you know, I, I know we have been talking and we have been. So, this is just uh, about. Let me first do some formalities. That uh, you know, we we need to thank our uh, our synthesizers who were here uh, working in the background and trying to make these uh, slides in such a short notice. Read and going through this and creating these things. So thank you, uh, thank you, Sharmista, thank you, uh, Sanjay, Atul. Uh, I think there is a clap also. So, and then uh, <clears throat> and we have three other speakers, which I am having. A hell of a time to finish. Okay, one second. Yeah. So, Ranjit, um, uh, thank you very much for not only summarizing but also giving your perspective. And Janet, as usual, being crisp and uh, you know defining everything. So does Abhishek. So thank you all. Um, I have uh, now. So this this is not the end. Uh, actually, this is the beginning. And uh, I would say that uh, you know while we have uh, <clears throat> while we have defined what we want to do, and uh, we need to form a team. But before that, I just want to say that you know while we have not talked while we have you know this uh, amit 
Atul has just pointed to it. But really, if from my perspective, if you look at the Pura, it talks about everything that we have discussed today. You know, everything that has been discussed, there is nothing that has not been talked about in Pura. And if we, you know, make that as one of the, you know, basic principles, I think we can do wonders. We can bring it all together. And uh, with now DOT also coming up with certain uh, rules and technology uh, component, that is very much available. What we have also done is, you know, of course, the roadmap to the smart village or the village of Swaraj. But this is a framework that we have developed. You know, Papu, you have been talking about how do we go and do these things. So on those things, you know, with the, with the SRL labs, what we are trying to develop is a sustainable, sustainable development service framework. Because this is not something, the smart village is not, uh, you know, not that you go and sell some products and the village becomes smart. You need to provide uh, services, you need to be them, with them, you know, continuously to make them really smart. So with that, I would like to end, and uh, I would also want to, you know, uh, get uh, everybody uh, on this dais, and uh, we also have a few, uh, you know, background people who have been working, and, uh, you know, if Ayushi and uh, Eklavya, if you can switch on your videos, uh, we'd like to thank you to continuously working in the background, Sridhar is not there, to write these notes, make make notes, and uh, make make it all available to the synthesizers. So the next step really is that we need to bring it all together. And uh, I am assuming that everybody here is, uh, you know, into it, and we will all work together to develop this uh, entire roadmap. And we are here to help, you know, so uh, Farooq, me, uh, Puneet, uh, Ram, we'll all be, and uh, Sarheep, so we'll all be working together to developing these roadmaps. So uh, can everybody switch on their videos so that we have everybody's pictures here? And Chengappa can take a, a nice snapshot. Everybody on the video, can we get, uh, uh, can we get the, how do we, hello, Chengapa, are you there? Yes, yes, sir, we can, we can hear you, so, how do uh, we, all the panelists, uh, all the panelists can uh, turn on their uh, video feed, so that we can take a, and how do I see all the panelists? What is the go to the go to the top and there's a little icon and track grid view. Click on grid view. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah that's right. So you need important. to be in the grid view. Yes, and I see that Puneet is still there. He's he said he's leaving. So Puneet, uh, the last words are yours. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know as this conference chair and not only that as a synthesizer and uh, you know architect of this uh, entire session so thank you for being with us and uh, uh, we still have some videos not on atul amitava eklavya janet neha eklavya are you listening to us thank you Krishna. Shengappa, you you as well. Why are you uh, silent? <laughs> you are the main architect behind all of this. Okay, I think uh, the rest of the videos are not coming up. Hello, are you there, Amitabh? I'm here. Aapka video kahan gaya? Uh, I can go and check Janet and see if she's available. One second. Yeah. <laughs> I'm having trouble with the connection of my camera. Are you okay. come here, Janet? Then you come to this room. You. And now, where are you off? Neha? All right. Uh, Janet is coming.
Yeah, Sharmista also, no? Sharmista, Ram Bappu. Sharmista is here. Yeah, yeah, we're all there. Ram Bappu. Where is Ram? Ram. Uh, Ram is there, yes? Yeah. yeah. So, anyway, I think uh, the low pe uh, the people What's at the low row, they are not... Okay. So, Chengapa is uh, like a nice snapshot of those who say get privilege and <laughs> smile. Do I have to smile to you now? Everybody has to smile, right? Thank you. <laughs> and, oh, sorry, here. Great. Yeah. Dr. Karan, nice. So, Chengapa, are we done? This is a picture of all the people who have to work. <laughs> You're right. You're very right. Okay. So, with, I will let uh, in meantime uh, uh, Puneet say uh, some words or few words on it, and we'll call the session to close after that. Oh, now we have more. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, now we are adding more people. Four oh, okay. oh, people are putting on the video. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you very Go ahead. much. Thank you very much, Dr. Dhanas, for curating this wonderful session. And I would also like to thank Dr. Farooq Mistri, who has been the force behind this uh, session, and he has given the idea of so this session should be there. And when we heard our panelists in the form of voice of customers, voice of funding agencies, voice of ecosystems, we got to know that empowerment of women is the main thing and most of them are working there. Everybody wants that women should work as influencers Community anchor are a change agent. As far as infrastructure, it just has to be done. Some other things that we could see from the Gram Panchayat that now they are not happy with the electricity only in the form of one light bulb or two light bulbs. They want electricity so that they can run their businesses like pump water, cold storage, food processing units. So you can see their aspirations are growing. So it is all the more important that we should be able to meet their aspirations. Another important aspect of the SDGs needs to be localized. Microeconomic zones needs to be created. And the wonderful initiative of raised means responsible AI for social good has to be taken in a big way. Cluster development, a very, very nice idea where four or five gram panchayats can be clustered together and we can uh, come up with some kind of a business plan. Training and capacity building through relevant skilling is another such area we should really look into that. Optimization of government policy, yes, definitely there is no dirt of policy as Dr. Rampakku told and multiple other uh, speakers told that it is not the paucity of our uh, dearth of uh, initiative from the government side. It is the uh, implementation where we are learning how to do it, where we, uh, that is the area where we should really look into that and we should try to bridge that gap. It's fourth, another very, very important uh, concept. Ranjit told about uh, contextualization, global ground challenge initiative, then market shaping, innovation th thinking. Another important thing is develop real partnership with the investment community to understand. There were various frameworks are already available with us. Only thing is which one to choose. I would say that all of them we need to choose depending upon the local situation. So which framework will work for which local situation that is the thing we should identify and we should try to implement those things. After going through all these things, what I found that Karnataka can be tested of this knowledge. Why I am telling Karnataka? Because Karnataka is the only 
state where almost every district is having an engineering college whether it is a rural district or a metro city there is no dearth of engineering colleges it means you are having the skilled manpower available at the grassroots level at the village level and we at ipcc bangalore session we also have now district coordinator at district level our student branches are available in almost all the engineering colleges of karnataka so we also can plug in these holes which is which are there in the form of less skilled human resources so ipcc can play a role there and karnataka can be a test bed for all these solutions what is being proposed by different stakeholders and we can provide a platform let us all up there and create not one or two the way dr rampapu told and someone has told that they want thousand plus rural innovators i would like to see thousand plus smart villages in karnataka alone because we are having really that much human resources available in karnataka another very very important point is bangalore is the hub of now startup system and venture capitalists everybody wants to pump their money so we are having sufficient funding agencies we are having sufficient skill mentor and with all of you now we are having sufficient technologies available which can be implemented so with this word i would like to invite all of you to implement and test your technology as well as framework in the state of karnataka and we are there to support you with all our skilled human resources and let us work together and uh, that again i would like to say what everybody has told that collaboration is the fact let us collaborate with all of us and do wonders and try to make india a better country a country where there is no poverty even though from last 70 years government is working on poverty but it is all policy again implementation is there i will stop at this point of time and thank you very much for joining us and thank you dr das thank you dr parosh mistri for so nicely bringing out this thank you thanks a lot thank you everybody and i really appreciate everybody hanging out so late and uh, going through this marathon session we were ourselves saying it's it's becoming really marathon it's not a race right. and uh, i think it represents uh, the the that the this to this uh, journey that we have started it is a marathon it is going to be marathon it's not going to be you cannot come in spurts and say hey it's done and i'm moving on so we have to run run those 1000 you know 1000 kilometers of race that uh, and uh, uh, punit has you know promised 1000 villages here so let's see that how can we get those 1000 villages 1000 smart villages right uh, thank you thank you dr sharan if you have any last thoughts you want to say uh, i've got one question to ask farooq yeah thank you very much it for me it was extremely interesting to listen to the speakers today and the amount of energy the amount of enthusiasm motivation that is there that gives me hope that something will happen but i do miss once again uh, the focus really on how to get the people in the villages completely involved in their own fate we have the today the technologies we have the ways all of you have shown how it can be done. what is really missing is an integrated process of an affordable plan to be given to the panchayats in the sense of training the panchayats to be able to use it and the fact is that these things are available and no one is interested because it is it is not something in terms of investment in terms of um, uh, petition it's not something that's because individual items individual products people can focus on but as brian has very clearly also brought out without an integrative approach at the village 
So one thing that I missed in, give me just one minute, one thing that I missed in the appreciation of the investment for uh, smart cities. Please remember that the whole investment world in the, in the world knows about the potential of India. They are taking advantage of the potential in the organized sector where the players at all levels are integrated, they are involved in planning, they are involved in assessing the risks in different areas, and they invest where they see the minimum risk to, to utilize the potential. This assessment methodology for the villages, for the investors, is not available today. We have to, we, we have really to help them to see where they should go, which districts, which, technology, which combinations, what are the market linkages, all the issues that you have brought up as parametric inputs, how to integrate them at the village level and make the panchayats be the people who galvanize the village people together to articulate their needs, train them, give them the tools that you have all developed, to use them to say to the government, look, my dear friends, your Things have to match with our plans of needs. So if we can do that, I think I'll be happy. Thank you very much again. So on that one, I would say that, you know, you and I have been discussing and I will, you know, uh, with Farooq, we are trying to put together this, that exactly what we have been looking for. And uh, I, you know, we invite you to be our mentor in that development process. And uh, similarly, Sir Heap, you know, will be another person who can guide us in how to get into that process. So, Sarheep, you have any any last comments before we come? Uh, yes, it's been a long but a very interesting and valuable day. The uh, we've seen a, a wide range of interests and activities. I think we've seen great clarification that smart villages have come to live with us. It's happened over the last five to ten years. If you go back ten years, nobody heard about smart villages. But, uh, I think particularly the example of India has placed smart villages very much on the map. I think we'd anticipated this because of your great technical skills and ability to apply some of these ideas to pressing issues. Um, I think there are two things I would like to add for us to consider as we reflect on what we've heard. First of all, somebody said seeing is believing, and uh, we strongly believe that in Smart Villages Research, in the Smart Villages Research Group, and we did recommend that we should seek funding for not a thousand, but 10 smart villages or clusters of smart villages, which are studied in detail and which are also economically costed. Because it's not only a question of seeing is believing, but when people see spreadsheets about the financial side, we haven't had any consideration of the economics of smart villages today, which is a critical point. If people could see that they would actually start to be not only sustainable, but would create markets and would create business, and would make money, that would be a very different attitude uh, to the whole picture, I think. And the second thing, I think, is just to pick up on what we find ourselves at the moment, to the pandemic, because certainly in this country, there's great concern about the way in which uh, COVID has taken off again, and it's particularly in high-density cities in this country. It is not in the rural communities. And quite a number of people have moved to rural communities deliberately to try to avoid COVID. And I think we need to just bear in mind that we are going to be faced by a very different situation after COVID passes. And people ask the question, where would they like to live in terms of health and well-being to the future. And I think it's something we might just hold on to in our consideration of how we develop this subsequently. Ashok, you've done a great job with your team, and we've, it's been great experience to test the possibility 
of doing something like this with people <laughs> it's been extraordinary uh, but I think it does give hope for the future because I think we've always had at the back of our minds that perhaps one day the United Nations will really get hold of the idea that they should have a program on smart villages, not just sustainable villages for all. And this would bring in Europe, China, Africa, India, and become a United Nations program in terms of addressing and leveling up the situation we have in the world today, where there are still so many people who are not only uh, poor, but they're energy poor, as well as food poor. So that's my kind of comment. Thank you so much. Thank you. Day. Thank you very much. And I think we, with your, with everybody's help, we can push it to you and as well that, hey, you know, you need to have an integration of all the SDGs and that is a smart village. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everybody. And uh, we will be in touch with all of you uh, as we, you know, as we move forward. And uh, we we hope that all of you will have uh, equally, you know, enthusiastic over the next few years to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.